Roses are red, violets are blue. Don't let a wild pube wreck you. Valentine's Day is just around the corner, and our sponsors at Manscaped are here for you with the best tools to get your balls ready for the special occasion. This V-Day, it's time to join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped, the leaders in below-the-waist grooming with our exclusive offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code NEST, N-E-S-T, NEST, and save yourself 20% off and free shipping. Hello, and welcome to the Hawks Nest live stream show. My name is Brandon Kane. Sunday afternoon, you guys know what time it is. You know what we're going to be. Let's chill. Let's talk a little bit of Seahawks. Some news starting to swirl here as it's been a little, little dead even before we even got to the off season yet. But a little bit of news here to talk about today. And I do welcome you all in. Come on in. Come on in. I know we've been away for about a week here, just still getting settled in here at the new Studes. We don't call it in the business studios. We just call it Studes. You know, that's kind of the, it's an industry term. You know what I mean? Uh, anyway, I hope you guys are doing well out there as we move on to this next week where we're we'll going to have to watch a Super Bowl with the Rams. The Rams. The Rams going in and uh, seeing if they can raise that Lombardi, Lombardi trophy. We'll see. Uh, hopefully... The Cincinnati Bengals can do something awesome for their first time. Well, getting the Super Bowl is kind of awesome for them, but let's just read, just get this done, Bengals, okay? Get this little bit of dirty work done. Shock the world, surprise the world. Get everybody shocked so we don't have to listen to the Rams fans all off season. But the news of the day to lead things off here is going to be the potential hire or the seemingly imminent hire of one Clint Hurt to the Seattle Seahawks defensive coordinator position. There are I'd love to say is a ton to talk about in regards to this hire. There is some stuff to talk about with it. Uh, I, in all honesty, it doesn't necessarily get me as hyped or, or uh, you know, feeling like a lot of problems defensively are going to be solved if Seattle had looked outwardly. Uh, when you look at Carroll recently, he seems to be almost phobic to going outside of the organization to get those defensive coaches. You know, it's uh, outside of Bradley. Bradley wasn't necessarily homegrown, but... Um, you know, Quinn, Richard, Norton, even though he had been coaching with the Raiders, it was a former coach of Carroll and then now um, Clint Hurt. Uh, I don't know if this necessarily speaks to me that Carroll is out there looking for the best candidate, but the one that has, let's call it a certain willingness to fit within the designs that Carroll is going to mandate. KJ Wright just went on a podcast recently, a very informative podcast. I would I would recommend everybody, um, Michael Dugar, um, uh, a writer, I believe. I, I forget which one he writes. In, athletic, I believe. Um, I could be wrong on that. Sorry, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Dugar. I call you the hyphen, but that's just because I, I can't remember one last name already. I'm already getting old here. Um, but it was a great interview with KJ Wright talking about the Seattle Seahawks defense, about Ken Norton being a bit of a scapegoat. Um, about it not being his problem. There were some really interesting tidbits in there. There was a bit about Dan Quinn and how Dan Quinn was hailed as this sort of mastermind guy to go get this defensive coordinator job after Seattle. And he said, well, he basically called three plays a game the whole year. But within this was also KJ speaking to the fact that everybody at the end of the day answers to the gray-haired man. And answers to doesn't mean you're necessarily just held and the way he meant it, at least as far as I, I read into it, maybe I was reading my own biases into this, but he didn't mean just in that you're, you're held to a certain standard or that Carol's going to have an expectation level of you, and if you don't meet that, he's going to come down. And yet that, that's in there a little bit, but also that Carol drives this defense. It's, it's, it's his baby. It's what I've been talking about for years with you guys here on this channel is that people oftentimes come in and say, this defensive coordinator, that defensive coordinator, oh, we got to get rid of this guy. He's the problem. This, it is Carroll's defense at the end of the day. And you can want change, and change may be even a, a benefit to the team. But if you think that there are problems and issues defensively, bringing in a new defensive coordinator from in-house is probably not going to be the solution here, especially if the team takes a track of deciding they're going to continue to keep its status quo from their philosophy standpoint as it, in regards to off-seasons. We don't spend a lot of money on free agents. 
We'll give out a lot of one and two year deals, which will eat up whatever cap space we do have to give out. We'll try to trust our drafting process, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in regards to Hurt, I do have some hopeful ground here, so I don't want to sound completely negative. I just don't want folks to fall into that trapping of thinking, uh, essentially, of what KJ Wright was talking about. I'm, I'm essentially trying to back up to what KJ had said, which is, you know, don't be looking for the scapegoat. Don't buy into letting the scapegoat be who you put the, the blame upon. That's not the right place for it. Uh, you now have a player who's played here 10 years telling you. It's not just me, some idiot speaking out of a, a basement or whatever, right? Some talking head who doesn't know anything about anything. This is now being confirmed by a player who played on the team 10 years. You know, so this is the way it is. And we got to look at it through that lens a little bit. With that said, there is maybe a little more hopefulness from my standpoint of Hurt being able to get into Carroll's ear, get into Schneider's ear and say, hey, Let's maybe go a little more heavy on the defensive line. Let's maybe, let's maybe invest in these, these pass rushers here where we've gone light year after year after year over in recent years. And we've gone light while we've had a linebackers coach for a defensive coordinator. While we've also at the seemingly at the same time gone kind of heavy at the linebacker position, right? Our highest paid defender for most of these last couple of years has been Bobby. You put a first round pick on Jordan Brooks, a third round pick on Cody Barton, fifth round pick on Ben Burkirvan. Um, you, you put a, you put a lot of assets out there uh, on the linebacker verse, maybe of putting that in other places and maybe hurt can advocate for that a little bit more. Uh, I've long said that I think a really, uh, uh, what you've got to do in this four, three under defense first and foremost is get that front four right and ready. Um, that you can't just have a couple guys getting it done and then hold on for dear life with the other guys. You've got to have a solid rotation, good frontline guys. That's just the nature of this defense. So hopefully Kurt Hurt can advocate for that. I've been listening to some of his interviews and the few places I can kind of, you can kind of catch him in, in, out there online. And he does seem to be a guy that does seem to, to believe there is a, a marrying between the cornerbacks and that pass rush that you've got to have both. So he may not just lean heavily into advocating or pushing to Carroll to go to the defensive line. But even if we can go a little bit more than where we've gotten, uh, that'll be a giant leap from where it's been. You, you, you'll have an off season where you lose a Frank Clark and then you, you go out and you draft LJ Collier and signs again, saw who's old as dirt and say, okay, we're done. And it leads you to get desperate to have to make a trade for a pass rusher later on. And the year after that, you make the very same mistake, which led you to have to make a desperate trade for a pass rusher right at the trade deadline. Hopefully, hopefully they'll, they'll learn their lesson this off season is again, they're not coming off a year where they were good and necessarily rushing the passer. It got better as the year went along, but wasn't good throughout. So I'm hopeful from that standpoint of things that he can provide that essence to what this defense is. It's just, it's one of those bones that I kind of chew on here on this channel quite a bit because this is the, the defense Carroll's chosen. You know, he hasn't chosen the attack heavy defense. He hasn't chosen the blitz heavy defense. He's chosen a, a kind of a soft zone defense, which isn't bad in itself. It sounds bad to me to say that's not derogatory, but it is that you now need those front guys, those front four guys to get home. They've, they, they've got to do it on their own. And it's and, and from the good side of things here, from Carroll's aspect of things, though I think this um, scheme is a little outdated at times, you did see throughout this playoffs a lot less blitzing than I've seen, it seems like, in recent history. A lot more teams being more willing to just let the front four go up there and get the work done and drop everybody else back in coverage, which is you know more to what we like to do defensively. So if, if they can just hammer on that, I think they'll be in good shape. Hurt is completely untested as far as a defensive coordinator goes. He's been a defensive line coach at a couple of different stops. He's certainly risen through the ranks relatively quick, which is good to see. But much like with what we were getting in Waldron last year, we don't really know what we're going to get as far as a play caller goes. But again, this is a little bit of an irrelevant um, exercise because at the end of the day, Carroll's there as much dictating what is happening playing and play out as much as the potential defensive coordinator even is. So we'll see what adjustments he might bring to the table. I'm sure the announcement's going to be made, it seems like, maybe even this week. We'll, we'll get him in the press conference. I'm sure reporters will ask him some very pointed questions. Hopefully, speaking to a couple of things I'm talking about right now is how, you know, Clint, how are you going to solve some of the pass rush issues? How are you going to solve some of this uh, uh, inability to stop the pass and some at some points at historic levels in recent years? On a historic pace two years ago to give up the most yards in NFL history, more than midway through the year. And then last year, you were more than midway through the year on pace to give up more yards to running backs through the air than any team in NFL history. 
It's not too good, too good stats to stack up in back-to-back seasons defensively. So what's going to be your answers, especially understanding that we can't say that you're, you're a guy coming from the outside, bringing new ideas, injecting a, a new level of innovation. You, you, you brought some of those ideas that probably failed last year, right? But they will be solved now this year, hopefully. Um, as far as any other kind of news goes, uh, there also is breaking news right now coming down the track, which um, I couldn't believe that I saw. The NFC West, folks, is not getting any easier. <laughs> it's not. Oh, so I get the, you get the headline coming down, right? Josh, uh, Josh McDaniel, Mike McDaniel, whatever the McDaniel name is that they got too many McDaniels in the NFL. Comes down the pike that he's going to get hired by the Miami Dolphins. All right. All right. A little bit of, yeah. Okay. That's a good note to start this offseason. The NFC West taking a couple hits. Bang, bang. Bang, bang. But then comes the heels of the news that because he's a minority hire, he, uh, the NFL's got some rule, I guess, that if you're a minority hire, as a coordinator, that the team that fostered you, groomed you, then gets two third round picks or a third round pick in back to back years, essentially. So, um, yeah, the Niners get dinged a little bit, I guess, on one side. And then um, given a couple of free third round picks on the other side. Because that's, you know, that's what our, our division needs this, right? Division needs some more help. <laughs> let's, let's, just, let's just keep making it. Let, why don't we just have our own conference here in the NFC West? How about that? How about be the NFC West Conference? You guys can have all your stuff over there, and we'll just play each other. Just beat the hell out of each other. Oh, my goodness. So, crazy news on that front of things. The Pro Bowl happened today. Russell threw two interceptions. Let's not freak out about that, folks. I'm sure you won't. But uh, the Pro Bowl, is, as I'm sure you guys are seeing more and more, is getting lamer and lamer to watch. It was never awesome to really watch. Um, even now, I think it's the skills challenge is almost more fun than the Pro Bowl is to watch. And Russell did dominate that, by the way. Set a record in that respect. The finger looking good. Finger looking good. Um, so that's kind of what's what's rolling around there out now. Uh, we'll discuss this defensive hire backwards and forwards, upwards and downwards as well. Ed Donatel, one of the defensive uh, defensive um, candidates for the defensive coordinator position here in Seattle, was also brought aboard in this situation uh, where he is going to be the pass, defensive passing game coordinator, a very new sort of special, not maybe a new, but a more of a it was one of those one of those positional positional um, not positional but one of those coaches, you know things that you you never really heard about. You know about offensive coordinator, offensive lineman, defensive coordinator, secondary coach, but the, the passing game coordinator seems a little it's a little new to me. This this these a little new on this terminology front. But look, Donatel has a history of doing this. He's he's been very good at this. Where you know he's got even in certain respects more of a, a resume than even Coach Carroll. Been to more Super Bowls, won more Super Bowls. Um, he's 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 been pretty consistently good wherever he's gone. His secondaries, at the very least, have been if not his defenses. I think uh, I I welcome it along with Hurt. It is having nice kind of the the double power on here where you're at least adding smart minds to the room, right? Not just uh, again. Uh, a bunch of yes men on in there. So, and as well, there is rumors that Seattle is going to still even try to pluck in uh, Sean Desai, um, one of the guys who was also going to be one of their coordinator candidates out there, as also to try to bring him in. I don't know if they can pull off the trifecta here, but it would make me feel a little bit better about the hire of Hurt if you are able to bring all these guys in. And it does make me feel a little bit better that Donatel's in there with Hurt as a guy that is untested. He's going to be able to lean on Donatel. Donatel's done it all, seen it all. Um, he'll be able to, to provide every kind of wrinkle that could be flummoxing hurt as far as, uh, what should we do with this? How should we solve this? Where should we go with this? Oh, they're stacking us up on this. You know, Donatel will have an answer for him. So between him and Carol, there's, I mean, those guys have forgotten more football knowledge than any of us might know in a lifetime. So there should be at least, there should be some presumptive answers in there. And I mentioned this of course, again, cause Carol at one point midway through the year said, I'm trying everything I know. I don't have any other answers. I don't know what's going on. So hopefully we can avoid that road going down into this off season. I uh, appreciate you guys watching. If you do like what you're watching today, please do hit the like button. I really do appreciate it. Subscribe. If you're not already, we are just about a half an inch away from the magical 6,000 number as we just continue on rocking and on up. So appreciate you guys on that. Thank you to the sponsor, Manscaped. Go on over there, get your code, use your code, NEST, N-E-S-T. Save yourself 20% off and help the show out a little bit.
Uh, Merck, what is up? How you doing? Good to see you. ADL Williams. Yo, 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 yo. Uh, really, ZY, Hawks. Love. Oh, we all love our Hawks here. How you doing, really? Good to see you. Go Hawks 05. Hurt is meh. Donatel makes me excited. If Desai ends up passing game coordinator, it's a home run. Hey, if you can get all three, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consider it as close to a home run outside of getting a magical candidate in, in here as you could ask for. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much in agreement with you on that, Go Hawks. If you got all three, that'd be, I'll feel much better about this hire than I do right now. And I'm not feeling horrible about this hire. But again, we're, we're, to, <laughs> we're talking about problems that have hounded the team in recent years over a course of a couple years here. You know, how, how do new answers come from within when they were those same people trying to provide the answers that weren't working before? Rick Zepeda, hey, Brandon, how's it going? What is your take on the whole Mark Flores situation? I believe you meant Brian Flores. Um, yeah, pretty crazy stuff. Um, you know, you when you talk about, for instance, fixing games or the NFL fixing games, it's one of those crazy things that gets put into their own category by a lot of different people as being completely impossible. And another spot that you would put within that impossibility would be owners paying coaches to throw football games. But... This indeed does seem to be the case as to what has happened. Uh, I think there's a lot of different things going on with the Flores situation. Uh, I certainly think he has a, a ground, to st- ground to stand on in the respect of uh, whether you agree with the Rooney rule or not, whether you're for it or not. It's really being not utilized in the way it was being intended to be utilized when it was set up by the NFL. Um, every owner has got their own right to hire whoever they want to hire. I'm not out there trying to tell them they got to hire this and that, but it is what it is with that. I'm a guy and guys are having to navigate around in that la- landscape. You know, you list, you see and watch a guy like Josh McCowan, for instance, who has no coaching experience about nearly due to get a Texans job before there started to be some backlash on it uh, versus a guy like Eric bien who, you know, can't, can't get a whiff, you know, despite what, you know, you, you would think he's done now. A lot of people say that's Andy Reid, but well, that hasn't precluded other Offensive coordinators from getting uh, head coaching jobs working under Andy Reid, has it? Hasn't stopped NFL teams from doing it in the past. And obviously, the enemy's got a little checkered pass going to Colorado when he was there as a coach with some with some shenanigans that were going on. But um, I, I think it's a bit of a lot of stuff. I think it's a little bit of bruised ego. Um, but I think it's also, again, he's got he's to land a stand. And if you're an owner, if, the, if, if it's found out that an owner is – paying a coach to throw football games. And that has been figured out. I, I, I don't know if I trust the NFL not to just sweep it under the rug, but if they weren't sweeping it under the rug, you lose your whole draft for at least one year, in my opinion. That's one of those things where, again, it's, 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 it, it, I put it in the same pail as I would put fixing a football game by an NFL standard, whether it's being done from a commissioner's office or whether it's being done by a player who owes, owes a mob bookie some money. I don't care. The, the penalty then has to be harsh. And if the penalty is for a player, for instance, that like Shoeless Joe Jackson or Pete Rose, you gamble on, on that sport and you're out of the sport forever and will wipe your, your name basically off of everything, well, shouldn't a, shouldn't a franchise at least lose their, their collection of draft picks at that point? Or you lose your ownership? I don't know. Something. It's, dirty. it's a dirty business, though, with this, Rick. And the more they pull back the curtain, the dirtier it gets. ADL Williams, Russell Wilson, uh, zero touchdowns, two picks, and a sack at the Pro Bowl. Yeah, those guys, I, I watched a couple, of, a couple of cut-ups. Those guys were not going anywhere near even, what, 50%? I saw some 40% out there, so it's, I, I wouldn't put too much into it. It did, as Gohawk said, it sucked hard today. I got Kyle Mokey, what a Brando. With these defensive coaches, do you think they'll try go and go for Hicks, Fuller, uh, the cornerback, uh, and Vaughn Miller? I don't know that just because you bring Donatel in here, it's going to guarantee that suddenly Carroll is going to go to more of a 3-4 type defense. I don't think Mon Miller is going to want to put his hand in the ground for really the first time in his career. Um, he's done it here and there in Denver, but they have him standing up. That's what he's been doing like 95% of his career. Uh, Fuller has been part of what I, I'm going to start to term the, uh, the withering crew. Okay, And this is going to be people that, that these are going to be players that people are going to mention his names who have been on an ever backsliding fashion of performance over the last few years that's coincided with them getting older. And if we got those two markers going together, 
We probably don't want to count on that player tapping back into what they were in 2017 or 2018. We probably want to say at that point it's a trend where he's going and he's just not going to be uh, as good. Does this, Kyle, would this hold them up from signing him? Would this stop Seattle? No. But none of those guys you mentioned, including Hicks, who's a 3-4 player, I, I don't think any of those guys really would be fits uh, on this team, including Miller, um, unless they wanted to go to more stand-up, outside 3-4 linebacker type looks, which I would welcome. They want to do that. That'd be great. Um, I think we can. I think we might go for Cam Jordan Clowney along with Kamura. Uh, Kyle, I'm in full favor of Clowney. I don't know Kamura and Cam Jordan make a lot of sense. The um, you know the Saints are going to have to do some things with their with their cap in order to get underneath it. And when you look at both of those two players, I believe that both. I think with Kamura, they take on a huge amount of dead money hit. So. To, to get Kamara out of there, you would have to, to try to really do some shenanigans there. <laughs> shenanigans is my word today, by the way. Um, yeah, so they're, they'd have to eat $6 million with, with – um, and I knew people would ask on Kamara because <laughs> Russell was throwing to him. So you're going to eat $6 million if you're the Saints moving on from Kamara, which, again, to consider this, you're already going to be probably having to move, for instance, Michael Thomas – who carries a $22 million, $23 million dead money cap. To move Cam Jordan, you're only saving $2 million in cap space from the same standpoint. Now, maybe the $2 million is significant for them in this offseason. Um, but the, the point being on that with the Saints, this is a team already $65 million up over the cap. How are they going to get back under that when they're going to now add on to that $65 million? That's $65 million without you making a move with Cam Jordan, without you making a move with Alvin Kamara, without you doing anything with any of your other guys. So if there's any more dead money hit you're going to sustain there, I don't know. I, I don't know, I don't know if they're, those would be two guys that they're going to look to necessarily move. But if Kamara wants to rework his deal to get out of there, still not maybe lose any money and the Saints can lower a base down or something, I don't know, figure out a way to do it. Um then that would be uh, that maybe be a creative way. I'm certainly some of these front front offices are getting creative. Randall McDaniel coming in with a fat twenty dollar donation. Thank you, Randall. You are awesome, brother. I appreciate you, my man. Good to see you on uh, online. Says uh, kept checking YouTube for a Sunday night Hawks Nest show. Glad to see you're on here. Ah, uh, yeah, my guy. Good to, good to be on here. I just uh, was thinking about going up on live on Wednesday on week, but we didn't really have a ton to discuss necessarily. I wanted to see if maybe we get some news breaking down with this coaching uh, search and maybe a little bit a little extra. So I, I kind of was waiting a little bit on it, but we'll be getting these more and more going as we got content. And certainly when breaking news comes down, I'll be instantaneously going live when we get instant uh, when we get um, uh, break, breaking news coming down the track, Brindle. But uh, thank you for the twenty dollars donation, brother. You're awesome. Always awesome. I appreciate you. Elliot Clark with a $5 donation. Thank you, Elliot. He says, we need a firmer pass rush. I used to think getting better cornerbacks was the answer, but I'm coming around to getting that pressure on a quarterback first. It's, it's one of the great and, and fun debates, Elliot, that exists out there right now in, in the football area of things. Um, analytics, uh, pro football focus, people will tell you, nope, now you need to lean towards building more of your secondary back to front. The old school method, of course, is teaches you got to go front to back. And I, I think it's, I, I don't know if there's a def, definitive answer on this that is more right than wrong. I think some of it is scheme dependent. And when I look towards Seattle's scheme and look towards how Carroll kind of likes to run it, which is a little more of the old school like approach, well, if it is an old school, when in Paris, you know, do as the Parisians do. Uno modo me. So if you're, if you're going to go with the, the, the 4 300 defense that doesn't want to blitz at the least amount of rate in the entire NFL, then that means those front four guys have got to generate pressure on their own. And that's not an easy task to accomplish. And it's a nearly an impossible task to accomplish, Elliot, if you don't have the talent down there to get it done. And Seattle's gone just kind of good enough down there in recent years rather than really attacking it in a way that was attacking it like the Kansas City Chiefs attacked their offensive line this past offseason. With that kind of vigor and um, and complete completeness of it, you know, leaving no stone unturned, I I would like them to take a little bit of that track this off season. Of course, in addition to to, to looking at the off season, um, Jeffrey Distel, what's up? Because right, because our defensive line went so well. Yeah, it's been a bit of a mixed bag there on the defensive line with Hurt. I mean, that's the other part that I, I would ask on this is what exactly has he done to cause a promotion. I'm not hating on the guy again. I'm not trying to sound like the complete Debbie Downer here, but 
What what have you done exactly to earn this promotion? This defense has not been good in recent years. We don't pa- we don't rush the passer with any kind of great proficiency. We we're not we're not up in in the top ten in hits on the quarterback and hurries, pressure rate, sacks. Um, we're not forcing a lot of turnovers. <laughs> I what is the marker you use at that point? R- relatively okay at stopping the run, I guess. And I might argue that even some of our times we've been effective in stopping the run, it's just because throwing the ball has been easy on us. But I don't know, man. Jeffrey says, who the F is Clint Hurt? Exactly. <laughs> Chuck Seeger, what's up, Chuck? ADL Williams, I'll be sad if uh, NFL rosters are set before major league rosters are set. Might happen. I mean, it's uh, the the specter of losing a baseball season is approaching and, and getting closer and closer to a possibility. And it seems crazy and seems insane and impossible, but I, both of the sides are dug in. We're into February, you know, pitchers and catchers report soon. So, hmm. Uh, Jeffrey, sad thing is if Russ hadn't been hurt when we played the weakest part of our schedule, we would have made the playoffs and been a one and done again. <laughs> probably where the roster was at last season. Probably Jeff ADL. Uh, don't worry. We can be one and done next year. <laughs> I was hoping you guys would bring the optimism today. Cause I can't bring it. I, I, I was hoping you guys were going to have it. I, I, was I supposed to pack that? Was I supposed to pack the optimism today? <laughs> Jeffrey, uh, Geno Smith laid three eggs against the worst teams we played. He didn't do, he didn't do great, but I, it's, I, he played to what I would put as an expectation level on a backup quarterback, making league minimum. Uh, Randall, uh, the scheme is the scheme. I think the biggest issue is lack of talent. I, I think that's the one issue. Well, I, I mean, the scheme is an issue, but I will say, Randall, it's the thing that can, you can change. I think that's what you're trying to say. Is, yeah, it's, it's the thing you can control here. And you can control it by adding to it, adding enough to it, understanding why it makes your defense run. Randall says, what do you think about Ugbar from the Dolphins? Solid, but not a star. Uh, he's coming up. Um, again, the Dolphins running a little of a 3-4 defense. Randall, you know with me, I'm always going to get a little bit caught up and you got a player as a 3-4 defense versus 4-3 defense and how they transition from one to the other. You know, he's coming from a 3-4 defense in, in Miami that blitz heavy, likes to run a lot of different looks. Now he'll go to more of a 4-3 scheme. How does, he, how does he transition to that? He's got a little bit of that 3-4 defensive end look body to him a bit, but he's been a good player for them, still young, still maybe some a little bit of untapped potential. I wonder what the cost will be for him necessarily. You know, what, what are we talking as far as a price point goes? And if it's like in the realm of, you know, four years, 50 million or something like that, that's, that's going to be a lot higher to go than I'd want to go with him. Um, I, I'd want to do more pure scheme fit if I'm going to be paying that, shelling out that kind of money for a guy. Uh, Elliot says, who cares? Trey Lance is the guy. Trey Lance is not the guy. It doesn't matter with Niners extra picks. <laughs> I hope you're right. I hope you're right. Uh, I really do hope you're right, man, because uh, I'm, I'm getting worried by these Niners right now. I'm a little worried and I'm a little perturbed, and uh, I really don't like how hard this division is. I, I, I Look, you want, a little, you want a little competition, right? We want to get prepped and ready for the playoffs. But we don't need like Murderer's Row either, you know? We don't, Murderer's Row is a bit much. Joey Mendez has been a member for six months of the Hawk's Nest, and he is awesome for doing that. Appreciate you, Joey. He says, at this point in the rumor mill, Russell will be traded for the 76ers for Ben Simmons. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot of hot stove talk going on with Russell Wilson. And as I told you guys, I, I'll definitely talk about it if you guys want to speak about it in the chat. I'm not going to do a show on any of the uh, any any of the uh, possible rumors until something actually happens. I think there's too much clickbait stuff going around uh, in regards to Russell. As I've said, you guys have have your um, filters on with this content because a lot of it's going to be drummed up BS. A lot of it's just going to be people throwing darts at a dartboard and they don't know what the hell's happening. They don't have insider sources. They don't have unnamed sources, unspecified sources a dude in a dark room that I talked to by whispering into his ear, something like that. Not, you got none of those. They're just pulling it out their behind. 
So, yeah, I, I, some of these rumors are funny as hell. And ESPN had like a, a, a possible trade Russell Wilson deal that they put down where it was laughable. I think the Panthers where they said that we would take Sam Darnold and Christian McCaffrey in like a fifth round pick or something. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, Roy Frolick has become a member. Thank you, Roy, for becoming a member of the channel. You are awesome for doing so, brother. And uh, welcome aboard to Hawk's Nest, SS Hawk's Nest. Deb Peterson with a $5 donation. Thank you, Dev. I appreciate you, my man. He says, uh, you see Sherm or Cam being on the coaching staff, and what do you see them being? Um, honestly, on both, I think they're more going to – I think Sherm's got more of a of a future as far as, you know, doing telecast, being a – you know – he could do kind of whatever he wants as far as media wise goes after after and he's going to be paid a lot of money to do so much more than he would, pay, he would be paid to coach. So I don't think that Sherman would ever want to be a coach. Um, Cam kind of strikes me as a little bit similar to Cliff Averill, where both of those guys can offer something that some both of those guys can can teach the young guys out a little bit. But they both kind of like to do from the sidelines as opposed to on the sidelines. You know what I mean? So um uh, I, I think that he's going to be more into that like consultant role where we heard, you know, I think when offseason he was training a little bit with Marquise Blair. He was on the phone talking to Ryan Neal a couple of years ago, to, walking him through stuff within this defense. You'll see them more, I think, in that role, Dev, than you, you'll see those guys as active coaches on the football field. Uh, Idiot Williams, I thought Brandon Sp uh, sprouted a tentacle for an arm, but it was a cattail. <laughs> yes. But she's got the Pavlonia thing kicked in now. So when she sees the lights go on, she hears me talking for too long in front of this weird thing in front of my face. She's like, oh, okay, I'm getting on his lap. Time to mess with him. Randall says, I think Lan Trey Lance will end up being a player. Doesn't happen overnight with quarterbacks. It doesn't. And like you know with me, Randall, he was my number two quarterback in last year's draft. I may be end up being proven right or wrong on that one, but that's where I still do stand on that. I still stick by my evaluations of the quarterback even a year into this. And um, I think uh, I, I think he's going to end up being a pretty good player for them. I think Shanahan's going to know how to utilize him. He's going to know how to take advantage of his strengths, minimize his weaknesses, a lot like they did with Robert Griffith when uh, Shanahan was an offensive coordinator for the Washington uh, football team guardian skins. Um, I think he'll do, he'll be able to do the same here with Lance. And he was just a young guy this year. So you knew it was going to take him. A, you knew he was best to sit for a year of all the top end quarterbacks coming out in this draft. Most of them, you wanted him to sit a year a field. You wanted to sit, um, uh, Lawrence, you could have him sit or go. He was ready to go. And, and certainly Mac Jones was ready to go, but this was one guy you you to be one to have sit for a year. Maverick uh, Consulting Group says Mike Daniels going to the Dolphins as a head coach. His pressers should be hilarious. Mike Daniels is legitimately hilarious. I was watching some of his pressers, and he's pretty funny. Smart guy, too. Smart dude. Kiss Gaz, he's only half minority, so the 49ers should only get half the benefits. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> oh, God. Maverick uh, Consulting Group. I think they're training Hurt and bringing in Donatel and hopefully Desai so that Fangio can come in after the season when Pete retires or Jordy fires his ass. <laughs> hey, maybe so. Um, maybe so. You know, that wouldn't be a bad crew to have in there. Um, I mean, Fangio would not get me excited as a head coach. He's best as a coordinator. He should stay as a coordinator. Um, but shoot, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe that's what they're doing. I, just more hands on deck, I guess, with this. The more the more smart minds we can get in the room, the better. And I like having with Desai in there, you got a little bit of the, the young mind power bringing into the play along with Hurt as a nice counterbalance to the old man group in Coach Carroll and uh, Donatel. Uh, gaming, uh, Seahawks Gaming says three-fourths of, three of the Seahawks that went to the Pro Bowl should not be on the roster next year. Probably won't be on the roster next year. Though there is a little bit of scuttlebutt that uh, maybe Dwayne Brown will be brought back into the fold. I, I would be shocked if they do find the right price with Quandre. And you never know. You just don't know with uh, Mr. Mr. Wilson at this point. Uh, Prof, Prof, thoughts on San Francisco Mike Daniels getting head coaching position on the Dolphins? Um, I, I like it. Um... I like Mike, what Mike Daniels has done. It, it gets hard as, as, 
I mean, we could talk about Eric Bieniemy. The same problems Bieniemy has, you'd think that a guy like Mike Daniels would have with Shanahan, where teams go, is it Shanahan or is it Mike McDaniels or is it Andy Reid or is it Eric Bieniemy? Um, you know, he, I don't know a ton about him outside of watching his pressers and watched a little bit of him coaching on the, there was a YouTube video of him coaching on the field and talking players up through some stuff. Um, you know, the Dolphins seem to be pretty married to Tua and, and the belief that he's, I think the owner likes him. There's not going to be a quarterback in this draft that necessarily is going to work for them. I don't think. Potentially, they could bring in Deshaun Watson. They, to me, still remain the front-runner type team to bring him in. And boy, if they get Watson with Daniels and the offensive scheme he can run there, um, that could be that could be a pretty pretty good uh, pretty good team. Now, the a AFC East is pretty rough. Buffalo Bills aren't going anywhere. New England Patriots are getting tougher. The Jets are are trying to put things together there. So it's going to be a tough path, but. Um, you know, it, it's an all right hire. Again, I do go back to what's what. What is it that Daniels, you know, McDaniel's brings that the enemy doesn't? I mean, I don't know. Maybe he went to he went to Yale, I guess. So he's got a Yale degree. But uh, that's the one thing I'd wonder with that something like this. Randall McDaniel says, "Does Miami lose the licks, or do they fall with comp picks?" No, Randall, they're compensatory picks. So uh, the 49ers just get the two third round picks in the back end of the third round. Yeah. That's great. Just great. Um, the owner, um, Jeffrey Dissel says the legality of an owner asking the coach to throw games should have a massive legal implications because of legal gambling on games alone. Uh, you would think it would, Jeffrey. I mean, we, we talked a little bit this year about some of the uh, weird and wild ways that were going on in the NFL um, with some of the officiating and some of the weirdness in the calls. Uh, you just saw today a news story breakdown that I believe the NFL is retiring about 20, 25 officials in the NFL, which is interesting, which is interesting. But um, look, the, the NFL got themselves out of this situation a long time again. If you look at how the NFL classifi classifies itself, uh, legally speaking, tax-wise speaking, they class themselves, classify themselves as an entertainment organization, much like the WWE classifies itself as an entertainment organization. They don't classify themselves as a sport. And I think that's an important, uh, important small, but little legalese word that, that, that kind of does matter in this situation. I know as silly as that might seem. And because it, it gives them a little bit of wiggle room for when they have um, stuff like this pop up, that's a little bit outside the pale, beyond the pale. Maverick Consulting Group, I wouldn't be surprised if refs threw games. We've seen how incompetent they are. Or are they? I'm, I'm with you on that as well as Maverick. I mean, there's, there's a history on this uh, in basketball where a mobbed-up ref got nailed and he, he spilled his guts on the rest of the refs that were doing the same thing. Okay, so it's just happening in one sport but no others? Eh, I don't buy it. And when you do see some games played, uh, the, the Rams game this year that we played in L.A., um, on the heels of the Rams being allowed three extra days to be able to rest so they get through the vid protocols, which the NFL didn't do for other teams later on in the season. The game was very weirdly officiated. Very weirdly officiated. Um, you know, I, I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying the NFL would do something like that because at the end of the day, you're going to kill your product when you do this. And But there's times I wonder. Uh, Randall McDaniel, any notes uh, from Senior Bowl? Come, uh, Senior Bowl comes in about a month. Combine comes in about a month. Um, so, Randall, what I was doing is I did some more breakdown on some other guys we can talk about. I went through – I was mainly doing the last week. I've just been grinding on tape for prospects. So I've been just – and with me, I don't watch just the highlights on them. So when I look at these guys, I'm a lot of the time I'm going through like two, sometimes three games of tape um, to try to just – to try to get as many guys in as I can. I went through the running backs. I've gone through a lot of the left tackles, defensive tackles, defensive ends. Um, I haven't quite gotten to as many cornerbacks as I wanted. I've only gotten to a couple of them, Randall. But, um, you know, you got Perry and Winfrey came out as the MVP of the game, five tackles, two sacks. Um, he's a very interesting prospect coming up out of Oklahoma. And he's a little bit, he's a little bit of what's going to, I think, cause a lot of debate out there in scouting land, Randall, because 
He is a lot like Levi Uzawoninski of uh, University of Washington last year, where UW plays him essentially as the one tech. Um, he's, he's over there battling double teams most of the time of his college career. And really what he should have been is a three tech the whole time, but he's being used as a one tech because that's what the college football team needed. So he goes to the NFL now and he gets moved to his proper position. Theoretically, he should take off. And indeed, during this combine week, he's doing a little more three techy type stuff. Um, and as a three, he has a three tech type body. I mean, he's got a guy that can get lean. Um, he's not, you know, he's got kind of almost a defensive end body, real just not, you know, kind of a little bit, almost like just tall and long a little bit. But he gets lean, good hands, good bounce to his step. Um, let me actually bring up because he's worth talking about. Um, he was the guy that jumped out to me a, a little bit from the combine and just his play, because he's the, you look at upside, right, Randall? I mean, that's what we're going to talk about with these these draft picks when I always look at them, is what what is their upside? Uh, I, I don't want to really draft for floor, because in a lot of respects, I feel like I can find floor in free agency. I can find floor in a trade. In, in the draft, I can find the special talent. I can look for the, the home run. I know you can't do it at, at every you know turn with this stuff, but um, at least relatively speaking. Uh, where am I at here? Sorry, I'm trying to find my guy here. So let me, let me just type him in. Um, wow. Typing skills are not on point today, guys. Uh, so, yeah, he's a hustler, willing to chase down plays on the backside of the field. I mean, just constantly moving. He comes up uh, off the ball and attacks the lineman like he has a handful of knives. Very busy, though he's not really executing moves. So he's just a guy that's like flapping his arms and getting skinny and twisting and spinning and turning around. But he's not doing it as a like as a technician. He, he looks really busy. But but that's he's just he's, he's getting by with really athleticism and um, and, and quickness off the snap. Um, not much of a pass rush to his game. A little bit more of the stack shed variety kind of guy where he's going to just sort of just walk his guy in the backfield and shed off and find the find the quarterback. Um, he does show a good ability to target and hunt if the quarterback starts moving around the target, uh, moving around the pocket. And he's always got an eye on the quarterback, so he always knows where he is and is able to, to, to not only get free of his block, a little bit like what Jaron Reed would do, right, when people would force guys up in Jaron Reed and then he'd be able to get rid of the block and then go find the quarter, quarterback as he's coming up into the pocket. Um, Travis Jones was the guy selected as the number one uh, defensive lineman of the week with, through the practices. Uh, he looks like, to me, a, a one-tech in a, he looks like a zero tech in like a three, four to me, Randall, just a big body guy is going to walk people in the backfield, but he's, he's large. He could probably play a little bit of both positions with one and three. We've already got a lot of guys like that already. Um, the pass rushers on the edge stood out. I haven't done a lot of breaking down the individual ones. I know people are like Mafu and uh boy, you Mafu or whatever his name is. And there's a couple guys that, that did really good. The Penn state kid uh, was a good, had a good week. A lot of the pass rushers really went out and, and kind of embarrassed some of these tackles in the one-on-one -on -one drills. Um, it's, it's tough for these tackles. You're going to get embarrassed at times, but they really, a lot of them showed some good explosion, great use of hands. Um, on the offensive line wise, Trevor Penning, Travis Penning was re, uh, voted as the number one offensive lineman of the week at a senior bowl. Um, the, the kid that comes out of the, the small school who a lot of people are really high on he's uh, putting on his tape. He failed to impress me, Randall. I'm not as high on, on him as other people are. And he played with a lot of at, at nasty attitude in the senior bowl week. He was driving guys in the ground, driving heads into the ground. Some of it was a little on the line of, do you really need to be doing this? I know you're trying to show everybody that you're super tough, but this isn't exactly what you were showing on tape. You know, um, I thought I, I the, you, you see a wild bit of opinion between Falele and Lucas from people, uh, Abraham Lucas, both right tackles where people, some people think they struggled. Some people, they did think they did really good. I think both those guys didn't do anything to really move their needle one way or another. They're both going to be either early second round picks or high first round picks in this upcoming draft. Um, Zion Johnson, I, I think came in as the number one left guard in this draft. I think he came out of that, came out of the senior bowl week as the number one left guard in the draft. Um, the, uh, the blood and guts tight end, um, who had a really good week, find his, find his name. Um, he, he, he looked really good. Now going back and watching his tape, Trey McBride, 
Um, he Boy, he's got some good tape to watch. Solid all-around tight end. Not spectacular with the speed or the athleticism. Just one of those guys who gets the job done. But um, really tough. You can he, He's, again, one of those prototypical tight ends, Randall, that you can have guys hanging off him. It doesn't matter. He's going he's gonna to make the catch. Um, yeah, he's, he plays a little bit of that, that spirit. Rugged. Good blocker. Like what I saw out of him that, this week as well. I didn't concentrate much on the... Um, on the tight end or on the wide receivers, because I just I'm going to lock in on the stuff that Seattle's more likely to draft. I'm still diving into the safeties and cornerbacks a little bit. Um, I will say a couple of the guys that have looked good at running back that, that might be into the Seahawks mold of things. I think are um, uh, Damon Pierce of Florida. He's a fun guy to watch. Um, a real hard runner, a little bit smaller, shorter than they look, though he's got the weight to him. He's a, he is a little shorter than Seattle normally looks, but maybe more in that Thomas Rolls type uh, mold of things. And I'll tell you guys, if you want a purified clone, uh, a guy that had a pretty good, I think, senior bowl week as well, Pure, you want a purified clone um, of Chris Carson in this upcoming draft to me is, uh, is Hassan, the kid from Michigan. He, he runs, he's not as, he doesn't run as hard as Carson, but he's got a, a lot of the same similar gait, similar kind of running style, um, similar kind of abilities. Um, he, he also kind of stood out to me too, Randall. So I got a couple guys we'll talk about in, on this um, stream. I've got that we we can we can discuss on breakdowns on it. But I try to dive more into rather than getting too much in the practice. I watched some of the one on ones, then went back and watched game film and highlights and all that to try to get a start to get more of a well rounded feel for all these guys. CD eight oh eight says I don't know how I feel about Clint Hurt calling plays. I don't know either, CD. I don't know if I wanted to go into this season. Um, where they want to be going for it, where we're not rebuilding, we're not retooling, we are reloading. And if that is the case, then do you want to go into untested waters where a guy's figuring it out, figuring out how to call plays in this league? I, I don't know if I do. So I'm, I, I share your reticence. Maverick uh, Consulting Group. Ross also owns part of a gambling company. So <laughs> if he loses on one win, he wins, he wins on the other one, right, Maverick? Maybe there's something to that. Hopefully the NFL investigates this. That's all I'm saying. It's pretty dirty. Pretty dirty. Uh, Tony says, what's good, Brandon and chat? Go Hawks, baby. Go Hawks, Tony. Good to see you on in the chat, man. I'm at a consulting group. 49ers get comp picks. They do. A third round pick this year and next year. Two of them, which <laughs> I wasn't aware. I wasn't aware that rule uh, existed. Uh, Ethan Duckworld, look how amazing the Pro Bowl is. It's such a transcendent sporting event. Yeah, it's amazing. It is amazing. Uh, Puff has been celebrating three men, three months as a Hawks Nest Ring of Honor member, and I honor you, Mr. Puff, for doing so, or Miss Puff, or Mr. Puff, whichever. I won't throw it on. So, so uh, what up, Brando? Puff is in the house. So with Clint being our new defensive coordinator, what does our defense look like next year? Too early to tell. Uh, I think we've got to wait a little bit to where we get some more nuggets coming out from his press conference, uh, from what we might hear coming out of the background. There's usually some stuff that we get kind of in the, the ether, the smoke of rumors. So we'll probably hear a little bit about it. I would say that we're probably look, you could probably take away from this puff that in going into in-house, there was not, there was not a general um, motivation to, to change much of the defense from what it's been. This would seemingly point to me to play calling, maybe player development. Um, maybe it's just that they think Clint is, uh, is super smart. And, and one of these, one of these guys is eventually going to be a head coach in this league. It's only a matter of the time. And let's, you know, let's get that. Let, let, let's, let's tap into that while we can tap into that. Maybe that's it as well. Maybe they know that we certainly don't have a ton of information to go off of with him. This is, you know, this is what you get with in-house kind of moves, but it is truly really to tell puff. And I don't think that there's going to be a lot of change within this hire. I don't, um, Don Tell can maybe bring some things that he's learned from Fangio over to the table. Uh, I wouldn't throw that out the window, but to me, more Don Tell bringing stuff into play more than, um, hurt. And if Dontel's bringing anything into play, it's going to be a little bit of the split safety looks, 
uh, different different duties for both safeties, right? Rather than you running just the cover two look or the single high safety, now you'll be running different things with both safeties, having them do a variety of different things. Um, and not only that, you'll do a lot of of um, disguising pre-snap versus post-snap, which has been something that's been missing from the defense recently. Deb Peterson uh, says, where do you think Jimmy G will go? Back to New England. And what do you think will happen to Aaron Rodgers? Well, I certainly don't believe, Dev, that um, somebody's going to give Jimmy G a starting job in this league right now. Even though there are uh, there are jobs available out there, I think people know what he is at this point. I do think that New England does seem to be the most likely destination. Bill Belichick didn't want him to go before. It was really looking like a choice between Brady and Garoppolo. And the rumor, or the rumor goes that Belichick wanted Garoppolo and the owner wanted Tom Brady. And the owner, of course, is going to win out in that kind of disagreement. And so uh, Garoppolo was moved to the 49ers. But that doesn't mean that Bill doesn't like him. And uh, he does fit with what they like to do in their offense there. So it makes sense. Uh, what do I think will happen with Aaron Rodgers? Um, first off, I don't think Aaron Rodgers comes back to Green Bay because I don't think that they're going to offer as stacked a team or able to offer as stacked a team as they could before, capable of doing what it was doing before. So... That does, to me, tell me he probably will be moved. I do think he also wants to get out west. So San Diego's out. Um, I'm going to give you a crazy one on this, Dev, because the boring answer is, is Denver, right? That's the boring, lame, let's be like everybody else answer. I'm going to give you the, the hot news right here. I'm going to give you the breaking gut instinct of Brandon Kane giving it to you right now real. Aaron Rodgers is going to the 49ers. I'm just going to own this. NFC West is going to be what it is. Okay, bring them all over. I'm telling you, we get our own conference now, folks. We are in our own conference. That's the way this is going to go. So Aaron Rodgers is coming to San Francisco 49ers to go be on his childhood team. The 49ers called the Packers last year about a trade. The Packers turned them down then. They won't turn them down now. Yes, I know the 49ers don't have any first-round capital, but they can find a way. Random McDaniel, don't wipe, uh, wipe back to front and don't build a D that Don't wipe back to front and don't build a D that way. That's right, Randall. That's right. I'm okay. I'll, I'll say this, Randall. I'll give the caveat. If I'm building a 3-4 attacking defense that relies on man-on-man -on -man coverage or a safety that can be an Ed Reed type or a Troy Polamalu type, both of who played in 3-4 defenses, then I can, I can be talked into building back to front a little bit more. But when I run a 4-3, a 4-3 under, a 4-3 under soft zone base defense, then I'm going to go ahead and need my front four to get the job done. And that's, I think that's really the key to it on that. But well said, you don't wipe back to front. You just don't do it. Especially the ladies. Uh, ADL Williams, Ethan, that docuseries about the Mariners is really good. Oh, sorry. Um, Maverick Consulting Group, we need to ditch Gino and pick up McCoy. Yes, Maverick. I, we do. I, I was thinking that he would be outside of our price range, Maverick, but then I noticed he was, we was paid the league minimum last year. And he can make the throws that are needed in this offense. I'm good with it. At least then he doesn't kill us every year, right? At least there's not a third year of Colt McCoy dusting you up. Uh, Andy L. Williams, Randy, I wipe in a circle and gets bigger and bigger. I call it a hurricane. <laughs> Oh, no. No. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Consumer 114, Pete promoting from within, reeks of keeping control with people he already has control over. It's rather sad. Agreed, consumer. It's why, I'm, I'm, I, I, why I said I hope you guys got the positive side on this. I hope you guys could lift me up on this. And I'm not completely in the muck on this. I'm not going to lose my crap over this. It's, we knew this was what it is. It's not a shock to us, you know, um, and certainly reinforced by K.J. Wright's recent interview. Um, but you, you did, you did kind of hope in your spirit somewhere that maybe Carol and company could look at this past season and, okay, you didn't get your results this year. You haven't been getting your results. It's, be, it's become diminishing returns. Perhaps you need to expand, widen, grow, innovate. 
And uh, instead, they double back down in the other direction in a lot of respects. Caleb Handley, do you plan to go undefeated? Uh, in my fantasy land, I do. <laughs> Uh, I don't, I don't think any team, Caleb, especially the extra game now in the NFL season is ever going undefeated again. That's, that's just, maybe it'll happen at some point, but I don't know. That's a tough one. Megan Gock, Roger. What's up, Megan? in the house. What's up, Megan? How you doing, Megan? Says, greetings, 12. My lady from Dananda. Uh, my Steve Largent Funko arrived today. Makes dealing with a severe allergic reaction a little easier. Well, that's good to hear, Megan. Steve Large and Funko always makes the, the day a little bit better. I got to get mine too on that one. So uh, nice, nice. I got a little Funko jealousy going on here, Megan. A little Funko jealousy. But uh, thank you for the donation. Very kind of you. Uh, Dev Peterson with a $5 donation. Thank you, Dev. You're awesome as well. Double donos today, Dev, huh? You excited for the throwbacks? And when do you see us wearing them? Um, Dev, I've been excited for the throwbacks for years now was waiting and waiting and hoping they could come back. I wish they were a yearly event. Hell, I wish we wore them a couple times a year, quite frankly. I just, I, and it's not just nostalgia. I just think they look tight. Um, if there was a game that we were going to play this year, well, I guess we don't get to play the AFC West, right? Because that would have been the easy answers if we were just playing some team from the AFC West. That's the game you pick. Um, hmm. I don't know on that one, Dev. I don't know, but they're going to wear it this year. You know, they, it will be this year for sure. And probably earlier on in the season later, because a lot of people have been clamoring for it. But I don't know what the exact game would be. If we're playing the AFCOS teams, it'd be so much easier to give you an answer on that. But we're just not. not even, I think we get the Jets as our, we're doing the Jets and the, uh, oh, wait, are we doing the AFC West? We are doing the AFC West next year, aren't we? Yeah, I'm tripping. Yeah, I'm tripping on that. I don't know. I gotta look it up. I'll look it up. If we're doing the AFC West, just any of those games, Deb, that'd be the that'd be the the sweet answer. And then we make like if we play the Broncos, they gotta wear the the old school Bronco uniforms, right? Raiders are Raiders, Chiefs are Chiefs. So, um, Seahawks gaming, Hawks Nest. Can you make a vid of what Ed Donatel brings to the Seahawks? Sure, man. I've been looking for a reason to do some, bring some, uh, some stuff to it. Why not, man? That'd be a great topic. Great idea, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've been looking to, to, to dive into something here on this. So I've been just kind of turning over my head, but, uh, yeah, absolutely. Great idea, brother. Megan says, retiring bad refs. Now that's an interesting way of saying, don't, that's an interesting way of saying things. Don't you think twelves? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Um, uh, Maverick Consulting Group. We need guys on offensive line that can get into space and good at second level or Russ will never throw screens. Very well said, Maverick. I've, I'm, it's one of the reasons I do put offensive line at the top of my list because it does accomplish a couple of things in, in doing so. Um, number one, you get a great offensive line that can pass protect. You've now given Russell Wilson the first great pass protecting offensive line that he's had basically in his entire career. Uh, number two, if you have an offensive line that can move people off the ball, because these aren't just one trick ponies. Now you actually got some talented guys that can both help you in pass and the run game rather than just helping you in the run game, let's say. So now you're able to actually run the ball as well consistently. Well, that's going to help out as well, isn't it? Um, and then the third part, the part that you, you brought up Maverick is the need within this scheme to have mobile offensive linemen. Shanahan and the Denver Broncos, his father, Shanahan, um, which is where the scheme comes from. And before that, it goes back to Walsh. But the real important wrinkle here was the wrinkle provided by Shanahan when he arrived at the Broncos. And what he did is he brought mobile offensive linemen to play because this was at a time where NFL teams with offensive linemen were just going bigger and bigger and bigger. The bigger, the better. Bigger, the better. And mobility didn't really matter. It was thought of, well, if he's immobile, it's just more of a man for the defender to have to go around. But Shanahan flipped that on its ear. He said, no, we're going to go to mobile offensive linemen, guys that can get out in space, guys that can pull, get to the second level, hitch their, hit these reach blocks. And he created numbers games in the run game to one side of the football field, as is carried down to the Rams and carried down to the 49ers, carried down to now us. And that's how a guy like Terrell Davis, who was a sixth-round sixth pick coming out of Georgia, 
Didn't have a lot of running George as a running back, came out and became a Hall of Famer running behind this offensive line. And they had some good names in there, but they had no Walter Jones, Steve Hutchinson type in that crew, and they won back-to-back Super Bowls. So you need to bring mobile linemen into this offensive scheme. It's within the DNA of it. And right now I we bring this up because you have 36, 37-year-old Dwayne Brown can't move like he once did. Damian Lewis is not the greatest of the moving type offensive linemen. Posick is just all right. Gabe Jackson certainly getting older and less mobile with age. And really, Brandon Shell was not anything you would term as a mobile lineman. Specifically, to your point on this, Maverick, it helps out the screen game in addition to helping you out in the run game. Because part of why we've sucked in our screen game, many of you have lamented it, is because of the fact that Russell drops back, the linemen need to get to a spot by the time Russell throws to the running back. Russell throws the ball, gets to the running back, our linemen are always two to three steps behind where they're supposed to be by the time that ball is arriving in the running back's hands. And that speaks to slow linemen, guys that just can't get there in, on time. Which is why it's been bad for years, folks, because we've been favoring more of the old school approach to offensive linemen, which is the bigger, the, the bigger, the better. I've long said Coach Carroll is a size queen. Sorry, but he is. Lolo, just joining in, but we should either sign Jason Kelsey and draft a center behind him to develop or pay for Jensen and get Eric Fisher. Uh, I brought it up to Brendan Nelson, and he sees it as a possibility. Uh, Jason Kelsey uh, is a great idea, Lolo. I'm just, and you, you just uh, did a nice job of uh, leading right into what I was just talking about. Jason Kelsey is one of the great all-time movers at the center position. Um, he's got, I mean, literally can move, I don't know, a better lineman uh, at pulling or getting out into space than Kelsey. It might take him to the Hall of Fame one day. He is old, 34 years old, 35 years old, getting up there. But with that said, he had a great year this past year for the Eagles. Hasn't showed a necessarily a sign of slowing down significantly. Got a little bit of injury concern, but he would be a purified fit for what we want to accomplish in this scheme. Uh, Jensen's not quite the mover Kelsey is, but Jensen's still a very good player, younger. And yes, I'm with you, Lolo. Target either of those two guys and throw some money at him if you got to do it. Um, I'm with it. I'm for it. Uh, Eric Fisher um, is, to me, a good secondary possibility. If you lose out on Teron Armstead and I'm looking for a consolation prize B, Eric Fisher's not bad. Um, is he? He's nowhere near as good as Teron Armstead. Um, he's right in line with what you kind of get a little bit out of Dwayne Brown, but he's not as old, significantly younger. And again, if you don't have a quick, easy gap to finding that left tackle via the draft, or you want to draft, address other things in the draft, this opens it up by going to Fisher because he can get the job done for you at left tackle. He's not going to be a revolving door. He's not some, you're, you're just getting by with guys. He should be at least a, a, a somewhat above average player over the left tackle position, especially one more year removed from that major injury that he sustained with the Kansas City Chiefs in the playoffs, not about a, what, almost a year ago. Um, so I'm, I'm good with all those moves. I think uh, all of them are great possibilities. Lolo, I put them all as, uh, uh, as absolutely in range for our Seattle Seahawks. Ethan Tegwell says, oh, cool, I just finished watching the whole thing. Oh, sorry. Uh, Seahawks, Jose Rodriguez. What's up, Jose? Uh, says, uh, I could be wrong, but I don't see Russ getting traded. Giants are a mess. Saints can't afford him. Broncos don't have anything to trade for except the ninth pick. So see Russ staying until next year. Um, I'm definitely hopeful that you're right on that, Jose. And guys, Jose has been a longtime mod here and runs a great channel on his own side of things. So please do go over there and check out Jose, uh, Jose's channel if you could for me, please, and subscribe. But um, I'm, I'm not sure, Jose. I have no real read. I'm 100% being 100 with you. I've got no read on this situation right now as it pertains to Russell Wilson. I, I don't. I, I want to believe he's going to stay. That's as long as I've long said. I, I hope this is where this goes with this, especially if we're going to be trying to contend next year. Um, but I also don't have a complete read on it. You know, you hear Rappaport's report coming out about, uh, you know, wants to explore options. Um, I do agree with you. I think that he wants to go to an ideal destination if he's moved. He doesn't just want to get out of town at all costs. And whatever destination he looks to has to be a better place than the one he's leaving from, which is, I think, in your, you know, built into your point there. Um, and there aren't a lot of places that stand out like that. I think the Broncos are a little interesting 
because of the fact that they do offer him a plethora of pass catchers, uh, a decent to good offensive line, and that's not bad to start with. On top of Javante Williams, a great running back uh, behind him. So that, that offense is pretty pretty good shape for him, Jose, and the defense ain't bad. Um, now, w- when it comes to assets, Seattle will get back. The ninth pick, you know, the ninth pick, plus two first-round picks, plus a couple second-round picks. Maybe they throw in Bradley Chubb, Jose. You could probably make the deal get done on something like that. But I will give you this. Uh, you look at the Raiders' job. He looked at the Raiders a couple years ago. That's out. Bears a couple years lot looked at them last year. They've got fields. They're not going to look to make a trade probably for us, I wouldn't think. Um, the Giants doesn't seem like a destination, though it's a bigger market for him to go to. That's all they offer at this point is them being a bigger market. Everything else, to your point on this, is they're kind of in a mess state. Uh, Saints lose Payton, another one of his destinations he brought up last year. He's not going to want to go there without Sean Payton. Say nothing of the cap hell that they find themselves within. This really does lead down to only fewer and fewer and fewer choices for us to go to from his standpoint. Seattle certainly would have their pick of a variety of teams that probably would be willing to, to say, hey, we'll, we'll bring them aboard and we'll give you all this. But does R- Russell want to go to those teams? And um, I think it's a, it's a salient point on your part, Jose. Uh, Megan Gock Rogers celebrating two months as a Hawks Nest member. Appreciate you, Megan. This is not sure about Hurt as a defensive coordinator. I really wanted Sean Desai. Understandable why. Would have been more of a home run potential move. There's less of a feeling here that you're getting anything past like a double in a best case scenario. But uh, there's also the there's also the, the the feeling on this one, Megan, that I don't know that whoever you brought in there was going to be much change driven by that. They was going to be remaining what it is, and it is the Carol show for good, for badder, for lesser, for worse, right? Till death do us part. <laughs> oh, please, no. But maybe so. Um, Randall, I'll start checking the magazine stands for the draft mags. I love the player comps for whatever reason. It gives a snapshot of their play, can then dive into their take a bit. I love it too, Randall. It's part of what I'm trying to do now. Um, so the two parts I'm trying to do with each prospect I look at, Randall, is on each pro- – and I'm not getting it yet there on all these guys. I'm still – because a lot of them are still formulating what I'm – you have to see. Some guys you see quick, a, a, a small amount of tape, bang, you know what they are. Oh, this guy's that. He does this. He does this. And other guys, it's like you're just you're, – you're, you're turning through it like, God, I see some of this here, but then he shows some of that there. But then it gets just a little harder to – to peg down a bit. But I, the two things I want to do on my guys when I'm, I'm looking at these guys going down the boards is put a, their patented move, running back, quarterback, defensive tackle, defensive end. What's their patented move? What's their patented thing they go to? And then the second thing is player comps. Who is the NFL player they look at, look like? So like Isaiah Spiller to me, Randall. Isaiah Spiller to me looks like a slower Arian Foster. You know, I think that just, it, it, it Brings very quickly to your mind. Get you, it gets you nice and concise in the breakdown at that point. Uh, Maverick Consulting Group. Hurd has a built-in babysitter with Donatel. He does. He's got the Donatel's got the the whole baby bag with him, right? The extra bottles, little milk warmer, you know, baby wipes. He's got it all there. He's like, what you need, Clint? Here, all this. Did you poo yourself? You can... Go on, survive. Uh, they don't need the Rooney. Uh, they don't need the Rooney. Just don't. Be biased, hire the best candidate. That's what you would hope would happen there. I, I think these owners are still, some of them are in a little bit of the, again, old mindset where it's like, are you sometimes valuing the right things? Are you, you know, and, and again, I'm the guy who advocates for an active ownership as much as anybody, but you can't be an active owner at the detriment of your team. You can't be Jerry Jones. You can't be Al Davis later in life. Uh, and you can't be Stephen Ross who quite frankly has had his share of stuff kind of pop out. And, you know, we're looking at the Washington football team with Dan Schneider and all the stuff that goes around them. You know, sometimes I almost feel like some of these owners, it's like something out of the Wolf of Wall Street in their life all the time. You know, they're just coked up, getting high, doing whatever. And then they also happen to own a a football team. I mean, I, I like to think that these guys that have had to the bust ass to get where they're getting, and and but sometimes you hear stories like this where it's like hundred thousand for a loss. Like, what did you think you were gonna? And then this is the same owner, by the way, that pushes for them to draft Tua. <sighs> That's not the good owner type. That's the too much owner guy. But they do need to just hire the best candidates, man. If I own the team, you can bet I would.
Kyle Brown, the way the Hawks went out winning to end the season, didn't, did, didn't you notice the difference in offensive play calling? You think Pete is affecting too much in that bad play calling of the offense? Um, did I notice a little bit different in the play calling marginally, maybe Kyle marginally. I don't know if I would fully say that. I believe that Carol took the reins off of, off of, of Waldron and said, you, you, you're the captain of the boat. Offensively speaking. Uh, I do think Carol had a lot of say on him throughout the course of the season. Kyle, I don't think it was always a whole game say it was just him coming at here and there and there and all over the place a little bit. But I think that this is the this is why maybe you end up with a guy like Waldron as an untested offensive coordinator rather than finding, let's say, a, a superstar offensive coordinator who's out on the open market who would love to come and pair himself with Russell Wilson, a Hall of Fame quarterback, and have dynamic young guys on the outside like DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett who would seemingly make any upper-end offensive coordinator look even better should they come in, right? You look at it on the face of it, Kyle, and you go, Oh, I, this this should be. We should have our pick of the litter, you know. It's it should be a buyer's market right now. They should be coming in on a on bended knee, begging to come aboard. But instead, you end up with the untested, you know, kid that looked like he just got out of college, and uh, and you go, well, that's kind of odd. Those don't seem to match up. A Hall of Fame quarterback, great talent over here, a coach that's won, gone to Super Bowls. Something seems to be at play here. Something seems to be going on, and I can't help Kyle but just keep coming back to the thing that's going on is that these prime offensive coordinators, a Vic Fangio defensive coordinator, they don't want to go coordinate under a coach who isn't going to let them be the cook in the kitchen. They're not going to want to be a coordinator under a coach where they essentially are there to take all of the slings and arrows and a little bit of the praise when it comes, but all the slings and arrows when they're not being able to make all those decisions, right? You don't want to fall on a sword when you weren't the one who chose to go to battle and, or, you know, coach Carroll comes into the offensive mind's ear, for instance, Waldron in it's third quarter and says, I want you to start running the ball more, run the next four plays. Coach, coach, run the next four plays, run the next four plays. Uh, coach, I, I'm setting up a, I'm setting up a thing here. I've got a whole deal. I'm setting up for a big play in like five plays. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want you to just, we need to establish the run, run the ball, you know, but then, you go in, you go two, three, three and outs, let's say, in those couple of quarters there, right? And then that, that press conference at the end, Waldron, what happened there? What was the play calling? Four straight runs? Where was that? Why would you do that? What would make you think that was a smart move, Shane? Why would you even think to do that? And he's got to sit there and just chew on his tongue, <laughs> knowing in the back of his hand, because the old man told me to do it. So I, I think that that's pushing some people away a little bit. And Kyle, remember, there was that soundbite we had this season that, that, again, backs up exactly what I'm saying. You can go find the soundbite. I forget which game it is in, but it's out there. I'm sure somebody's probably clipped it. And it's Waldron walking over to Carroll, and he's like, okay, what do you want on these next three plays? I can uh, run, run, pass, or pass, pass, run. What do you want to do, coach? So does an offensive coordinator who's fully in command of the play calling, who is doing what he wants to do, walk over to a coach and ask him that question. If that coach isn't in his ear constantly about what he's supposed to call. And as I've always said, if Carroll is that invested into the offensive side of the ball, which is not his expertise, which is not his background, God only knows the level of control that he exerts on the defensive side of the ball. Kyle Brown. I mean, there have been three offensive coordinators and we look the same. Agreed, Kyle. Agreed. Because Carroll's got a way he wants to run the football team for, for better or worse. And frankly, 20 years ago is for the better. 10 years ago, it was for the better. Football changes. Football evolves. People innovate. People solve what you do. What is the next chapter of your book as a coach? What is the next wrinkle that you apply to your program? And that's, in my opinion, where we're going wrong offensively. Is he still stuck into this mold of, I'm, I'm going to keep doing what we've always done. It'll work at some point here. It'll work at some point. Just one more little twist of the knob. Now it'll work. Nope, it doesn't work. Okay, one more pull of the lever. Now it'll work. No, it doesn't work. One more. No, it's not working because it's an old approach. Modernize your approach. Um, but well well said, Kyle. Roy uh, Frolic says, uh, what are your thoughts on Adrian P? Did he have a significant impact on Penny? I think he definitely helped Penny out, and, and certainly Penny has been on Twitter and said said a couple of times, got an emotional talking about him, um, about his reverence 
for Adrian Peterson. And, and maybe that was the last little thing to help Penny kind of snap in a bit. Um, hard to say on that, Roy. I tend to go what I, what I lean towards more than Adrian doing some magical, saying some magical thing into his ear. Cause I don't think Adrian was giving him anything that, um, that, that Penny didn't already kind of know. To me, it was more of Penny now finally has a full year removed of the ACL surgery that he suffered at the end of the year. And it does take about that time to get all the way back, especially when you factor in not the ACL injury itself, not the knee itself, but the associative muscle strains, muscle pulls that you get because the, the leg has to re kind of learn how to run with this ligament pulled a little bit tighter. And I feel like he kind of just got finally back to the point where he got through some of those small strains and pulls and finally up to health. And there was an open door for him to finally walk through where Chris Carson wasn't in front of him or some other running back wasn't in front of him, preventing him from getting carries. So I lean to it being more that, but certainly Peterson probably helped. Maverick Consulting Group says maybe Jimmy G can go to the Bucks. Uh, Bruce Arians would not touch Jimmy Garoppolo with a, uh, with a 10 foot pole. The no risk it, no biscuit model of things is not going to take on a quarterback who can't throw outside the hash marks. So, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's not going there, unfortunately. Right. Uh, Arians wants arm strength. He wants to let her rip, baby. Let her rip, baby. Let her rip, baby. Uh, Kyle Brown, Hawks need to utilize tight ends a bit more and, uh, and work on their screenplays. Well, as I was saying a few moments ago, Kyle, the screenplays will get better when you get linemen that can move out in space to lay those blocks. Um, agree with you on the tight ends. I'd love to see them worked a little bit more in this offense. It kind of came and went this year a little bit. Uh, Lolo, I think the Steelers sh should go two years with Jimmy G, rebuild somewhat, and then draft a guy in the future. Uh, Steelers have been a little more of a down-the-field type passing a team when Ben could throw it down the field. So it, it hasn't been their history to go in that direction of things with looking for a, a guy that's more, you know, inside a little bit on that. Um, you know, you, you, you think about a guy like Chase Claypool, you know, is, is Jimmy Garoppolo going to get a lot out of Chase Claypool on the outside? I'm not, I'm not sure he is. It makes some sense on the surface of it, but Jimmy's got to go to more of, to me, something that's going to be more about the short passing attack, even spread short concepts or whatever, you know. If Kyler Murray retired tomorrow, like the Cardinals wouldn't be necessarily even, I don't know, maybe, maybe the worst place. He doesn't have mobility that you kind of need for that offense, but like he needs to just be throwing like seven yard hitches all over the field and stuff. You put him in something that's going to have him push the ball down the field and that's just, it's not going to fit his game. Megan says Rogers is Rogers to 49ers is what I thought to be. Yeah. There seems something, just something about it seems right. Doesn't it Megan? Something about it seems, seems to kind of fit. I don't know what it is. Seahawks gaming. Russ is so inconsistent. He'll be so accurate sometimes. And then some days he just overthrows shit. I've seen that too. It, it is weird. And when he's accurate, as we saw in this skills challenge that he did, he can be pinpoint accurate. You know, he can knock a hummingbird off of the pin of a needle from, 50 yards away, but, uh, it isn't always there. It hasn't always been there. And it's odd to see at times when it's, when it goes away, cause you're, you're this accurate. And then you're the, this inaccurate. You're throwing the ball 10 yards over guys, heads and stuff. But that's sometimes a little bit of what you get in Russ and sometimes a little bit of what holds him back in the short and intermediate passing game. Megan says, uh, Rogers going to the 49ers will make me hate the 49ers all that much more. Yeah, me too. Me too. Me too. I'm, I'm just not going to be, that's going to suck. <laughs> it's, there's no part of it I like seeing. Um, Big Dog 247 says, do you think the Seahawks can still get Desai? Yeah, I do, Big Dog. Um, I absolutely do. Uh, number one, they offer a culture um, that might that appeal to him. I believe Donatello's got some history with him going back with Fangio there with the Bears when they were there a couple of years ago, I think. Um so there is that, and and some of it's also built to look. If he doesn't get a defensive coordinator job, he's got to go get something, you know, kind of on the back end of it. So Seattle maybe can then say, hey, "We're operating the same thing across the rest of the market is come in here and learn for some some great old coaches, get add a little more to your resume, and then uh, maybe be ready to take over this team when one of these guys moves on." So there's a little bit of a pathway there too, especially with Carroll. Um, 
should he retire? And it goes in that direction of things. But uh, yeah, I think it's a possibility and they're trying big dog. That's the reports is they're still trying to bring Desai back into the fold here. Uh, Rec Carr, anything interesting happened yet? It looks like Rec, we've uh, signed, uh, well, signed, we've, we've elevated Clint Hurt, our defensive line coach to defensive coordinator. That appears to be the major first bit of news this off season that's coming down the track outside of course, Ken Norton being fired. Seahawks Gaming, well, if Clint Hurt is a former defensive line coach, we might pursue some trench players, just like how we got Shane Waldron, a former tight end coach, a tight end in free agency. <laughs> yes, very true. I like to think that too, Seahawks Gaming. Like I was saying with uh, Norton, you know, he came in as a in 2018, and 2018, you, you know, and onward, you, you re-sign Bobby Wagner to a massive deal. You you go get uh, Cody Barton in the third round. You get fifth round pick Ben Burkirvan. Then what, a year later, go and get Jordan Brooks in the first round. So they've definitely gone a little bit heavier to the linebackers of recent, not to mention at that time they were still paying both Bobby Wagner and KJ Wright actually as well. So not only did they draft those guys, but they were paying both linebackers big money. So I, I hope that's the only, that's the thing above anything else. I hope in the situation with hurt coming aboard better than any kind of little wrinkles he's going to be able to provide is as a coach is that he at least can get them to finally buy into getting the defensive line rich and right. It's, 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 it's the place that's just, to me, confused me as much as Carroll as far as any miss of recent history, of not understanding why, how his defense works and the necessity of getting those guys up front that can get the job done. But they've gone light on it in so many years now over and over again. Uh, you know, Deion Jordan playing a significant role as an edge player for you for the majority of the year. You know, just not enough. You got to go more. You got to go harder to make this defense not just work, but potentially become dominant. That's the thing with this. It's not just that, like, removing this defense from get, getting it from being league worst style to up into the mid mid range of things. It's that if you get the front four like this, they can get to a dominant state again. I truly believe that. Certainly helps getting corners and back in. You're going to need a little bit of balance on this. I'm not just saying you can go weak ass corners out there, but as Carroll showed this year, Michael Jackson Jr. <laughs> Going out there and, and balling out at the end of the year, Sidney Jones, Trey Brown, rookie cornerback, John Reed, Blesson Austin, all of them and all of them went in and did just fine when they went in. You know, he knows what he's doing with cornerbacks. It's a little harder to go get those those value, those valuable boys down there on the on, on the front four. Uh, Deb Peterson says seeing a sack Rogers twice a year would be nice especially when he comes up all limping and he's like doing his like, mm, mm, my, my toe, my toe hurts. I got to go inside. Don't talk to me. I'm mad. Angry beard. Mm. Uh, Seahawks Gaming, is Fletcher Cox a free agent? No, he is not a free agent. Uh, and as I rem- if I remember co- co- correct, correct elect, if I correct elect, um, I believe he is basically married to the Eagles for the foreseeable future. I believe so. Let me double check. I think they've got a pretty significant dead money hit if they release him. If I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. Yeah. They're married to him. So they, if they release Fletcher Cox, they've got a $41 million dead money hit versus only a $15 million cap hit this next upcoming year. So Eagles did some acrobatics last offseason to put themselves in the position to uh, still be able to fit that roster in this past year. So they made their devil, they made their deal with the devil a little bit. So yeah, uh, Seattle Supersonic Boom Shakalaka says, get another, uh, what's up, Boom Shakalaka? Uh, get another tight end that can catch better offensive line and some pass rushers. Stay out of the tired old defense. Well, I think of the first couple of things you mentioned there will happen. I don't know if the last part will happen. I'm a little reticent to believe it will actually, but uh, they're definitely going to get somebody at the tight end position. We need two, frankly, and you sure would hope you sure would hope we would be able to upgrade the offensive line. By the way, folks, uh, I don't know if you guys get a chance to do this, but I went on over to the, um, there's the uh, the mock draft site, SBN, I believe is what it's called or something. You can Google search, just Google mock draft boards. It's fun. You can go through and do a mock draft of uh, the Seattle Seahawks draft, and you can run it through a couple of times. It's a simulation. So you can run a whole seven-round draft um, on through, and it's kind of interesting in that respect. Um, 
but I had, I, I ran my first one. And so I ran my first one. I'm going to bring it up here on the screen for you guys. so You can see it. And, uh, and it's kind of a dream scenario first mock. I'm not going to lie to you guys. Like it's pretty much like this would be a dream scenario for us, but let me get you guys hyped. So <laughs> now there's no way this is happening. Okay. No way this is happening, but I didn't cook the books. I didn't cook the books on this one. This one just went is went as it went. And I didn't do any trade downs. I didn't game the system. I just picked the player that's available on the board. So number 41, I took uh, I took Nicholas uh, Petit Ferrer, and that was with, by the way, Daniel Fa'alele on the board at 41 as well. So I went with the Ohio State left tackle, great feet, really athletic. Um, I see upside in the kid. I think he's just tapping into it. He's not a finished product. Um, he'll be a good, I think, uh, left tackle in this league. Uh, 72, I got Abraham Lucas, Washington State. No way he lasts into the third round, in my opinion, but nonetheless, he did last into the third round in this thing, so I took him. He's there. I'm going to grab him. Uh, so I grabbed Mr. Lucas there. So I handled our left tackle. I handed our right tackle. And then I went out and I took Alex Lindstrom, a center, the, maybe the second best center in this draft, third, maybe third, second, third best center in this draft <clears throat> out of Boston College. So I got our left tackle. I got our right tackle. I got our center in the first three rounds. No problem, right, folks? Running football, running NFL organizations easy. This is simple stuff. Simple, simple, easy stuff, I tell you. So easy. <laughs> And then I took uh, fourth round uh, James Car James Cook, uh, Mr. Cook's brother uh, from um, from Minnesota, Dalvin Cook's brother, real explosive guy, be great in the third down game, can do some ride with, run some wide receiver routes and whatnot. Uh, that would be kind of a dream. That would be a dream draft to go pick up something like that and get all those guys, which we won't be able to do. But again, it's still a really fun site to go over there and play with some of those mock draft simulation things it kind of gives you some some fun little things to kind of break down and i think they update it more and more as it goes along in their um, scouting process because there's some of those guys there's no way they were going to fall like they did uh but it's still it's a guy can dream uh puff says same old tire same old defense maybe um some new schematics thrown in there hopefully we get a, some star player talent on the defensive line aka clowny I would love it if they did, man. You know me, I'm a big backer on Clowney, but there's other guys out there that could work too. It doesn't just have to be him. Um, just make it a priority as much as anything, right, Puff? Because when you go and you say, okay, this offseason, we're going to lose Frank Clark, and you go, okay, well, how are we going to make, how are we going to replace Frank Clark's production? We're going to go get Ziggy Ansaw, who's listed 32 years old, but he came over from Africa and they don't have birth certificates over there, so he's really 46. And then we're going to draft LJ Collier, a really raw pass rusher out of TCU. And those guys will, re will replace Frank Clark's production. And then they don't, you know, they don't. You, you, you didn't really address that. You didn't give it the respect it needed or it deserved. And then you did the same thing the year after. And as I said, you, you, the organization itself has told you that they understood they made mistakes in this respect, right? The plan was never to make a trade for Jadavian Clowney at the 25th hour of training camp. Uh, in order to try to get your pass rush somewhere decent. They only made that trade after they went to training camp and they went, my God, nobody is winning in our pass rush drills. And the pass rush drills are meant for the defensive linemen to win. Oh my God. And then they did the very same thing the next year, right? Because then you lose Clowney. And then you go, okay, we'll, we'll go get Ben Mayo and Bruce Irvin in free agency. <sighs> And then literally Carol comes to us in a press conference and says, well, if you add up Mayoa's and Irvin sack totals, they're more than what Clowney got last year. So really we upgraded our pass rush. If you think about it, you know, if you just add it with math. <laughs> Shocker, that one didn't work out as well. And again, cause, again, the organization acknowledged it with the Jamal Adams trade. Don't make the same mistake, you know. Don't make that same mistake this offseason. Finally address it. And God, ho I'm hopeful that that's the one thing Hurt can maybe bring to play here is to get them and get into Carol's ear, grab him by his ear, pull it down to his face. Say, listen, you m and -er. Need you to go get some guys named defensive linemen. Um, Megan says, hope that throwback game is when I'm there in October, B. That would be cool, Megan. That'd be a, that'd be a hell of a treat. Um, Megan, our Maverick Consultant Group, we do play the end of AFC West. Okay. Okay. Oh, well, it's got to be the first AFC. I think we should wear it for all four AFC West games if we're going to be. I mean, does anybody say no to that? 
If we do throwback jerseys for all four NFC West games, AFC West games, and we ask them to also wear their throwbacks, Raiders and Chiefs, whatever, but the Broncos with that stupid horse on the side of their helmet, I think it'd be pretty cool. So that is cool. I like it. Um, you got to do it for the AFC West games then. You got to. You just got to. It's the right answer. In the tech world, I'm not a big fan of promoting Hurt and calling it a day. However, backing him up with Donatel, lots of experience, and hopefully Sean Desai, exciting rising coach. Now I can say that's interesting. I can say the same thing. Then I, I, I would say that it's, it's not, to me, that's not a too many cooks in the kitchen. That's to your point on this kind of a balance of different things you need on the coaching staff. You need the old grizzled wisdom provided by the elders. You need the young whippersnapper with all the great young new ideas he's bringing into play that some will work, some won't. And then you need the middle ground guy who's just up on his, on his kind of rise of things and, and kind of in the middle of getting, getting to that next spot where kind of hurt is a little bit now as he's, as he's branching into becoming a defense coordinator. Um, I think it's a nice little, a nice little mixture there. All right, AFC West. Remember, Tom says we do play the AFC West. All right, I'm stoked, man. Those those unis are going to look nice. I just want to see this. I want the Chiefs, like the Chiefs have updated their uni itself, but the helmet, I think, stayed the same. But they need to go back to their old unis. And I think the Raiders ones changed just a tiny bit. But again, the helmet stayed the same. So it'll, it'll still, it'll bring back all those memories. It'll hit, you, hit me in all the feels. Tribe says the quarterback who took him to two championship games in a Super Bowl, plus two coordinators. Welcome to five and twelve, San Francisco. Maybe, man. I'll tell you, I've got more. I, I, if I'm looking at any of the teams in this NFC West that I think are going to fall off, first and foremost, I put the Cardinals, and then more of the Rams beyond where I see where the Niners are with their roster. I could be wrong on that, but. I feel like they're just kind of in the right direction as they go forward. But some of that is also how high I am on Trey Lance. Uh, it looks like we're going full Vic Fangio on the defense by bringing an abundance of coaches instead of just one. It, it maybe could work. I, I've long said that the thing that bothers me with Coach Carroll doing what he's doing and having so much insertion into both the offense and defensive side of the ball is that football has gotten more and more and more difficult as far as coaching and what is required of you and what you need to accomplish to be great at your job. And that it's become very specialized and you need your specializations. You need your guys who do just what they do and do it well. And every bit of this, every spoke of the wheel is doing their part. Um, I, I would be a lot more in favor of that than having the one figurehead who's got his fingers in all the pies. So it's, it makes sense. Jackson Shore, yo, Brandon, just came back from a college party. How do you feel about the move? I'm okay with it. It doesn't get me tremendously excited, Jackson. I like getting Donatello along with him, so that, that makes it a little bit better from my standpoint of things. Um, it's certainly, these aren't the best candidates. Again, they're going in-house on this, which means you're not necessarily going for the best candidate you're going for the one that's not going to necessarily rock the boat and when i'm making a coaching hire with somewhat of the first and foremost skill set they bring to play being that they're not going to rock the boat it makes me wonder if there's not necessarily a better hire to be found but i'm willing to be open-minded to this and uh see what uh see if maybe we can maybe he's maybe he's a bright young up-and-coming guy you know he's not a retread i'll say that but so-so about it, Jackson. So-so. Team 12s, this is Jace. Don't know if I told you about the other week. I hit 100 subs, got COVID last week, and I just got out of quarantine. Well, another uh, another longtime supporter of the channel, folks. Team 12's got a great little channel himself over there. Please, He's uh, known as Jace to you guys, as a mod Jace, I believe, on here. So please, another another one on here. Please do go over there and subscribe to his channel. Got to help out our Hawks, Hawks uh, community out here on YouTube. Jackson Shore says, I'm okay with it. From what I see, Hurt is uh, not a yes man. And if we get to Cy, we have Fangio's staff and we get a rusher with uh, Taylor. I'm excited about our defense. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful, Jackson. I'll get excited once I start seeing what moves are made or what wrinkles we're hearing about the defense um, that could be changed. You know, when it's about change, it's about fixing and correcting what has been broken and not working. And if they show signs and a willingness to do that, doesn't matter who the hire is at that point, I'll applaud it. I'll stand up and applaud it. I will. Clap. 
Uh, Maverick Consulting Group, Russ is staying. Pete is not giving up his franchise quarterback. Well, you may be right on that, Maverick. I mean, that's the whole thing that's that's lingered over this whole talk a little bit, right? Has been both, and this has been more talked about recently from Russell's side, where it's, well, Russell's got a no trade clause. Russell's not going to be moved. Russell Russell gets to have save where he goes. So that might mean that there's not a deal done because of that. Well, the inverse is true as well. The, the team has to dictate and say that we do want to move Russ as well. Russ is not a guy that's going to sit out or threaten to retire at 30, 33 years old. So at the end of the day, you can still force him for the next couple of seasons to remain in tow. It's a possibility. I'd long wondered, Maverick, if they would really play that kind of hardball with Russ, being that you sort of maybe have played that hardball over this last year. Like he wanted to maybe even be traded last offseason. You didn't do it. And maybe there was even perhaps conversations at that time that we will hold off from making this trade now because we're not getting the assets we want right now. We think those assets will be there next year if you do want to go at that time. Uh, still. So I, I've wondered if that's what's maybe going on in the background of this a bit. But with that said, I think I don't have a read on the situation at all. I do not one way or another. And I don't think that it's set one way or another at this point. I don't. I think it's a little fluid. And um, if some team comes in offering the farm, the horses, the cattle, the river, Seattle might just jump on that deal. William Leonard, hey, uh, did you guys see any of the Pro Bowl today. What a joke and a mockery. I couldn't watch for very long. Pro Bowl should be st- should stick to the skills competition. Agreed, William. I think you could just run skills competitions and that'd be just fine with me. Um, yeah, it, it, it's become a joke. Um, and it's, it's become maybe as, I mean, basketball is a little bit like this too, I guess. So I, I can't give basketball a pass because certainly those, um, you know, certainly, certainly those games are not exactly uh, defensive uh, de- defensive exercises, but, um, it, you know, they can get rid of the Pro Bowl. As someone said today, though, you know, the thing with the Pro Bowl is they're going to get rid of the Pro Bowl when it stops being profitable. Pro Bowl is not pro- Pro Bowl's profitable right now. So, therefore, it's going to continue on, you know. Oh, my God, I'm behind on the chat. Sorry, folks. We'll catch up here. I'll catch up, and if you're new in the chat, sometimes I get behind because I try to respond to everybody in uh, the chat as I can. As I can. Marcus Overly, uh, the only place for Russ is Philly and Miami, but very doubtful he will take either one. Uh, yep, those are two spots. I do think the Giants are still there, Marcus, a little bit because I, I do think that there's a little bit of a there, there there's a little bit of an attraction from Russ's part to the New York, not just for what it could do for his career, but what it could hopefully maybe even help out and do for Sierra's career. Um, I think that that would appeal to him on that level too. Um, then that may go beyond football. Jackson says, I love Russ. He means the world to me. But dude, if you want to be here, uh, say it. Stop with the B's. Uh, love, stop with the BS. Love him, but I'm a Seahawks fan first. I, yeah, I don't like the I'm going to explore my options stuff. You're either here or you're not. But so much of this has been a PR battle going on for a couple of years now. I'm starting to just get used to it. It's why also they say, though, Jackson, I'm not going to do a whole show around it or do some, here's a summation of where we're at with the Russell situation. Here's where this, it's, I think it's been tedious for everybody. I think all the fans, wherever, whether you're a supporter of Russ or whether you've bailed on Russ or whether you're kind of tired of Russ, wherever you are, or ardent uh, lover of Russ to the end, whatever it is, I think a lot of people have, have grown tired of what is he or isn't he and would just like to see some sort of, resolution for the situation uh for the future clara be calf how you doing clara my, my my girl from new york says okay so russell wilson proved himself at a pro bowl he is still a very good quarterback can we talk about fixing the offensive line and quarterback looking good brandon mm. clara from new york city <laughs> thank you clara you always know how to make me blush don't you um i appreciate you yeah, still looks like he can throw the ball around. And Clara, as you saw with my mock draft that I just ran, I went three, I went three offensive linemen out of my first picks. Folks, I'm not messing around about this offensive line. I'm not messing about, okay? I, I'm, I want to address this. I want to get this done. I want to, again, like the defensive line, I want to hammer it. You have the means to hammer it. Seattle has the resources to hammer it. Is the willingness there? Is the intention there? Is the want there? Is the will there? That's what I question. That's what I wonder, Clara. And uh, I hope so. I hope so. But we will we will see. But you're very right. We need to take care of the offensive line. Um, DJ Reed, Claire, did just a couple days ago do like an emoji eyes with a signing paper. A lot of people have taken from that that um, 
that there's maybe some soft agreement in place with Seattle. And certainly if you bring back DJ Reed before you even start free agency, it's going to help you a lot with the cornerback room. Say nothing to maybe even bring back Sidney Jones, which I'd love to see as well. So um, agree on both those accounts. I would like to still take a look at cornerback and cornerback was one of my guys after I drafted three offensive linemen and a running back. I went for a cornerback out of Arkansas with uh, what was the fifth round pick or whatnot. So I do still acknowledge we got to deal with that as well. We do. But thank you, Clara. You're awesome. Maverick, uh, uh, oh, sorry, you guys are talking on that. Uh, Jackson Shore, I've been thinking about quitting college, but I got to talk to my mom today, and she told me to st- suck it up, uh, but in a nice way, laughing out loud, need to survive for two more years. Jackson, it's not fun, man. I know it's not. I did college for a couple years, and I definitely couldn't make it. I didn't get close, though. I wasn't two years in. I got a couple semesters and went, uh-uh, uh-uh, no. Um, but I will say this, you know, you lose perspective when you're young in life, you know, you're 20, you you think, man, I've lived so long. I'm so old already. You're 21. I'm so old or, you know, you're not, you know, and you think about two years so long, but then you get through it, you get it done. And then, uh, you got the, the world's your oyster after that, you know, and the world's your oyster, then you can go do whatever you want. That's a good thing to have. It's a good thing to have flexibility, ability to do what you want to go do when you want to go do it. So your mom's right. Hang in there. Megan says, uh, my four-year degree ended up being six and a half years. (laughs) It was so worth it, even though I was ready to uh, quit more than once. Yeah, college is hard. It's legit tough. Jackson Shore says, I don't trust the senior bowl, and I damn sure don't trust Jim Nagy. Not falling for it again. (laughs) Marcus Overly says, Broncos for sale, and Miami and Cleveland are soon to be for sale. Ooh, Marcus, shots fired. That's a good point on this. Good point on this. Like Broncos being a potential place. If they're about to be sold, does Wilson want to go to a place that you don't know who the owner is going to be? Probably not. And uh, Miami, that's got to look unattractive to him at this point too. You know, we, Russell, a, a man who named his child Win, is going to go to a team that has an owner who paid a coach to lose games? Probably not. Kelvin, what's up? Kelvin says, I think Russell and those guys from Buffalo could turn around uh, – could turn the Giants around quick. I think so too, Keldon. I think so too. I don't think Russell would look at the Giants situation like he'd look at other franchises that, you know, if he looks at the Denver Broncos, he wants to see where they're at talent-wise. When he looks at the Giants, he's blue blood organization in New York. There's some things that might overrule, some things that might not be overruled in other cities and other organizations. Uh, Marcus Overly, I think Kenny, Pitt, P- Kenny Pickett is the real deal equals next Dan Marino and Joe Montana put together. Ooh, Marcus, that's heavy praise. That's heavy praise. I mean, he's got baby hands, though. He's got baby hands. You know, what? can, can he do it with the baby hands? My man's got to play in a stadium. That's all I'm saying. No weather conditions for him. But, hey, he might, he's probably due to be the first quarterback off the board, if not him, uh, Carson Strong, probably. So he's, he's right in line with it. Um, I think my comp for him was more of a Tony Romo, is what I saw from him. Um, but I don't think he's going to be as good as Tony Romo. So. Um, but you're not alone. A lot of people are high on him. Marcus uh, Maverick Consulting Group, Waldron in year two will be better. Zero chemistry with Russ and DK because routes were more technical, less feel. That's why Russ and Tyler are always in sync. They play by feel. DK not there yet. Not quite. He is growing. I agree with all that, Maverick. And I think you're always, you do see, and you tend to see at a very high rate that the offensive coordinators in this league have a lot more success in year two than versus year one. And it's, it's substantial most of the time. So hopefully we do see that uptick this next year, the returns of that this next year. And boy, if we do, this offense would explode. Randall McDaniel says, if I was an owner, damn Skippy, I'd be doing a ton of blow. Jim Irsay style. <laughs> exactly, Randall. So I figure Jim's the one above all else I figure doing that, you know. But I think they all, some of me just thinks that they're all doing that somewhere in the background. You got more money than God. You can do whatever you want. So why wouldn't you? What's, what's holding you back? You got a day job to be up to? Like all they got to do is like, you know, crawl them, crawl themselves up into their owner's booth and just stare down. That's why when you always, you look at the owners, they're always like half looking out of it at the game is that they're, they're, they're basically hung over or drugged out of their mind. (laughs) 
Uh, Jackson Shore says, if the Rams lose, it's a failure season for them. It don't mean a thing without the ring. Don't mean a thing without the ring. That's very true, Jackson. They went all in on this year, all in. In this offseason, there is there is uh, pain due that organization. So if they don't get it done in the Super Bowl, it's going to be a, a tough fall for them. But if they do accomplish it, they're going to set they're going to set a new trend, I think, in the NFL to certain degrees. Not whole hog everybody, but there'll be a lot more teams that start to operate, I think, with more of the go for it flow. It'll be interesting to see. Alexander Matthews says, uh, "F the Rams." Yes, F the Rams. Please don't win this game. Please don't win this game, Los Angeles. Please no. You didn't earn this. You didn't earn this. Jackson Shore, Brandon, I was watching an old Seahawks versus Broncos game and Steve Vargent tore them up. It was so much fun to watch. Some bad throws by the quarterback, didn't matter, still made plays. I've, I've long said, Jackson, that there's players that come along that are different and it doesn't matter what era they played in. Jim Brown was just different. Uh, Gail Sayers was just different. Barry Sanders was just different. I'm speaking offensive guys, of, co- of course. Uh, Randy Moss was just different. Jerry Rice, just different. Steve Vargent was just different. Just different from anybody else playing the game at that time and the way he was playing it. And it was why he retired as the best all-time receiver with all the records, all the records, when he did. They got records, got broken. Rice came along, did what he did, but that shouldn't take away from anything that Largent accomplished, especially as you point out there. He didn't have great quarterback play throughout that time. He just did not. And I, I, I long for, a, we could have had Warren Moon, we could have had John Elway if we'd been willing to offer one more first-round pick. Hell, we could have maybe even had a Brett Favre in here. Imagine any of those guys throwing to Steve. Ethan Tech World, uh, Commander's name is fine. I would have preferred Red Wolves, only so this could happen. And here are your Red Wolves. And then the fans can say, tell me that wouldn't be hilarious. That would be pretty cool, actually. I mean, we've got the stupid tomahawk chop, chop with the, the chan, Indian chants. How about, uh, how about just the howling of the fans? I think it would sound pretty cool, a whole stadium howling. I, that'd be pretty bad. I don't know. That's, I'm, I'm kind of like, not, I liked the Red Wolves already before that, but now I'm like, I'm really, they should have picked Red Wolves. Aaron Zhang, Penny ended up being, Penny, Penny ended up helping Adrian Peterson get onto the IR. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> uh, Marcus uh, Overly says, Hawks free agent targets equal uh, left tackle and right tackle from the Saints. Edge, Jones. Uh, running back Fournette, Kamura, uh, cornerback Gilmore. I like all those guys, Marcus. So if we we pull with all those guys, I'm going to be pretty happy about it. I'll tell you that. Randall says it was the gray-haired man. It was the gray-haired man. Attack man, clan killer. Uh, when you get a chance, can you watch the film on Daniel Dellinger? Yes. I did check out a couple of... Uh, Well, let me add it to my list here. Add it to my list. Daniel Dellinger. Got it. I will take a look at him. I will take a bit of a pixie. Pixie. Zach Mann says, uh, D'Angelo Malone from Western Kentucky, going to be a sleeper. Yeah, he was looking good in senior bowl practices. Sudden off the snap, violent hands. Uh, very quick, cat-like quick, that guy. Uh, I got to watch a little more tape on him, Tack Man, but I liked what I saw out of him. I did. There's some pass rushers that are going to be hard to, to necessarily slot in where they land, but who could end up being really good players for you, even you know, just as specialist pass rushers, if that's what they turn out to be. And there's a couple of those guys in this draft that, you know, they don't want to play like Jennings. You know, they, they want no part of, of the run game, but they are monster as pass rushers. Lolo, uh, when you have two season-ending injuries and then many throughout after those major injuries, it affects the player mentality? does indeed. Absolutely. Uh, Tackman, too bad Kyle Shanahan never had a top 15 quarterback as a head coach. Not yet, Tackman, but he may be very well soon. He may well soon, but that's why I have a lot of respect for Shanahan. I think he's a really good coach. Uh, Jackson Shore says, can Damian Lewis play right guard next year, please? Stop moving guys out of position. He's a stud at right guard, not left guard. That's what I'd like to see, man. I don't think that they're going to do it, though. They've got too many other positions they have to address in this offensive line to to probably do much moving around with the guards, especially because you only save $3 million by moving on from uh, Gabe Jackson. Randall McDaniel says, I heard Adrian gave Penny parenting advice. 
<laughs> Tack Man says Pitts should take a chance on quarterback like Dustin Crum from Kent State. He needs to polish his accuracy, but he has a top five strongest arm at the quarterback position. Pittsburgh's gonna have to do it. Pittsburgh's gonna grab one of these quarterbacks, Tack Man, to your point. They're gonna need somebody and they're gonna grab one of these seven, eight, nine guys that are in this draft. Desmond Ritter just to, to Pittsburgh for me seems right for some reason. I don't know why. Food Gamer says Pro Bowl was bad. Might as well play flag football. Might as well. I don't know why they do it. Well, I know they do it. It's money. They make money off it, but it's it's not worth watching. It really isn't. Lolo says I'm hopping off for now. Got to study for my driver's test. Have a good one, everyone. Have a good one, Lolo. Take care. Uh, Random Daniel, I have a theory. The reason more of Jimmy G's lame duck passes don't get picked off is because he's so good looking. I can admit it. He used, he's used to things going his way in life. <laughs> Maybe so, man. Maybe so. It's hard to catch ducks, though, too, Randall. You know, that's why the quarterbacks like to throw those spirals. Is spirals are easier to catch. Ducks are, ducks are hard. They're fighting you and they're flapping. Uh, Marcus Overly says, Rodgers goes to Pittsburgh. I can't see it. I can't see it. I don't think, I mean, I could see Pittsburgh wanting him. I don't know what Aaron would want to go to Pittsburgh. Jackson, I'm hoping we give Eskridge a shot at kick returner and punt returner. That's how you get a player like him going. I would prefer that too, Jackson. Get him touches. As many times as you get the ball in his hands, get the ball in his hands. And he's certainly going to be better at it than Freddie Swain and DG Dallas was all right. But I think he would be better than both those two guys. Uh, David Tolman says, this is a good choice. How do you feel about it this higher? I'm, uh, I'm a little bit meh on it, David. I, I mean, you're, you know, again, Carol for what the last four, three of the last four defensive coordinators he's hired, the last three defensive coordinators he's hired has all come from in-house basically. Um, I have a hard time believing that your best candidates that you, you have a landscape of college football, a landscape of the NFL, a multitude of teams all over the place. And the best, last three best candidates all reside in your building, countrywide. Um, I, I don't think that that's the case. I, I think that there's more of an indication then that they're not making the coaching defensive coordinator decision based upon merit, and not merit, but based upon ability on what they're bringing to the table as far as elevating the defense. But first and foremost, they're bringing Bada board to, to fall in line with what Coach Carroll wants. That seems to be what this indicates to me a little bit. Now, with that said, uh, David, I'll say this. I am hopeful that it will work. I'm hopeful that he as a defensive line coach can be in the ear of, the, of, of Carroll and the front office saying we've got to get more on this defensive line. We've got to make this better. I like the uh, triumphant that is being talked about between um, uh, Clint Hurt, Ed Donatel, and uh, Sean Desai, where they're trying to bring Desai in and you'd have a, a three-man group sort of running, running this whole thing up from the top down with Carroll in there as well. I do think that, that would be an interesting dynamic um, and one that I could approve, get behind. I'd be, and I feel even more, I'd feel a lot more excited about it. I do like that as well, David. They brought in Donatel at least because that does give him a helping hand for a first time coordinator, a guy that really Waldron didn't have last year when he was coming in here, right? Didn't have that guy necessarily he could lean back to like a Donatel. So I like that part of it. You got a two for one here a little bit, David. So I'm not, I'm not super down on it, but I just a little good, little bad to it a little bit to me, you know, not necessarily a home run. Tackman says we passed on Creed Humphrey. You trying to make me sad today, Tackman? You trying to make me cry? You gonna make, y'all gonna make me cry today, Tackman? Y'all gonna make me cry today? Randall Rogers is gonna retire, move to Montana, and write his manifesto. Fully embrace the Unabomber look. <laughs> maybe, maybe so. Tackman, I hope Daxton Hill falls around the fourth round, but I doubt it. Tackman, he's my next man up on my cornerback list that I'm taking a look at. So I got through the, the kid from Washington, uh, Roger McCreary, obviously taking a look at Stingley. Um, but he is going to be my next guy up that I'm probably going to watch actually tonight after the show. I'm going to go check out his tape. So I'm very interested to see what he has. Six foot tall. He's got some of the some of the base measurements Seattle looks for in their cornerback, Tackman. That might be the spot that he lands in, though. Though I will say it's not a super deep draft for corners, so there might be a little bit of a run on guys going higher um, than they should, because there's not the high, there's a there's a, it's it's got a deep class of corners, but the high end guys aren't as high endy as they normally are. You know, it's it says Gucci, but there's only one C on the on the 
on the emblem on the on the bag. You know what I mean? Uh, Jackson Shore, uh, whoever gets Sam Howell is getting a steal. All that Mitch T comparisons are lazy. Dude is that guy. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. I, I'm not necessarily relating to Mitch. Um, Mitch Trubisky only had one year of production. Sam Howell's got a couple of years of production. I don't think he's a bad prospect. Um, but I don't, I don't know if he's a good prospect either on that one. I don't. He's going to go in the second round, and those guys are – you don't know what you're going to get necessarily. You might get a player. might be somebody that's good. Um, I just never caught it. When I watched a lot of his tape, I couldn't quite get behind him. The thing with him too, Jackson, is he had some really good players coming through North Carolina to throw to, right? Some really good NFL-type talent to throw to that's going to make you look good. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. I'll definitely give you credit if he balls out. Randall McDaniel says, you think Daniil Hunter becomes available, big-time talent? Yes, I do think the Vikings are going to look for moving on from Hunter. It's a bit of a risk with him. He's had back injuries, and back injuries always make me a little bit um, hesitant. <laughs> but I do believe that you'd only be on the hook for his base. No, I know. I know you'd only be on the hook for his base salary by trading for him. So it wouldn't be a significant cost. He carries a little bit of he carries a little bit of cost on his base value, but you know you could always rework the deal too and bringing him in. But he'd be a awesome Leo Randall. I mean, he'd be amazing Leo to bring in, and not a super old guy at this point either. So if if he's okay from his back injury, then uh, I'm open to it. But uh, you know, we'll see. Jacob Kessinger, thank you for the five dollar donation. You are awesome, and I appreciate you, a gentleman and a scholar. Jacob he says, "Let's be honest about this team. Let's be honest." This team is going to slap a Band-Aid here and there, blow all the cap on C-level players, and come out and tell us we're Super Bowl bound. Uh, I appreciate the donation, Jacob, and I can't argue with anything that you're saying. Um, I, I am hopeful that this team corrects its mistakes. I, I'm hopeful that the team stops turning sideways as the wave goes across the bow. Um, I'm wishing, I'm wanting, surprise me. Blow me out of the water, Carol. Blow me out of the water, Schneider. Catch me off guard for once, rather than allowing me to predict your every next step. Please do. And if you do so, I will celebrate it. But there's a part of me that wonders if they don't just look back at this past season and say, eh, we got unlucky. Everything we did in our off-season approach, our player acquisition, our drafting, it's been solid, it's been great. You know, and sometimes the sport gets random at the end and we just happen to catch a bad injury. Things didn't go in our favor. Probably won't happen next year. Let's keep doing what we're doing. And I am worried that that is the direction that they've gone with this or that they're going to go with this. It's going to infuriate me. But I'll tell you this, I'm not going to be one of those people saying Super Bowl bound if they do it again. I won't. I won't. They do it again, I'll call it for what it is, which will be a one and done team in its best case scenario in the playoffs. Worst case scenario, you just bar- ba- you just barely miss the playoffs. That's the fluctuation of what you could be if they go in the direction they've gone in the past. Because we already know we're not seeing a change in defense, right? No change offensively. No change is real, uh, schematically speaking. I hope it isn't. I hope they they, I hope they don't do the C-level C players, Jacob. But I think you're right for mentioning it. I don't think it's out of whack for saying this is, this is a good possibility that this could be what they do because this is what they've done recently. I'm not inventing something out of thin air. This is how it's gone. 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. Same old song. Same old song. You know? Um, Randall McDaniel says, I want Cade Otten. I say he's a round three guy. I got to look up on Cade. He's another guy. He's on my list, Randall. So I have not had a chance to check him out, but he is on my list for sure. Uh, Attackman says, I want Jalen Warren as Chris Carson's replacement. I'll take a look at him. Jalen Warren. Haven't, haven't seen him yet. Where are my running backs at? Oh, there we go. Do, do, do. Jalen Warren, huh? All right. I'll take a look at him. Oh, Mr. Jalen Warren. See what he's got to offer. Um, 
the Jackson Shore, if the Niners land Rodgers, the league is rigged. They have no draft capital, plus Rodgers holds a grudge for them taking Alex Smith instead of him. Uh, I, don't know if Alex, I don't know if he holds a grudge. It's his childhood team. Your childhood team is your childhood team. Um, and he, he loved football growing up. So, you know, probably, probably still a Niner fan, probably still would be open to going to his childhood team. Um, is the NFL rigged uh, if they land him? Well, I mean, what's, what's Rodgers' – what does he bring in return at this point? You know, as far as um, as far as his value, yeah, he had a near MVP season this last year. He had MVP season like last year. He's been a phenomenal player the last couple of years, but he's becoming forty years old. It's not the same thing as Russell Wilson, who's thirty three. And though Rodgers has been more prolific passing the ball in the last couple of years, that getting into the forty year old territory, even for quarterbacks outside of Tom Brady, who gets into their mid forties. Who gets into being 42, 43 years old? You're really looking at getting a one-year shot with Aaron at this point, year in and year out. That That's going to, to me, depress the value a little bit in what you get back for him. So if, you know, the 49ers said, hey, we'll give you three second-round picks or two second-round picks, uh, are they going to turn that down? And are the Niners not even, are, are, wouldn't the Niners maybe be more willing to offer it now knowing they get an extra couple third-round picks over the next couple of years? I think so. I think so. Kelvin says Packers would be crazy to trade Rodgers to the 49ers. Some of this could be outside of their their purview of control, Kelvin. Some of this could have gone back to last offseason and what went down in order to open the door back up for Rodgers coming to go be there for the team last the beginning of last offseason, right? Because there was a lot of that. Is he going to show up? Is he not? Is he going to demand a trade? ba ba da ba ba da ba And there was negotiations that went on between the Packers and Rodgers to determine at that time how do we get on solid footing here? And reportedly within those negotiations was the door being opened up to this offseason, it being allowed then for Rodgers to move on, that the Packers selling him last offseason, we're not going to trade you, we're not going to move you, was going to be removed then this, this offseason. The same thing that I've wondered about the Russell Wilson situation, quite frankly. But that was just what was reported. Uh, Food Gamer, even though I'm not happy about elevating Hurt to defensive coordinator, the good thing is that Pete is trying to build him a, trying to build him a staff around Hurt. That's good. Ken was all by himself, so maybe that's why he struggled. I mean, Ken was by himself, but he had Clint Hurt, future defensive coordinator as his defensive line coach, right? <laughs> uh, you got to build a solid staff. And I've said, again, you, the football is becoming intricate more detail driven than ever. And it's already a very detail driven sport. You, you need to have all of your little I's dotted and your T's crossed. You need to be aware of all of this vast multitude of things. And so it becomes very specialized because of that one guy can't just do it all anymore and shoulder that whole burden. So having as many smart guys as you have in the room, having as many guys aware of what's going on and, and with ideas to solve problems is a good thing. In my opinion, the more the merrier. Jackson Shore, if we get Jackson, if we get Jason Kelsey, I'm throwing a party. He's the best center in the league and is a great fit for Waldron's scheme. You should throw a party for that because that you're very, very right on that. Pure fit, probably the best center in the league or near the best center in the league. I mean, <laughs> I might call Creed Humphrey the best center in the league myself, but uh, you know, maybe number two. Randy right, Daniel, uh, sorry, Randall. Um, Megan says Rogers reminds me of my almost three year old having a tantrum. Neither is pretty but my nephew is way cuter. <laughs> uh, Roy Follick says, been a Hawks fan since 81. Lived through some bad quarterback play. Better not trade Wilson. Crazy skills and character up the yin-yang. If we could just utilize him properly, we'd be swimming in Super Bowls. Well said, Roy. Very well said. And part of where I've come from this on this, Roy, is I've said, and I've been a guy, even Roy, that's been hard on Russell at times. I've pressed on Russell. I've said, I'm, this is not, I don't like this part of your game, Russell. You need to improve this. But I still have always come back time and time again on this and said, what Seattle needs to do is to modernize their offense, which you kind of did hopefully here with Walter in the last year, and then build an appropriate offensive line around him, like other teams would do having a Hall of Fame quarterback, building an upper level offensive line around him, something they've failed to do for the course of his career. And I've said, Roy, the thing that you'll be kicking yourself for in Seattle as you move on from him, if you do move on from him at this point, is that he could very well go to another team and swim in those Super Bowls you talk about because that team does that one base thing that you refuse to do for 10 years. It is the question, it is the enigma that does hang a little bit over this organization of if you get him the upper level offensive line, does he take off to a moonshot? 
Does the offense take off to moonshot? Stratosphere. Unstoppable. It's possible. And it's a question that even the naysayers can't answer for sure because we've never seen it tried. So let's try it. We know the returns of going light on the offensive line. We know what happens when you grab a bunch of run blockers first and then tell them to try to hold up against the Aaron Donalds of the world. We know how that ends out. Let's try the other side of the board, right? Let's try it a different way. I hope they do. I hope they do, Roy. Texans are, Texans are trying to hire Lovey Smith. <laughs> Lovey's got an awesome beard now, by the way. I don't know if you guys have seen Lovey Smith's beard, but that thing is, that thing is uh, crisp. Um, I guess it makes some sense. I don't Josh McCowan to Lovey Smith from Brian Flores. I mean, that Texas organization is definitely in a little bit of rough shape at this moment. Megan says, how much did that mock draft cost us B cost you B? Everything. Everything. Only 5% of my soul, Megan. But it's a guaranteed Super Bowl victory. So I still have 95% of the rest of my soul. And so we're good. <laughs> Ethan says, I'll take that draft. Yeah, I was laughing my ass off when I was when I was doing it because there's no way this is realistic, but it's so much fun to pick these players. <laughs> I was I was happy. Tech man says, how much Seattle should spend for Jerry Hughes from Buffalo? Jerry's okay, Tech man, to me. I mean, I, I wouldn't give him a big deal. Five to six million to your two year deal, you know, two year $10 million deal, two year $11 million deal, maybe. But he wouldn't be one of the guys that I'd be wanting to most target at the highest on my board, really. I'd want to go a little bit, little bit more than that. I feel like you've, you've already brought in a lot of Jerry Hughes' types recently. Tackman says, I like James Cook, but I prefer Pierce from Florida. Understandable. Pierce has got a lot of love out there in Seahawk land. You know, he runs really hard. He's a fun, fun back to watch. Um, what's interesting about Pierce, if you want to, I was watching his tape. So something to check for and watch Tackman. You'll love this. Let me make sure I'm right on this. Oh, can't type. Um... Yeah, he's got kind of choppy steps, runs hard, runs angry. He's got sort of a pigeon-toed gait, Damian Pierce, uh, Damian Pierce does. The thing I do wonder with him, he's got little short arms. It's a little thing of what I think will take Jerome Ford off Seahawks board. It's a little undersized, 5'9", 30-inch arms. That might, uh, But he does have the weight. He's got the 220. So, yeah. He's got a little bowling ball, that guy. Just a little bowling ball. I understand. I can see why you go with them. I like Cook for, for some of his, the multi-dimensional stuff that he offered. Plus, I think at that time, Pierce might have been off the, I can't remember if Pierce was off my, on my board or not at that point. BK voiceover, not bad. I'd avoid right tackle and shoot for an edge or defensive end in the second or third round. Logan Hall in the second or Kingsley Engabare in the third. Engabare is in, intriguing. His comp is Daryl Taylor. I'll take a look at Kingsley. Um, he's been one of my guys on my list, but I haven't quite gotten to him yet, BK. I've just been um, a little bit slow on getting to the edge rushers here. So I'm just getting through those guys, just kind of scattered out some of the top guys. I did check out Logan. Um, Logan's an interesting cat to look at. Um, theoretically, he does offer you a little bit of inside out uh, in his play. He can do a little bit of three tech, theoretically speaking. Uh, what I have for him. So I had a three tech and a four, three that can do a little bit of everything. He's bouncy out of his stance. He's got really active hands, variety of moves. Um, I watched him. He did some hand swiping, spin, dip and rip, bull rush. He looks proficient in each, um, a very competent rusher. Um, uh, Logan Hall is, um, his patented move is a swim move left. That's what I had for him. Um, my bottom line is there's some talk you can play on the outside with the size and length. I don't think you'd be quick enough to hold up on the there on the outside. Um, so I do look at I, I do see in my opinion Logan, Logan Hall is an inside three tech guy, at especially if you talk about putting him in the Seattle scheme. He may be best suited as a three four defensive end, for instance. But I don't think he's going to hold up as a four three end except on early downs as a run stuffer. 
I don't think he's going to be quick enough. And there's some guys in this draft that can do inside out and, uh, and then still provide you some pass rush on the outside. I don't think he gives you that though. Um, but uh, some of it to BK is just me being fascinated with the prospect of really addressing the offensive line for the first time and maybe being a little obsessed with that, that fact of things. But uh, I like Logan Hall's game. He's a fun player. Um, I do wonder a little bit with sometimes the tweener aspect of it. Is he, is he enough three tech? He's got like, what is he? Six. He's pretty tall. Got, got some worries with him on that, but he is fun to watch, man. He's got some skills. I'll take a look at Ingeberry there though. Got to get into the edge rushers because we might be looking at it, especially the defensive line coach is a defensive coordinator now. Megan says, warning 12s, this is Brando's dream draft. Dream draft, never going to happen for real. No, there's no way Coach Carroll would draft three offensive linemen <laughs> with his first three picks, especially when he's already missing a first-round pick. It's completely unrealistic. But it's my first mock draft, so a fella can dream on his first mock draft. Just let me dream on my first draft, Megan. I'll get realistic with it in my next couple. Uh... BK says a lot. Oh, I uh, love Petit Fourier. Me too, BK. I really like his, his man, he is so light on his feet. And uh, really jumped out to me, especially, again, as we look into this scheme that we run with the zone-based, you need offensive linemen that can move. Well, Nicholas can do that. Um, and I do feel like he's just starting to kind of figure out his technique there where he's leaning on that athletic ability and size and some of his length. And as he starts to round out a little bit more of his approach, um, he's going to be, I, I think he's going to be really a, an upper level left tackle in the sports slash kind of, a, it's like, a, I see a little bit of the same guy that we're looking at in this draft, like a Teron Armstead. I see some things in, in his game that was in Teron Armstead's game coming out of USC. Um, I just, I like the upside. I like the physical ability and, uh, I think he's going to be good. Attack uh, man says Durant running back from Duke could be a hidden gem. He's on my list to look at as well, Tack man. So I'm just getting, I got through the upper level running backs. I got through uh, Michigan State kid, Michigan, uh, Pierce, Spiller, got down the list. But it, it takes me a little bit of time to get through these guys because I do the highlights and then I go through game film. And then I try to usually do like three or four games minimum of each of these guys. Uh, so it does take me sometimes a good amount of time just to get through one guy and then to get to the next. But I'm grinding on tape now. So I'm going to start really climbing through these dudes. Megan says, not that we ever have a draft like that in real life. No, we never would. No. Tackman says, Frank Clark was stealing money from KC. I don't mind bringing him back for cheap. I don't either, Tackman. If you can get him back for cheap, I'm okay with it. And, and that's a, that it's one tack, that's one of those trades that again, in Seahawk land, it's still, I, I still laugh where you still hear, including players and people saying, oh, they should have paid Frank. They should have paid Frank. Well, uh-huh. Number one, if you didn't trade Frank, you wouldn't have gotten DK Metcalf. So, you know, let's just keep that in mind first and foremost. And then number two, with the more important part, Frank's played like dog do for the Kansas City Chiefs since he's arrived. He's not, he is atrocious, atrocious versus the run. And he's marginal as a pass rusher. He's not efficient. He's not proficient. He doesn't have a high pass rush win rate. Frank Clark is one of those guys, and Jaron is a little bit in the same place, who got elevated by Seahawks fandom a little higher than they really were as a player. And, uh, you know, that trade Seattle won 10 times over. And, but with that said, you bring back Frank now, instead of paying $23.5 million a year, I get Frank for seven, six, seven, <laughs> you know? Um, I can maybe get a little bit more behind that. Uh, Bud Inlet Jr. says, I think Zadarius Smith could be a nice fit. He and Hurt uh, hit it off at the Pro Bowl a couple years ago. I, 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 he's been a very, he's been a good, everything that I was just talking about, Frank Clark not being, is what Zadarius Smith has been for the Green Bay Packers. A little bit of an injury thing going on this last year, but he's been good when he's been on the football field. Um, they do run a little bit more of the 3-4 stuff. He's done a little bit more of the standing up as an edge rusher kind of guy. Can he put his hand in the dirt? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but he's a good. He's a good pass rusher. He knows what he's doing out there. And if yeah, I, I look at him, uh, Jackson Shore says, "Please don't waste the money this off season. I always defend Pete, and I like John, but no excuses this year. It's not that hard, guys. Yeah, no excuses. Just don't leave eleven million dollars on the cap like you did this year, coming into the season in a year where the salary cap was depressed, taken down about ten percent for the first time since the cap was invented." Let's not do that. 
Food Gamer says Frank Clark made the Pro Bowl. If he made it, then Dunlap, Taylor, and Green should have made it. Yeah. Frank should not be making Pro Bowls with the Kansas City Chiefs. He's had some good playoff runs. I'll give him that. When they went and won the Super Bowl, I think he had like four or five sacks in that postseason play. Um, he, you know, he was great, but not he's not worth twenty three and a half million that he's being paid, nor the first and second round pick that the Chiefs had to give up to bring Frank Clark in. People hammer Seattle about the Jamal Adams trade, but. I mean, you could kind of make a bit of an argument here that Seattle's in certain respects has gotten more out of Jamal Adams than the Chiefs have gotten out of Frank Clark, or at least somewhat equivalent nearly. Or they will eventually get more out of Jamal Adams than the Chiefs got out of Clark while not paying Jamal Adams the same money that Frank Clark got paid. Attack man, uh, when are we ever going to have a good center like Max Unger? When the team decides that they want to address it, man, when they want to make it a priority. Make it a priority, you find that center. I mean, you had Creed Humphrey sitting, staring you in the face in the second round last offseason. You know, so you, it's there. It's available. You can get it. Last offseason, you had Andrews of New England available out on the market. Um, Austin Blythe, the guy who played in the Rams system as a center, a mobile lineman, was available if Waldron wanted to grab him. Um, variety of left tackles were out there. Hell, if you want to go swing the moon, throw a bunch of money at Trent Williams, you could go do so. Like, you could go do a variety of things. They just got to decide to do it. Will they decide to do it? I don't know. Tag man clan killer says senior bowl was much more entertaining than the pro bowl. Facts. Facts. Uh, BK voiceover uh, Bernard Raymond is a pretty intriguing future option at left tackle. Super raw, but has a lot of upside. He does have a lot of upside. BK, I was looking for film on him and I wasn't finding much on YouTube of him. So I'm trying to I'm trying to locate other stuff with it, but I've it's been a little bit hard just finding things. But he seems to be a super. There's some real raw guys in this draft with some big upside to them. He's in he's on that list of guys. Daniel Faalele is in that list a bit too. Trevor uh, Penning is in that list too, um, especially those outside linemen um, tackles. So he could be. I I'm just haven't had a chance to find anything because I can't find nothing on him. I got to dig a little deeper. Let me get some more coffee here, folks. One more second. Dumb Aussie Q time. Why do we need so many? Oh, dumb Aussie question time. Why do we need so many defensive coaches if Hurt is going to be our new defensive coach? Uh, so, Megan, in the NFL, you got uh, defensive coaches. You always have. You have a defensive coordinator. You'll have a secondaries coach. You'll have a defensive line coach. You'll have a linebackers coach. You'll have a cornerback coach, or I guess a secondary coach, basically. Um, you got quality quote. You have quality control coaches. You got uh, passing game coordinator coaches. You have offensive line coaches, but then you have a run blocking game coordinators. Um, so there's a lot of different extra coaches that are always brought along to the staff. Um, and so what's happening here, though, is that rather than just bringing on guys that wouldn't be, who would just be kind of names that Hurt would be bringing on that he knows in his time in in both NFL and NCAA level, is that you? He would normally bring in guys that he knows and whatever else. Seattle bringing guys like Donatello or or Sean Desai, where they're sort of assembling more of a of a super unit of defensive coaches at that point, as opposed to just having hurt hire whoever he needs underneath him or whoever he sees fit. Um, so it's a little unusual in that respect of things, but you're always going to have a lot of coaches on that side of the ball helping out. Uh, Tackman says that Honey Badger lost a step, but some teams will over will overpay him. Somebody is going to overpay him, and I agree, Tack, man. I think that he's not as quick as he was, and I don't think he's going to give you as much as what he once did. Though I'll, be, I'll tell you this. I didn't know that – I wasn't all that certain that he was going to be the, as decent as he's been for Kansas, Kansas City when they signed him. So um, you know, that was a great signing on their part, bringing him aboard and what he did for that secondary, kind of, kind of being the glue back there. He was great for Houston for a year too. Um, but I do agree. I'm, I, I would be surprised if he's got a whole – whole lot left there, but somebody is going to pay him, and I wouldn't want to be one of those teams. 
Adiel Williams, we need uh, Jamal to ball out this year to salvage that trade. We need sacks and picks. I'll take them both, man. I'll take them both. Uh, Bud Lit Inlet, uh, wish, wish we could go back to a modernized old school uniform combo like the Bills did. I'd be with that, Bud Lit. I'd be with that. Um, <clears throat> Rodney Press Show, I'm somewhat pleased with what we have in Donatell and Hurt. The defense has the talent, but lack of discipline. When you look back at Super Bowl years, Quinn and Bradley kept the discipline. Yeah, they were they were okay in discipline. I mean, we were a team fairly Rodney that was re- fairly well um, penalized even during our Super Bowl years. Like I think we were probably the most penalized team in the NFL the year we won the Super Bowl. Which, if you're the most penalized team in the NFL, you, and and a lot of those penalties were coming on the defensive side of the ball, um, you're probably not big on necessarily discipline. It always struck me Rodney a little bit of Carroll always runs a little bit of a loosey goosey ship. And there are some benefits to that where you're going to get up shots where team will play loose and free and wild at times and, and, and um, not sort of held under the thumb of a rigid coach that's just not letting them be them. But the downside of that is that then they play a little wild and too free and overstep the bounds of that a bit. Um, I, that's always been sort of somewhat of where I've saw it happening. So I, I doubt that there'll be as much increased discipline anytime soon when you have Carroll as the coach because he's decided he'll take – He'll take the price of doing business in that way. He'll take the downside with the upside on that. Um, I do like the fact you brought Donatella in rather than just Hurt. you know. And a bunch of guys Hurt was going to have coaching underneath him with Miami. So I'm encouraged by that. And I'll be even more encouraged, Rodney, if they can get uh, Sean to sign on top of it. Adia Williams, I need two of those sacks to cause fumbles to, to tax me. But yeah, sorry. Uh... Megan says, then why promote hurt if you have others involved? Sorry, man. Still dosed up on some pretty severe medication after a severe allergic reaction last week, so I don't get it. No worries, Megan. Um, <clears throat> well, they want they wanted to keep hurt. Hurt was going to go to Miami, Megan. So they wanted him to stay with the organization. They didn't want to let him go be a defensive coordinator with Miami. So you want to keep him. Um, and the way to keep him is to promote him, right? He wasn't going to stay at his same job. So it was either lose him or promote him. And they they thought it was a much of a loss to bring him in and keep him to keep him going. So some of that dro- drove that decision as well. But obviously Carroll seems to be pretty high on him. Um, because I don't I don't think I can remember Carroll promoting anybody before to prevent them from moving on to another job which where they were going to go up like this. So he's never done it before. That does seem to indicate that Carroll is pretty pretty high on him as a potential defensive coordinator. Uh, Megan with a $2 donation. Thank you, Megan. I appreciate you. It says 95% soul means my heart stays with coach B laughing out loud. <laughs> we all got our prices to pay. We all got our prices to pay. Jacob Kessinger with another $5 donation. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, he says, uh, oh, uh, or $2 donation. Sorry, Jacob. $2 donation. Appreciate you, man. Thank you, by the way, Megan. You're awesome. Always awesome, Megan. Appreciate you. Uh, Jacob says the same old song, like heating wonderwear at a party. <laughs> yes. Same old song indeed, man. We've heard this tune many times. It's effed out, right? It is effed out. Paul Third says, how in the hell is Mike McDaniels worth two third round picks for the 49ers? He just held a clipboard. Well, it's actually compensatory value, Paul. I, I I will admit to you, I didn't know that this existed in the NFL today, t- t- till today either. But there's a thing in the NFL where if you sign a minority higher than the team that to a to a head coaching position, then the team that had groomed that assistant coach, whether he was holding a clipboard or pouring Gatorade into players' mouths, he then is going to garner that team that groomed him two third-round picks of comp- comp- compensatory value in back-to-back drafts. So a third-round pick this year and a third-round pick next year. So they didn't actually have to trade at the Dolphins. They were Niners just being given it by the league, which sucks. <laughs> Marcus Overly says, Brandon, who should the Hawks target in free agency? Um, Marcus, I would lean. Here's, here's kind of my list, general list of guys that I would look at. 
Um, I certainly would look to try to bring back DJ Reed, um, Rashad Penny, and Sidney Jones back as my own free agents. I don't think that there's going to be. All, I don't think they're going to eat up all of the money bringing those guys back. I think there'll be a little bit of a chunk in those three guys, but you'll still have a little bit. You'll have a lot more to spend even beyond that. Um, I would release Bobby Wagner at this point and clear the sixteen point six million dollars it, it brings back to the cap. I signed DK Metcalf to a contract extension. Um, I sign either Jason Kelsey or Ryan Jensen to a contract. I try to target Teron Armstead of the Saints, very talented left tackle for them. I believe you can make all of these moves I've just said and still be underneath the cap as long as you're willing to squish and squeeze the contracts in, as well as once I've cleared the money. I mean, heck, just signing DK to a contract extension, signing Teron Armstead, and signing Jensen. The first year of that cap hit, which would be about $25, $25 million, well, $16.6 million of that $25 million was just eaten by me relieving, releasing Bobby. You know, of the $45 million we have to spend right now, basically only seven, $8 million of just those deals alone have been taking off that amount. Uh, say nothing of potentially restructuring Russell Wilson. Um, but I would also look at Leonard Fournette in free agency as well, if you could bring back Penny especially. Uh, Jadavian Clowney, I'd try to bring him in on like a two-year $20 million deal, something like that, if that was possible. Uh, I like Zach Pascal as a receiver of an under-the-radar kind of receiver who's really good in blocking and um, I, I think even has a little bit of upside to potentially provide. Um, those would be the guys that would be the main ones I would take a look at. Um, there's some guys, secondary guy Ben Jones of the Titans as a center would maybe be interesting as potential. Fisher of the Colts as a free agent, if you can't get Teron Armstead, would be a good backup plan there. Um, but they have a lot of money to spend, so they can bring up quite a bit of quite a bit back aboard if they wanted to do it. Um, Dennis Kelly is another guy that could be interesting from the Packers as competition for Jay Curhan. Um, these would be the main guys that I would look to target or that sit at the top of, top of my list of things, and they all vary in what they cost. The big money deals, though, would go to the left tackle and center position. Hawks, uh, oh, if the Cowboys let Demarcus Lawrence go, would you want him? Kind of depends on the cost at this point, Hawks. I mean, he's like Frank Clark. You're nowhere near a $23 million a year player, especially at this point. Um, and you're going to be significantly off that mark. Is there going to be a team willing to throw DeMarcus Ware a two-year $30 million deal? Maybe. Um, but if I can get him into a lower end of things, a two-year deal or three-year deal that's in relative shape, then I'm, I'm open to doing it. I don't love his game as much as I think some other people do, though, too. He doesn't do as much for me necessarily. Randall says, I don't have much faith in uh, Carson, even before the injury. Looked slow in 2021, and he was slow to begin. We need something else at running back, I believe. Me too. I'm, I'm good with moving on from Carson, and I saw the same thing. He looked a little slower in hitting the hole this year, just to my eyes. I know he averaged 4.3 yards per carry, but it just it looked a little bit like he was struggling to get to that hole, as opposed to Penny, who was really quick through the hole. Tagman says Russell might as well stay another year in Seattle. He might as well, right? Might as well. It's a proper thing. Yeah, if there's not a good good destination location to go this year, even if it's something that he wants to kind of do, then wait it out another year. You still have a chance to things turn around here too. Um, Tagman says it's up to Sierra, not Russell. <laughs> He'll listen to whatever his wife says. I I think she has a. I think she'll have a little bit of a say. That's for sure. I think she'll definitely have a little bit of a. Input. Randall says, Russ has brought lots of drama the past year or two. It's gotten old. Has gotten old. I'd, I'd like to just, in general, move on with this team and the, the drama aspects of things, you know? Move more into where we're talking about X's and O's, players on the field, how they're doing on the field, the off-the-field stuff, this guy going, that guy going, is he fired, is he fired, is he traded, isn't he traded? That stuff's like, man, when this, we, we're able to finally retire this stuff, it's going to be Nice. James Watson says, not being mean, but Sierra is at the end of her career. She's not selling out MSG. The Sierra location move is media. Very well could be, James. I mean, you know, think of it like this. You know, what about she's in New York? It's easier to get on to a talk show maybe, you know, or transition away from selling and or from singing and doing more of that. Um, you might be right. You might be right on that. I still think it, even at the end of the day, whether she has a career or not, does, would Sierra rather live in New York or Seattle? And if you were to give Sierra a lie detector test, I think she'd probably say New York. Hey. 
Merck, uh, we have to keep Russ. We have no other choice. They're, they're keeping Pete, and I highly doubt they want to rebuild a team around a 70-year-old head coach. Agreed. I'd like to think that that's the way it's going, Merck. I'm hopeful it's going that way. I can't say one way or another because I just don't have any ind indication on this. Um, it makes a lot of sense why Russell should stay, why it's best for him to remain, why the team would want him to remain. Both parties have a, a level of control here where neither party can dictate to the other what, what, the, you know, what the time of day is going to be. So that could very well lead to him just remaining here. And I, hope, I am hopeful of it. But um, we, we know there's, there is a flirtation here also with moving on. Randall says, does Sierra actually make music? Yeah, I think she does. JT, uh, not really drama. He's finally given the media something to talk about. Russ is solid. Russ is solid. I do think there's been, there's been drama, though, that he's also brought up. He's done it with a purpose. He has his reasons probably within it. But it has been drama nonetheless. Tom, so why did Waldron use Lockett in the way the Rams used Cup? Are they different players? Uh, well, they are different players. For sure, Tom. Um, why he used them is because that's that's where you're going to put that what X or Z, whatever the receiver locket is over on that side. So it's just, yeah, they did. It wasn't always great, especially when you asked him to block, but sometimes it was good. But basically, and they are different players. But that was one of the reasons, Tom, a year ago I was a little bit wondering if Seattle was going to resign Tyler because he doesn't exactly fit that six-foot – 190, 195 receiver mold that the Rams tend to like. The Robert Woods, Cooper Cup, Van Jefferson type. Um, Tom says, out of the rumored teams who has both an offensive coach, out of the rumored teams who has both an offensive coach, talent, and that is one piece away from the Super Bowl and draft capital to get Russ. I think I know what you're trying to say there, Tom, but I'm not quite sure. And he may be moving his list a little bit this year, Russell, as far as not needing necessarily an offensive-minded coach. Maybe. We'll see on that. JT, I truly believe Russ needs to make a conscious effort to run for three or four first downs every game. Get back to dual threat Russ. That's what made him. Uh, I agree. He's got to take it with the yards where they're there, JT. He's got to use his legs in that component of his game when it's there to be used. Um, he has to. He just does. He can't just remove that completely and say, I'm just going to throw the football around. That's what I am now. Um, some of it's he's lost a little bit of it, but I, I think to your point on this, some of it is that he um, he just doesn't do it as much. Um, there was a game I remember in the Cowboys game two years ago or one year ago. We are playing at home. And Russ is rolling out, and somebody screenshotted this in this game, where he's rolling out, and he's got Lockett going up the field 50 yards, and Russ throws it to him, and, and Lockett's kind of covered when Russ throws it, and it's a third down. And in front of Russ, he's got 15 yards of open green grass and an easy first down that he can go get. But he throws this hard, on-the-run pass, deep down the field, does complete it, but it was a little bit, to your, again, to your point on this, of, man, just take, take these yards when they're there sometimes, you know? Take what, take what they're going to give you because teams aren't spying him anymore. He doesn't get spies like he used to. But in Junior, I know we need a wide receiver. I know we don't need a wide receiver, but you got to check out Danny Gray out of SMU. Dude's got some juice. I'll put him on my list, man. I will put him on my list. And I am going to get to the receivers uh, eventually on it, so I will take a look at some guys. It's, um, it's just that I want to make sure I'm sticking on things that are potential guys the Seahawks could pick. Um, because there is only so much time and so many prospects to go through, look through, and whatnot. But I'll I'll still take a gander at what we got at wide receiver. I like to get a good feel for the whole whole group out there, you know. Uh, Randall says the wide receiver coming out of Arkansas is a beast. Ohio State too. Ohio State's got a couple guys, and Lave and Scott coming out. Wide receivers will probably be one of my last positions I look at, but I will look at them. Uh, as Randall says, it seems like wide receiver prospects getting better and better, more of them and more pro ready. It does. Yeah. Every draft seems to be, that's, you can oftentimes say this is the deepest group in this draft and that's been multiple years in a row at times. JT says, who would you compare Largen to, if anyone? Uh, 
Um, it gets hard to compare him to anyone. Uh, obviously, people will lazily try to grab a guy like Wes Welker, but that's not large, and he played on the outside. He, every once in a while, they put him in the slot, but he was mainly on the outside. That outside is where he did his damage. Um, it, it's it's hard. It's hard to find a comparison. And I, I would say almost, JT, that you know when you have the greats, the truly trend-setting greats that are these difference makers like I talk about, you know where I put Largen in that realm of Barry Sanders, Jim Brown, Gail Sayers, um, that there's something, there's that, that you, you can apply that quotient to them where you say any era they could play, any era they could play. And Largen's kind of that guy, even though I know he's a little smaller and all that, there's still that part of his game that I would wonder if he, he could almost kind of play in any era. Um, there's not really a great comparison for Steve. There just isn't. But again, the same thing like Jerry Rice, like who's the, who's the guy that's like Jerry Rice since Jerry Rice came along? I don't think you can really find a guy that, compares in that same way to Jerry. I mean, you can some, find some stuff that's maybe near, but not the same. It's not going to capture it in the same way. Obviously, Cooper Cup, you know, we get the white comparisons on this and stuff. We go, that, that'd be a place you could somewhat go. But even Cooper does so much of his damage on the inside at times out of the slot. And again, that wasn't Largent's game. So it's, you know, who do you, who do you look at and say, okay, this guy, I mean, uh, maybe a Steve Smith, you know, um, I'll try to think if there's another good one that jumps out to me on it, um, JT. But I'll say it, it's hard. And just like that with like Barry, take a Barry Sanders. There's a lot of backs that can kind of sometimes do little moves like Barry, but Barry, Barry moved in a way nobody else moved like. He was unique unto himself. And uh, I, I think that they're, they're one-offs for a reason, you know? The old God made the mold, made them, and then broke the mold after he made it. There'll, there'll only be one of these, you know? Berkshire says Washington Admirals would have been good. Wouldn't have been bad. Be better, than, better than the ones that they chose so far, yes. Um, Tackman says, I think Bellinger is the best blocker as a tight end. Okay. Some very interesting tight ends in this draft. I like what I see so far, and it's been I'm, I'm encouraged by this Tackman because it's been a pretty weak tight end class in recent years. We've had a couple of years here where you're like, Cole Komet. <sighs> Pat Fearmouth, mm, yeah. This year's actually got some guys that they, they have some unique skills. There's some of them are kind of specialized to what they do, but they're they're at least they're at least a little more exciting than they've been recently. Corey Coleman says Perry and Winfrey. Winfrey, he's pretty good, man. A lot of upside there. A little bit of a risk because you don't have the college tape with him to fall back on necessarily as much. You're, you're going well. Once we move him to the natural three tech, he'll be fine, you know. But there is a little bit of that involved. JT says, how about Largent versus Marvin Harrison? That's probably a pretty good comparison, JT. You, you beat mine. You beat what I brought. That's probably a pretty, pretty good comparison. Very very pure route runners. Great hands. Uh, you know, not given as much credit for as fast as they were. Great body control. I could, I could, I could be talking to that one, JT. As the closest closest comp, Randall says, "Will we see players avoid the combine in favor of their college pro days as well as their training camp training facility quasi combines?" <laughs> um, Randall, it sort of depends upon the level of prospect and what the consensus is on them. You know, if you're a prospect that is going to go in a certain spot in the draft that's top five, and really there's not much that's going to sway that by you going getting measured and weighed and jumping up in the air. You might see a few more guys being less willing to, to take the travel and the trip, but I don't think that there's going to be a sea change in college where people stop going to the combine because people look at it as a way to, to earn some money is to elevate their draft stock. And if it can help a prospect by going there, there's going to be enough guys that haven't cemented what they've done on tape that can, I mean, we've seen it. A variety of guys go out there and blow up, blow up the combine and then get picked higher in the draft than they were going to go because nobody thought they had that strength or speed or quickness. Um, so it's, I, I think it's still going to be a pretty, pretty common thing. I still, I will say though, Randall, you'll see more of guys being very selective in the drills they run at the combine, right? So you'll get a lot of guys that'll probably you know, back out of forties, back out of lifting, da, 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 you know, they'll be there for the measurements and a couple of maybe base drills, 
but then they're going to save all the rest of their stuff for the pro day. That would make sense. Tom Cox, the press uh, pass rush group at the Senior Bowl looked good. Uh, Maya Sanders, Perry and Winfield, two good ones. Maya Sanders, another good one, yep. Uh, there, was a, there was some really good guys. They won the day, it seemed like, through the week watching the practices. It seemed like they were having the better end of it against the linemen, be it the interior guys or the outside guys. I'll say nothing for the game where the quarterbacks just had no time to throw. <laughs> there was just so much bad. There was so much pressure. I knew you meant Tom. Uh, Tom Cox says, plus I like Lucas, Penny at tackle position. I like Lucas too. I just did a uh, my scouting breakdown video over on my Seahawks scouting channel. I just did Abraham Lucas. So if you guys want to go check that out after the stream, I got that up. Randall says, the Pro Bowl viewership, I believe, is higher than an NBA playoff game. <laughs> I believe it. I would believe it, Randall. This sports out of this sports a monster. Adil Williams, Pro Bowl gets better ratings than Game Seven of the NBA Finals or Game Seven of the World Series. That's insane. God, that's crazy. But I mean, it makes sense. We love our football in this. I mean, not just here. We let, it's worldwide, man. People love football everywhere. JT says, "I like. I tried watching the Pro Bowl, but it was like watching the WNBA. Yeah, yeah. It's they're like they're not even two hand touching. They're just like hugging each other out there in tackles." Tackman says, let's hope Mike McDaniel won't become the next Matt Patricia. We can hope. We can hope. Uh, Ethan Tech World, your Abraham Lucas scouting video was great. I left a comment on your video with my thoughts. The thing I like most is how he establishes and reestablishes his leverage. Thank you, Ethan. Glad. Thanks for checking out my video on that. Um, I, li I love Abraham Lucas a lot. It took me a little bit of the extra time to do the video breakdown on him because, frankly, I had to watch through more tape on him because there were some things that would concern me and then I would get oh it's okay he's overcome it this is fine this has been taken care of you know um it would I would go a little bit back and forth I ended up landing on the fact that there's enough great skills he brings to play that he's going to be a, an upper level right tackle in this sport I don't know if I see stardom in his future but an upper level right tackle in this sport and he can do good things both in the run block game and the pass block game he's not just a one-trick pony in that respect his super skill to me, Ethan, uh, he is one of the quickest linemen, especially tackles, that I've seen out of their stance um, in recent years. It's his super skill. I mean, he's absolutely like that rubber band snap that I described in the video as Abraham Lucas. He just gets out of the stance quicker than anybody else on the offensive line or the, de the defensive line, which always in every single play gives him a little bit of a head start, a little bit of a cheat uh, against the opposition, which just helps him out tremendously. Tom Cox, it's hard to see Russ going to the Steelers, but I wouldn't count it out either. It's possible, Tom, but I can't see it going that way either. I, I just there's a, there's enough reasons it doesn't make sense. Not an offensive minded coach. Um, does he want to fall in the footsteps of Roethlisberger? There is it a big enough market? The thing we have to consider with Russ is that he wants to go to a bigger market. You know, he wants to go to a place where his star can shine brighter. And while Pittsburgh is a blue blood organization and revered NFL in a lot of respects. Um, is that the, you know, is that the place to go get that done for his standpoint? I don't know. Tom Cox says, getting tired guy. I will watch later. Sounds good. Tom, you have a great night, brother. Tack man, clan killer. I'm not a fan of Stingley. No, I like Stingley, Stingley's tape. I, I'm, I'm definitely high on him. I don't know if I'd look top five on it, but, um, I, I've liked him since some of the other cornerbacks that's come out in recent years. I'll say that. You look at Stingley's tape versus, you know, the kid from my, either of the two guys that came out of Ohio State a couple years ago um, and the like, you know, some of the recent high-end you know, corners that have been taken. I think he's better than those guys. Aaron Zhang says, has Shane Waldron gained weight ever since he's gotten to Seattle? He is, man. We got uh, It's the food here, man. Too much seafood, man. Too much crab legs with that that pure butter. <laughs> but in Let Jr., you see what Kenny Lawler's doing in the CFL? We should give him a look again. I haven't. I'll, I'll take a look at Kenny Lawler and see what he's doing over in the CFL. He's a fun guy as far as a uh, receiver goes, a guy that had such a, a large catch radius and great hands and an ability to really catch that ball out far away from his body. Just a lot of it makes him spectacular catches in college when Jared Goff was his quarterback. But... Uh, 
He's never quite stuck here, did he, bud? Uh, Eden Deck World, I mean, Sam Howell got uh, to the upper 90s in Madden franchise, so he must be a diamond, right? <laughs> I guess so. Maybe Madden, that uh, that old... Uh, uh, that old decider on uh, player. Um, James Watson says, check out tight end Jelani Woods, six foot seven, two hundred and forty five pound tight end from Virginia, projected as a fifth round pick. I will add him to my list. Let me get him on here. Jelani, Jelani. He's got a cool tight end name. I'll tell you that. Virginia. I'll check him out, James. Or, uh, yeah, I'll check him out, James. I'll have a breakdown for you on the next uh, deal. Tech man says, Damian Pierce, lo- Damian Pierce running back looks very versatile at the senior bowl. He has good footwork, solid vision, and burst. I liked what I saw him of, too. Runs really hard, too. Or it runs, I mean, that's going to appeal to Seattle, right? They love their guys that run angry. You know, the Marshawn Lynch mold that I've talked about, he's not the Marshawn Lynch mold and being nearly six feet tall. He's a little bit smaller, but into that Thomas Rawls type mold, you know, um, relatively quick, good, good couple of first steps of burst. Not a fast guy, right? Not a real, not a real like uh, long speed kind of guy out there. Let me actually, I did a, did a breakdown here. Let me just bring it up here. So runs, I got runs hard, runs angry. He has sort of a pigeon-toed gait, like his knees almost rubbed, rubbed together as he runs. He pairs this with choppy steps, making him uh, look a little unusual. But the leg drive and power are there. When he finally chooses to accelerate, he has a good first three steps to cook through the hole. In the open field, he is creative and has a nasty dead leg that he plants and cuts in one motion, easily losing defenders like a crossover. He's, always, he's also very good as a pass catcher out of the backfield. Easy hands, catching the ball out away from his body, and a good field for running. A good feel for running uh, routes. He can even take the top off the defense with a well-run seam route. I do have big questions about his speed. He's maybe not slow, but not fast. His quicks make up for some of this. Uh, sometimes doesn't run as tough every play. When he doesn't, uh, when he does, he's a bowling ball going downhill. When not, he goes down easy, dies easy. He's very adept at pressing outside zone runs and then cutting back up inside once daylight is created by the defensive lineman getting lateral. And right now I've got Damian Pierce as a third round value. So that's what I'm uh, that's where I'm putting him right now. Sean T says, yes, progress. What's up, Sean? Uh, I never miss. I have a bad feeling this year will be a re-sign everyone and little to no upgrades. I'm worried about the same. I never miss. I'm, I'm worried that the same problems and issues that have plagued you prior, you're going to do again this, this off season in your approach to personnel, to drafting, to free agency, the whole kit and caboodle. And I hope not. I hope not. Uh, same old song like wonder wall was what made Jacob meant. Okay. He's my wonder. Wall. That was a bad rendition. Well, we were getting high. Someday you will find me. Company the last time. Um, well, that's Champagne Silver Nova. That's not Wonderwall. <laughs> Other songs sounded to like to me. Um, Tag Man says, whoever drafts Jalen Tolbert will be a happy team. He reminds me of Stefan Diggs. Ooh, okay. Take a look at him. Uh, Corey Coleman says, uh, defensive tackle Perry and Winfrey would be a good, uh, would be a great value for a first pick. He seems to have good power and attitude and, uh, uh, pass LJ in his final. He, he is good. Um, and for me, it might be a tiny bit high. Where do I got? Let me see where I got Winfrey right now. I think I've got him as my, I think I've got him as my, uh, Okay. So I do have him as my third defensive tackle on the board. That would be about where he should probably go then, right? I think Jordan Davis will be a first-round pick. I think Devontae Wyatt will be in the first round and the, the back end of the first round. Um, and then I think Winfrey's probably going to be the next guy off the board at that point, him or Logan Hall. Um, but you could probably even trade back, I would say, 10 picks if you want to pick up an extra third or fourth-round pick at that point and still get Winfrey. Um, but what I like with him, Corey, is, again, guy played one tech throughout college. Right, so he's playing that hard hat. I'll take on two blockers. I'll do the dirty work role. Meanwhile, I have a 
somewhat freakish skill set that's better applied to the three tech defensive tackle position. And there's a lot of NFL teams that'll look at that and say, we'll, we'll move him to the right spot and he's going to take off. I mean, he's going to be, he'll be really tough to deal with over there. Um, I could see that being the way. There is a little bit of that bust factor though, then to that, right? Because you're now drafting something that you haven't exactly seen on college tape. But with that said, you're, you're probably right. He's going to go right around that area of things. JT says, my goodness, we won 12 games last season. No run game. Injuries killed us this year. That's it. This season was a little bump in the road. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't see it the same way, JT. Uh, part of how I dice this up a bit is I say you got to look at Carroll's regime through the spectrum of two half decades, a first five-year period and the last six-year period. And when you look at the last six-year period, you start to see some of the same mistakes and same issues and same, same problems that present themselves. Um, and in fact, I'm happy to, I've been meaning to kind of do this because I, I want to run over these again real quick at some point. I'll do it in the stream. I want to get up on the chat here a bit, but um, I'm going to, I'm going to go through a little bit um, and, and just touch on this because I wrote this article for my Hawks Nest members a couple of weeks ago. I'll read it at some point, a little bit of it here um, on this stream, but the, the bump in the road thing, you know, there's been issues and problems that have 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 plagued you, have continued on, right? Um, they will continue on. And um, you got bit by it bad this offseason, and you happen to avoid it here and there the year before. But that doesn't mean that those things aren't going to continue to hurt you as we go forward. And, um, and I'm bringing up the list here for you. So, you know, just... Uh, there's, there's about 11 different items I can instantaneously go to and go, these items right here are things that have plagued you for multiple years, JT. And again, going and saying we won 12 games a couple years ago, yeah, we did. But again, those problems kept coming up. You at one point in that same year that you won 12 games, JT, your defense was on pace to give up the most yards in the air in NFL history by a wide mark. And you were way past halfway into the year when that was occurring. You weren't stopping the run particularly well. And once Russell stopped cooking, you didn't have much to offer offensively. But then you went into the back half of your schedule against a bunch of easy opponents, a bunch of backup quarterbacks, a bunch of teams that weren't in a position to really compete, right? And you were able to feast on those teams a little bit. But that didn't mean that there weren't still problems there from that, um, you know, from that team. Um, and again, I'll go through that list a little bit later, but I just want to try to catch up a little bit on the chat here, JT. But it's solving those issues that have plagued you prior. And if you look at it, if we just look at it as it's a bump in the road, if we just if the organization just looks at this as a matter of we got unlucky last year because of injury, well, then you're not going to solve those things that have been mistakes in the past. And then there's just as good enough a chance that they're going to bite you once again this upcoming season. Uh, TJ, what's up, man? Sean T on the defensive coordinator. Overall, I like the hire, Sean. I like the fact they're bringing in more multitude of guys like Donatel and maybe even Sean Desai on top of it to round out the room. I don't think it's a, a home run hire, and I'm I'm not super excited by Carroll constantly only going in-house to find the best possible defensive coordinator candidate. I tend to believe that we're, we're not just churning out like uh, a conveyor belt of amazing defensive coordinators here. So maybe we got to look somewhere outside of in-house. But it's okay. It's fine. It's not a it's not a horrible. It's not the worst of the worst. Tackman says A Rod will play for two more years if he plays for Denver. He may. He may. James Watson says Jelani Woods also a blocking tight end. Great guy to draft. I'll take a look at him as well. Uh, Jalen Pitchard, safety from Baylor, reminds me of Micah Hyde. Ooh, that's a great comparison. I like it, Tackman. Micah is a good player. And again, these guys all get get on all all these guys will be on my list. Safety position we got to take a look at, especially from a free safety slash. Well, maybe we're going to be doing more of like safety's got to do kind of both things. We'll need a little bit of a free safety who can do some tackling and need Jamal to do some free safety stuff at times. Uh, Megan says, just a thought: Would Rogers stay in Green Bay given how the playoffs ended up for them this season? Um, I tend not to think so, Megan. Rodgers, like Russell, has not been a guy that's been all that interested in taking any kind of discount in his career. The Packers are due to be over the cap. They're going to have to probably move on from their best pass rusher. They're going to lose their tight end. they got a couple of receivers that are going out the door, including maybe the best wide receiver in the sport that they can't afford to re-sign in Devontae Adams. Um, 
it's uh, it's going to be a little rough for them going forward on this, Megan, to try to figure this out. And I just don't think that there's a – he looks at this team and says, we're going to be able to get back there with this roster when we've lost all this get these guys this offseason as they will. Um, I think it will prevent it prevent it from going down. Um, but, but it's still a possibility. You know, there's got to be a team that does want him as well. And in addition to this, that's going to jump forward, which I think there will be. And JT, I think sometimes with the when we get caught up on the wins, wins like this, JT, I mean, this is the little bit of the thing with the last five, six years, right? So JT, we go the last five or six years. This is the first year. This is the first year in, in five years we had a losing season. The first year in 10 years we had a losing season. The first year we've missed the playoffs since, what, 2017 or whatever, right? And we start, we start saying things like that. Well, we've, we've won more games than we've lost. But, I mean, what, what are we trying to do? Are we trying to just barely win more games than we lose year in and year out? Are we trying to be a one-and-done team? Because, JT, that's what we've also been at the highest of heights over the last five years. The greatest that we've accomplished, right? That we stuck our flag and planted in the ground, right? That peak was a one-and-done season, best-case scenario, over the last five and six years. You have one playoff win since 2017. One playoff win since 2017. That's not a, that's not a good team over the last five years, right? And I think what happens a little bit, JT, is we get caught up on the Super Bowls in the first five years of the Carroll era, and, and we start to just, everything starts to meld together over these last six years and the first five years all go together. But you got to pull them apart, Look at the first half and go, that was an amazing first five-year run. And then see that the last six years, something has gone diametrically in a different direction than what was happening in those first five-year period. And that's what we're trying, I think, driving for to fix. Um, Megan says, after seeing some of Russ in the Pro Bowl Skills Challenge, is his finger back to or as close to it was pre-injury? If so, why didn't we see this during the season? I'm not sure, Megan. I don't, I mean, I don't know if we get an honest answer from Russ if we asked him, you know. Um, he's always done good in the skill challenges, um, but it does seem like your, if your finger's bad and it's dodgy and you can't really operate it right, you wouldn't be able to do that, do as well in, in that challenge, you would think. Uh, Brian Katie says, I've been saying this for the last few seasons now. The Seahawks need to upgrade their offensive line, bottom line. If Wilson is going to remain in Seattle, then by God, they need to protect him. Brian, very well said. And I, I'm, I've been with you for the last couple of years of saying the same thing. You know, I, you're paying your quarterback $30, $40 million a year. He's your most vital asset. He's gotten beat up over the course of his year. He's been hit all over the place. Some of that is on him from holding the ball too long, but a lot of that's on you not having an offensive line that was pass protectors first and foremost. Every time you looked at an offensive lineman over the last 10 years, You've leaned towards the guy that's the run blocker first. And, you know, if he can do something pass protection-wise, you know, fine. And that's how you end up getting your quarterback hit this much. I would love to see them go at it in a different direction, Brian, and really attack this, attack the offensive line in a way you haven't in 10 years. And I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if they got offensive results, the likes of which we may have never have seen in Seattle for a full given season. It may not be to the full let Russ cook first eight games of the year in 2020, you know, but maybe also somewhat close to, you know, in that realm of things. Tony Lindley says, trade Russ for picks and let Eason take over. <laughs> and Brian Katie, thank you for subscribing. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, Emmanuel Aguilar, how's it going? I never miss a uh, seen Kamura to Seattle rumors because of his connection with Russ at the Pro Bowl. Would you bring him in on his cap? Um, I let me see where his base salary's at. That's what I'm checking on here. I think his base salary is pretty high. Um, no, it's not bad at all. Okay. All right. So it does look like you'd be on like $11 million. You'd be doing what you do. You'd be do a roster bonus, uh, in a $5.5 .5 million base. So he's got a $6 million roster bonus, 5 million by that. That's $11 million. It's kind of a high cost to spend. Um, if I go that route, then I am letting Chris Carson go. 
I got to save my 3.445 million off that deal. And I don't know if that would then allow you to really go after Rashad Penny in addition to that. But, you know, um, he's a very talented guy. The one thing that I would wonder with this a little bit, though, too, I never miss is Russell Wilson has struggled to utilize his running backs. Kamara's greatest skill is being a check down running back who can go take it for 15, 20 yards. Um, you're sort of doing a little bit of a thing that's been a problem in our past of bringing in players that don't really fit to what we want to do or how we do it. So you end up bringing in Kamara, and it's a little bit like a Jimmy Graham situation where it's like, okay, we're going to have him pass protecting as a uh, as a chip blocker. <laughs> you know, uh, we're going to be having him try to run between the tackles and the a gap all day long, and and uh, like Carson runs. You know, like that's where you could end up landing by bringing Kamara in, is you don't put him in the same position to succeed like the Saints did, or to get the most out of him like the Saints did. He's a great player. He's dynamic. Um, I still think he has something in the tank. He's not been used as much to the degree that some of these other running backs have been used early on in their career. But uh, that'd be my one little worry on that. JT says, lots of shifting in motion. Don't let the defense react. Make them think a little. Very much, very true, JT. Uh, Tackman, uh, Tyson Anderson could be, a, could be a special team stud and perhaps being a starter in the future. He was fun to watch Toledo. Tyson Anderson, all right. Look at him. JT, even the fans can look at our formation and guess our plays 80% of the time. There's no creativity. There's not, JT, but again, this isn't going to the offensive coordinator, I think, is a little bit of a, again, scapegoat, right? This is what we've talked about, JT, with the, the Norton thing, where we get, we you, you take the cheese. Don't take the cheese, dude, okay? Carol tries to go the cheese last year. Oh, Schottenheimer's the problem. Schottenheimer's the problem. Here, eat some of this cheese. And you take the cheese. And then the offense looks exactly the same way through pretty much most of the year that it's looked over the last 10 years, right? Because at the end of the day, this is a Coach Carroll team, not a Shane Waldron offense. This is a Coach Carroll defense, not a Clint Hurt defense. This is a Coach Carroll offense and not a Schottenheimer offense. There's a reason why, JT, you can go from Bevel to Schottenheimer to Waldron and see plays that are called across the line that look very similarly. We know for a fact, JT, that 70% of the playbook that Schottenheimer inherited when he came in the door in 2018 was inherited as already a playbook Seattle had in place from Bevel. So if it's the offensive coordinators driving this, why is it you would ask them to take on 70% of an offense that they don't run if you weren't trying to force them to run the offense that you want them to run? So this is where we've got to get into really the, what is the truth here? Where does the, where does the proper blame lie? And if you take the scapegoat, if you take the patsy, again, my bottom line point on this is that then you're, you're missing the fix. You're missing the potential fix because we're not acknowledging there's an actual problem. And you can't get to a fix if you don't, if you don't acknowledge something's a little bit broken. Randall says, let's say we had our first round pick that went to the Jets. Who would you target? I believe it's around uh, the 10th pick. Ah, uh, good question, Randall. That's a really good question, actually. I would say that we would probably target... I think we would probably target one of two guys. Uh, I think Evan Neal of Alabama is going to be off the board probably by that point. Um, well, let's just say it's one of three guys who could be available because I don't think three left tackles are going to be taken in the first 10 picks. So it would be one of Evan Neal, Charles Cross of Mississippi State, or Ikem Okuwunu, um as the third guy whose tape is awesome to watch. I think one of those three guys they would take as their left tackle of the future, like they did with Russell Okun, Grandel. Back in, uh, what was it, 11, 12. So one of those three guys would be who I think they would gravitate towards. Randall says, you believe the rumbling that Thibodeau slips from top five? How does he stack up uh, to a clowny and measurable? Different players. Different players completely, uh, Randall. Uh, clowny was a bigger guy. Um, clowny had more power to his game coming out of college. Thibodeau is really more finesse. Um... 
you know, Thibodeau's more Randall to a little bit more of your, your Von Miller size kind of cat in play in what he does. Um, super sudden off the snap, twitchy as hell, uber twitchy. Um, great bend, rounds the arc really well. Um, he's got he's got some ability to really get Lyman to set and give him a little bit of a double move off that set, which um, a second he gets a lineman to put his feet down and then he gets them, then he restarts, he's quicker, faster. And then that's how he can sometimes round an edge and sort of force pressure through that edge of things. Yeah, I think he could fall because the power element's not necessarily as much to his game. And then Randall, he was dealing with a, an ankle injury through the majority of the season. So Thibodeau's tape this particular year isn't as maybe spectacular as it had been prior, um, making people think maybe a little bit more that, that it's a one year off. The other part of this too, Randall, is the quality of other pass rushers in this draft. As we see in the Senior Bowl, there's going to be guys that vault up the boards that people are really going to like, um, who've looked really good. Say nothing of, look, you got Aiden Hutchinson, um, David Ojobobi, Ogajobi um, of the Michigan Wolverines. I mean, he looks like Chandler Jones to me. Um, I think uh, I think he's going to go potentially even up ahead of Thibodeau. Both of the Michigan Cats could because they're just a little more well-rounded in their rush. And that's saying something, by the way, with David Ogajobi because he's just started playing football in 2017. But he just has a little more of a natural feel on some of the stuff he's doing, especially with Thibodeau on the, on the hand fighting. He doesn't have a lot as far as a technician's hands go um, to get guys' hands off him if his initial move kind of doesn't work. So I, I, I could see why he would fall maybe to top 10. But I don't, think he'd, I don't think he'd fall outside of the top 10, maybe just barely. Brian Kosky, just a reminder, the Zags whooped ass again last night. It's too bad the NCAA canceled March Madness in 2020. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Hopefully they can get it this year. Seahawks Gaming says Alvin Kamara got arrested. <laughs> he go. Hold on. Jesus. Elvin Kamara arrested. Battery charge. Substantial bodily harm. New Orleans running back Calvin Kamara was arrested and booked for battery, resulting in a substantial bodily harm on Sunday, according to Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Las Vegas PD officers were dispatched to a local hospital on Saturday at approximately 5.50 p.m. local time, where a victim reported being battered at a nightclub located on 3,500 block of South Las Vegas Boulevard, according to the release. An investigation by Las Vegas MPD detectives determined the victim was battered by the suspect, later identified as Alvin Kamara. Kamara was taken into custody without incident and taken to Clark County, Nevada Detention Center, where he was booked for battery resulting in substantial bodily harm, which is a felony. Whoo-wee. Well, that does mean that he is probably getting moved one way or another from the Saints, right? They're not going to pay, pay the cost on that. Maybe looking at a bit of a suspension, too. So that is going to also affect whatever value you, you could get back in from Kamara if you're the Saints. Not good for them. But maybe he has moved. Um, Randall, too, I would say Clowney had, with Clowney, too, he had a lot of the same, I think, not quite the quickness that Thibodeau had, but he did have some of the bend when he was in college. It's when he had that knee injury when he first got to Houston, he stepped on a sprinkler. Seems like he lost a little bit when I think they took out his meniscus or something, and he just never was able to quite bend as much. Uh, Tommy uh, the Hawk says, which, quarter, which quarterback you'd like to see in the Seahawks in case Russ gets traded? Okay, so I'm going to answer that question, Tommy, uh, from the standpoint of we're not getting our quarterback of the future because it's just not, you know, you move on from Russ. The conditions just aren't going to be right for this offseason to get the guy that's going to be the next guy to really take over long term. So you're looking at your stopgap guy for this offseason. And I have two different names that I would look at right off the top of the gate as my stopgaps. Uh, first would be Marcus Mariota. Uh, and the second guy would be a Gardner Minshew. I would, I would potentially look at those two guys as my stopgap. The one thing I'll also say, Tommy, though, is I'm not as much married to a stopgap if you move on from Russ because – 
to me, you move on from Russ, you're not going to be able to be all that competitive next season. You might make your way to being a mediocre 8-8, eight 8-9, eight, eight and 9-8 nine, nine and eight type team, but you certainly aren't going to press as one of those elite teams in the NFL, almost no matter who you really bring in outside of a Deshaun Watson and Aaron Rodgers, which I don't see as happening in either of those two cases. So um, being realistic, uh, I think Mariota makes some sense, and uh, certainly um, Gardner Minshew, local, somewhat local guy here, could make a lot of sense as well. Um, those would be the two guys. Uh, JD, if Adams can't play 13 to 17 games next year, sorry, we got to part ways. Well, you can't you can move him this offseason, JT, but another year from now, it's going to be a little bit easier to sustain a little bit of the dead money cost, I think. And he would probably be moved at that point. Aaron Zhang, uh, who do you think was the who do you think was the best player in the NFL this season? My money's on Trent Williams. It's a tough year, JT. I mean, it's a tough year on making this assessment because there's so many guys that balled out. Jonathan Taylor, Debo Samuel, Cooper Cup. I mean, Cooper Cup won the, the Cooper Cup won the uh, triple crown for the wide receivers. It's been done like three times in NFL history. Um all that being said, quite honestly, Aaron, um, I, I have to go with your guy. Sorry to steal your steal your thunder on this one, but when you make a good choice, you make a good choice. Uh, Trent Williams just had maybe the greatest all-time season for a left tackle in this sport. Um, his domination, his when they moved him in, in motion, was scary as hell. Um, but the amount of clips that I watched of that guy just absolutely not just winning his rep, but just dominating guys, punishing guys all across the board, defensive linemen, defensive backs, linebackers. It didn't matter. He didn't care. Everybody's getting some, uh, Trent Williams had his best year of his career this year. Um, and was, uh, just, uh, uh, Walter Jones prime dominant. Um, maybe even beyond that, maybe even beyond that this year, but I, I got to go with yours over that Aaron. I think I'll take Cup as my number two behind that because of the, the triple crown that he won and and how, you know how much he how much of the sh- the burden he has to shoulder there with the Rams and that passing attack. But um, Williams is a good one. JT, take a look at Trent Williams' games this year, man. Uh, it's I know left tackle isn't the funnest position to always watch, but when you're dominating the other competition across from you so thoroughly, you're dominating the other competition across from you so thoroughly. And, and he was doing just that. Uh, Yoel or Joel, I, I know it can be pronounced either way, a Yallop. Thank you for subscribing. I appreciate you, Mr. Yallop. You're awesome. Uh, Dan Kamara just got arrested. Man, breaking news. Breaking news. Alvin Kamara's arrested. JT's got uh, TJ Watt. Well, he's got your initials, JT, so I know why you picked him. Um... Alexander Matthews, I haven't watched a Pro Bowl since probably Michael Vicks made his first Pro Bowl, and now come it's not played in Hawaii anymore. They need to add something, stake, kind of like Major League Baseball. They do. I agree, Alexander. Major League Baseball doing the home field advantage thing with the thing. I like that they did that. It forced it to kind of matter a little bit more. I I enjoy that aspect if you're going to make it count. If the players are just going to go through the motions, then it's pointless. I I agree with you, too, that it did lose a little bit when they stopped going to Hawaii. There was something about them going out to the Hawaiian Islands to play that was kind of made it unique and cool. Sean T was super impressed by Cup on top of having Lockett, DK, and the others. We need people like Cup and a way more improved running game. Wilson needs more time to make plays. Uh, We definitely could use a Cup-type receiver for sure, and you don't really have that kind of guy necessarily right now. Um, Again, a little maddened by the fact that we've gone with the the Eskridge and the – Lockets, even though those guys might be good players for you, they're not exactly fits for what wide receivers you need in this offense, which are more of the bigger six foot, 100, 195 pound receivers, as much for what they can do in the run blocking game. Because you ask these receivers to come on and down block sometimes defensive ends. And as we saw Tyler Lockett try to do it a couple times last year, he's going to get thrown into the backfield instantaneously. Well, you got a six foot guy, 215 ish, or two, you know, 200 pounds, 195 pounds. He maybe gets, he's able to hold up for another half second longer, which when they're laying these um, reach blocks for the receivers, most of the time the reach block is being laid on the backside of the play. And so they don't have to lay it for very long. It's just for just enough so that backside defender can't chase down the, the backside of the play, right? Can't get the can't essentially normally that that player might go unblocked and he's just going to run full sprint down the line, scrape the line, and try to get to the to the running back. So 
you have the you have the receiver come down, lay a little bit of that block to to just a couple extra seconds to let that running back then pick his hole, pick his lane on the outside, not be pressed and rushed by that defensive end crashing down. Um, the cup was impressive, Sean. He had an amazing year. Adel Williams says Kamara's nose ring always makes me nervous. Like. He will take a bad hit and it will rip it out the middle of his nose. It makes me nervous too, ADL, but it's just because I hate that look on people. The I don't know why people would want to look like cattle. You know? And I know that there's probably some cultural whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You look like a cow. You know? I so I the 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 the, the cow ring in the nose deal is just to me. I don't I hate that look. I really don't like that look. Uh, AK-41 was just arrested, says Drunk Squidward. <laughs> and I get behind the chat so bad. I'm not too bad. I'm catching up here. Kitty does go meow. Kyle Mokey says, well, there goes my guy, Kamara. I don't know. Maybe this makes him cheaper, Kyle. Maybe it opens the door wider. Isaac, again, what do you have uh, planned with Brendan going forward? He's gotten really good. Brendan has gotten good. I always like Brendan. He's been, he's been working his game for a long time and doing a real good job with it. Um, we're going to keep doing our weekly things. We're, we're maybe going to do this week, uh, depending on if the defensive coordinator comes on. He'll come on the channel here, and we'll talk about the defensive coordinator if we get some news. Uh, we're going to be looking at draft prospects coming forward here pretty soon. Um, kind of just dive into a couple of myriad of topics, but, uh, we're going to keep it going. I like, I like our, uh, our weekly deals. So I want to keep it up, but he does great work over there, Brendan. Uh, Yama Lamovic says, do you think that Jordan Brooks can take the, can take the next year? He showed a lot of flashes last year and most of the yards he gave up were because of our secondary was ass and couldn't help for half the season. Um, I, I think, I think, um, I'll say this, Yaman, um, when you give up the most yards in coverage in the entire NFL, more than any other cornerback, more than any other linebacker that you give up the most yards in the NFL, I think when you reach that level of having that much yards given up, you do go a little bit beyond just the secondary was the cause of this, you know? And there were times this year where there was good secondary play in that out there. There were times Quandre was playing good and Trey Brown was playing good and Sidney Jones was playing good and uh, DJ Reed was playing good. Um, even Jamal Adams had a couple of games where he was solid. So I, 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 I think you can't quite do that with Jordan in this case. Um, I scouted Jordan Brooks a lot in college. I watched his junior tapes, junior tape. I watched all a lot of his games. He's probably the most watched prospect of that that draft that came out that I looked at. So I've seen a lot of his film going back to college, and the player he is now is the player he was in college. And I don't think this is all bad, Yaman. It's just that we have to understand what our expectation level should be with Jordan Brooks. He is a downhill player. He is sensational in the run game. He is a great tackler. He's a thumper. He's, he's a guy that when he and the running back hit the hole at the same point in time, the running back's going backwards, okay? In man coverage, he can hold up pretty good. He is a little short, so when he gets uh, matched up on a George Kittle 6'4", 6'5", type tight end, he's given up a lot of inches. So trust throws, throws where guys are going to out-jump him, not a whole lot he can really do on those plays, even when he's sticky in coverage in man, which he tends to be when he's in man coverage. The problems come into place in zone. Zone is where Jordan Brooks gets killed. And there's not a whole hell of a lot he can do about it. Maybe he gets a little bit better at it. He's got the speed and athleticism to be good at it. But some of the problems come into more of the feel aspect of it. Just doesn't have a good feel for zone coverage. And again, this goes back to college. Back to college. So he, he just drops back in his awareness. He can get run out of his zone by the first defender with flood zone concepts as the Rams attacked him with over and over when they played him. Some of the problem did come in just to give him a little bit of rope here on this because it's not his 
all his fault. Some of the problem came in in the back half of the year, Yama, um, in the respect of you lost so many cornerbacks, you didn't have enough guys to run dime defense, four corners and dime. So you had to stay in nickel even when opposition offenses went into four wide receiver sets. So this meant that your linebackers, both Bobby and Jordan, were having at that time to cover wide receivers in space, which is never going to be a great thing for a linebacker, especially when we're talking about zone. So some of it was not being put into the best positions, but some of it does come back to the bottom line here, which is just that Jordan Brooks is not a good zone defender, and you play in a defense that runs predominantly zone in the back end. So those things are just going to kind of be what they are. Uh, ADL Williams, it would be an absolutely insanity if Russ gave Sierra a black eye, then went and pulled a gun at a nightclub. Imagine the mugshot. Yeah, that would not be good. Goax05 says, you mean to tell me McDaniels isn't white? Biracial. A little, 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 yeah, a little bit of both. JJ, thought on uh, Hurt? I'm still worried about Pete having the ability to override him on decisions. JJ, I think KJ Wright gave you everything that you, you don't have to take my word for this, right? I've been, I've been espousing for two years now that this is not the defensive coordinator that you, people were saying, fire Ken Norton, fire Ken Norton. The pitchforks, the pitchforks were drawn every week here on the channel. We talk about it. And I would say over and over again, JJ, you guys are getting caught up on Ken Norton. Ken Norton's not the problem. It's Carroll. And you move on from Norton. You're not changing. You're not fixing the problem. And I think that while Hurt is probably a better defensive coordinator than Norton, because Norton was not good, so, I mean, it's like you got the bottom level guy, even if you just, mar this guy's marginally above him, it's better. Uh, at the end of the day, this still does remain Coach Carroll's defense. I am encouraged that they brought in Ed Donatel to help out Hurt. That's a, that's a seasoned pro out there who's going to have some sway in that room, who's going to have an ability to push back on Carroll at times, hopefully. Uh, They're also trying to bring in Sean Desai. And if you can bring in that triumphant, of uh, guys in there to to get that done i'll be a lot more encouraged by this hire but it's not one that has a lot of imagination to it it's not a one that makes me feel like they you know they went out they went across this landscape of america and looked far and wide and turned over every stone and distilled the group of names down from this big list down to this bottom 20 and then went down from there kind of feels like they're maybe just sort of locked into him the whole time and that makes me question whether or not that truly made him the right candidate or made him more of the candidate who's less likely to rock waves than the best candidate potentially would have been. Not sure for on that one, JJ. That's just my, my instinct on it. JJT says, if you love Freddie Young, then you belong here. Or with his Porter, you know him, man. Both those guys were dogs. Alexander Matthews, I think we need to release Bobby Wagner. I hate saying that, but it would save us a good amount of cap space. It's where I stand with it. Like I, the, and the thing I like to reference to folks that want to hold on to Bobby at the, the given rate again. Now I'm going to just, just, I know I said this a second ago, but just, just, and I'm throwing some numbers at you, but just keep in mind this, okay? You sign Travis Kelsey or Jensen to a new contract, probably the first year hit of that somewhere in about $8 million per year. On the first year cap hit, right? Because we're talking about this year's cap hit and the savings, but releasing Bobby in this cap hit year. So it's $8 million, you get a star center, okay? Now I go get Teron Armstead. I give him a four-year, what, $72 million deal, something in that range, maybe a little bit more. The first year hit for him would be about $9 million. Then I go give DK Metcalf a new contract extension. And remember with DK Metcalf, he has one more cheap year of his rookie deal left. It's, it carries about a couple a million and a half dollar salary, something like that. So you could basically just have it be that base salary plus bonus. So you have him at about $9 million on a new contract extension. So those three guys, I've upgraded my left tackle significantly. I've upgraded my center position past what it even was maybe when Max Unger was here. And I've re-signed my young star wide receiver to a new contract extension. For, and it's going to cost this year's cap $25.5 million. This year's cap hit for those three guys. To move on from Bobby, I saved $16.6 .6 million. So 65% of the cost to bring on those three guys and all that they could bring to the table to improve this roster 65% of that is eaten up by just moving on from Bobby, whose replacement you already have sitting and waiting in the wings in Jordan Brooks, whose backup to Jordan Brooks you already have waiting in the wings in Cody Barton. It just makes a lot of sense. And I love Bobby, I do, but it just makes a lot of sense. 
And I think, Corey, I agree with you. Corey Coleman says, I say they, I think they re-sign Bobby and bring back Dwayne Brown. I do think that's what they do do, Corey. As you know with me on this, I'd like to say what I'd like them to do and then what I think they will do. I think that's probably the likelihood of what they do uh, go with. And I'm not as super much as, as I'm not as much in favor of that necessarily because, again, what what's the restructure Bobby's going to take at that point? You know, you could have saved 16.6, but now he's just going to operate on a $10 million deal. So you end up saving like $6 million collectively instead of 16.6, which I just said that's now, now you're talking about that savings eating up 10% of those three players that I said we should go target or you, presumptively you'd look to target. <clears throat> Uh, JJ says thoughts on Cam Jordan. He's someone I think we should target, especially since the saints are in a cap hell and look like they're going to rebuild. Um, this year, Cam Jordan costs $24 million on the saints salary cap. Uh, Cam Jordan is going to cost the saints $22 million if they move him in a trade. I don't know if that's a significant portion of savings for the saints to move on from Cam Jordan. Uh, I also think that with where his age is at, I don't know how much you're really getting back in return. Pass rushers don't tend to net a whole lot anyway, especially an aging pass rusher like that. Do the Saints, for a mere $2 million in cap savings, want to move on from a guy that they might get back a fifth-round pick for? I don't think they would. Um, I think with Dunlap, you already have your proverbial veteran pass rusher already on the roster. I don't know if we need to stack a couple of those guys that are in that same vein. I don't know what Cam's got a whole lot left in the tank moving forward. Um, Let me look at his season real quick here. Let me just get the snapshot. Admittedly, I didn't watch a whole lot, but he didn't do a lot against us in the game, I don't think. Um, He had a good year. Another 13 sack year, 83 rating. You just wonder with them, though. It's I mean, drafted in 2011. How how many more years does he have to do it at that point? I, I mean, he's definitely getting up there in age. And what's then what's, you know, I guess I'll say this. Because they're eating up a lot of the bonus at that point, you are only on the hook for his base money, which wouldn't necessarily be significant. So it could make some sense from that range. And if we don't have to give up a lot of draft capital, it could make some sense, JJ. But those would be my two caveats. Alexander Matthews, Bobby Wagner, the last guy in D left over from the Legion of Boom. The last remaining remnant. Brian Koski, keep number 54 bot B Wags. He's an effing badass. Let him retire as a hawk. I love Bobby Bryant. I'm not necessarily chomping at the bit to want to move on from him, but it's it's goes beyond just wanting to have a player retire as a hawk. It goes to, at the end of the day, I can't be sentimental if it comes at the cost of putting the best possible football, t- football team on the football field. And I think that you've got to, you can revere a player and love a player, but you can also understand that moving into a different direction like that, moving in the direction of being sentimental has a good chance of costing you as far as wins and losses, being an elite team, not being an elite team. I mean, I just mentioned there, you move off from him and you can add so much else to the rest of the team by utilizing that salary in another place. And that's really the question at hand is not whether or not Bobby's been great, not whether or not Bobby deserves to retire as a Seahawk. The question at hand is that, is our team made better by getting these players versus having Bobby on the roster? Uh, Paying Bobby the money that we paid him since 2018 has not equaled out to an elite defense on the field. Paying the money we paid Bobby, we've had a defense that at times has looked like some of the league worst in league history, especially looking to a a year ago. So I, I do love Bobby, but we got to, we got to improve the team and there's only so many ways to do it, especially when you're missing a first round pick. Sean proper says Camaro arrested in Las Vegas on battery charge saints off season, getting worse and worse. Yeah. It's, it's kind of turning into a nightmare for the saints, isn't it? It's getting, it's getting, it's already getting a little dirty for them. Uh, Alexander, all these new guys are on defense before every game. They yell out LOB. I'm pretty sure those days are over, and most of those guys are gone. They are far from being the Legion of Boom. Yeah, we're not in the Legion of Boom era no more. <laughs> that, those days have passed. JD says, uh, Bobby Wagner, smartest linebacker ever. Definitely one of them. James Black, glad to see you back, Brandon. I'm always back here, man. I take a little bit of time here and there, but I always come back. You know me, James. 
I can't quit you guys. I can't stay away from you guys too long. Brian Koski, Alvin Kamara got busted. Damn, yeah, battery charge. JJ, seen a lot of people gushing over Russ on social media over Pro Bowl skill challenges. I think a lot of teams are going to be willing to throw a package together this offseason. Well, JJ, you know, that's been one of my long testaments. I've I fought this battle quite a bit over the year, especially um, even in the times where Russell hasn't looked good this year, where I've said, look, the cost, they're going to get more. Seattle's going to get more as an offer this offseason than what they got from the Bears last year. And, and there's reasons for this, but that's going to be the reality of this. He's going to garner more this offseason. And uh, you very well could see a team. There are some teams that are quarterback needy, that are sitting on multiple first-round picks. And if, if they're willing to throw it all, if they're willing to package it all together and Russ wants to go, it may be too good of an offer for Seattle to, uh, like the Godfather, you know? We'll make him enough for, we'll make him enough for a camera fuse. Godfather, Godfather, what are you going to do? I'm going to make him an offer for a camera fuse. I'm gonna give him, I'm gonna give him three first round picks. They're gonna go first, three first round picks. Give him two second round picks. I'm gonna give him my best player on defense, Coach Carroll. He'll not be able to deny it. He'll not be able to look away. He will have to accept our deal, and if not, we will put a horse head in his bed. That's I me. Mean, that's the way I see it going. Uh, Jean D, you almost need an enlarged pick of panoramic view of 86 Hawks versus Chargers game. The game where Largent made his receiving record. I can see if I can get it enlarged. Some of that, John, some of those some of those uh, videos on YouTube of the 80s games is yeah, there's some pixelation going on, right? There's some there's some degradation of uh, video quality, that's for sure. Part of the reason why I've said for, why the NFL doesn't just re, you know put old games up on YouTube. Um, I've always wondered why they don't do that. You know, why they just have them sitting in these vaults. It seems to me make more sense to put it out there. Like, no one's ever going to go back and watch. Like, who goes back and watches old 60s games, right? Or old 50s games, you know? Nobody's going to go watch that footage. And there will come a time. Nobody's going to want to go back and watch footage of the 80s and 90s. But there's a market for them now. There's people that want to see it now. I, I don't know why the NFL doesn't get more creative with that. Uh, Sean Proper says, a large in comp. How about Bobby Ingram? I, I can't do it on that, Sean. Um, it's a little bit why you can't do the Cooper cup. Um, and, uh, go Hawks of says cup has 1600 yards in the slot. He is no largent. No. And he, he, as well, go Hawks. Let's remember, he also had an extra game to get the stuff in there. Um, though he had a great year, so I don't want to take anything away from cup cups. Fantastic. But cup does a lot of his work, all his work from the slot. Largent did it on the outside and it's hard work to do that on the outside. Bobby Ingram was a slot only receiver. He didn't play outside at all for the Seahawks. Uh, Wes Welker was a slot receiver. He didn't play outside. The Largent comp has to be on a guy on the outside because that's where Largent got his work done. He may have been a smaller receiver, but he was he played big on the football field. Um, and Cup's great, but operating the slot, you got linebackers covering you. You got the third best cornerback on a team sometimes covering you, right? Maybe a safety from time to time. On the outside, you got cornerback one or cornerback two. And if you're as good as Largent was, you're getting cornerback one all day long. Dakman says Washington Uber should be the name. <laughs> Alexander Matthews also likes the Marvin Harrison comparisons. The Largent, Mars, and Harrison. I like it, man. I do too. Dakman, uh, Clan Killer says his Ken Hamlin was awesome as a Seahawk. Ken was good. Poor guy, if he, hadn't, if he hadn't gotten smashed in his brain with a parking sign, he, he might have been uh, might have ascended a little bit farther than he did even in his career. He's still a good player, a heavy hitter, and that guy could hit. His uh, Dante Stallworth hit, you could still go see a still of that. He, like, hit him so hard, Dante Stallworth's face, like, <laughs> it was, like, bubbled up. It's so weird looking when you look at the still of his face because he knocked his helmet off at the same time Hamlin did. So Dante Stallworth's face, like, it looks it just it looks like it hurts i guess that's what i'm trying to say uh random again says how about isaac bruce and largent yeah bruce was a bruce was a little more there, there's there's some similarities there there's some similarities there I 
I always thought Isaac Bruce and Art Monk were like the same kind of player. Kind of an old reference there. Uh, Alexander says, yeah, large and Iris Harrison makes a little more sense. A little more sense on that one. I don't know why. That one just fits a little more for me. ADL Williams, I approve of the Wolverines. They got some good players, man. There's, there are at least three guys, and maybe that cornerback will be a fourth that I would look at from that squad. Tagman says, has Josh Jacobs reached his peak? Yeah. Yeah. Problem with the Alabama running backs coming out is that they're just grounded out so hard. They usually have so many carries on their body by the time they reach the NFL level that they don't usually have all, a hell, hell of a lot to offer. On top of the fact that they have usually been, of course, running behind five-star offensive linemen across the board, say nothing of tight ends, receivers, et cetera, or quarterbacks. Um, Josh Jacobs is really firmly landed in the spot of being a first, a one or two down back in this league. He just doesn't seem to have a lot in his game to be a third down, to give you much as far as a pass catcher goes. And seems a little limited in what he's doing as far as a runner. I will say this, the, the Raiders line was better when he first walked in the door versus where it is now. They had an exodus of linemen walk out, out there over the last year, I think because of Tom Cable. Um, so he may still have a little bit to him. That may have affected him as well. I've, I've long said, Tackman, I think the running back's performance is very much driven by the offensive line they have in front of him. First, having a running back that's just so much of a star, he can create all of his own his own yards and all that. I, I, I lean door, you need the line. You need to be, it helps when you got some plus attributes and some good ability, but just do need the line to make it work as well. So there may be a little bit of untappedness there with Josh where you put him on a line that's actually can block and he can give you a little bit more. Though he hasn't been bad. Tagman says that Saquon's career is over. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to touch Saquon. I'd, I'd be hesitant with him. Randall says teams are starting to use actual game speed when evaluating prospects. 40 starting to look less. Um, you're right. Yeah, the GPS stuff is taking over. In fact, within I think a couple of years, you'll have no 40 and it will be all GPS. It's going in that direction, which is good to see because we no longer have to say, well, he's track fast, but he doesn't have the football speed. It's like, no, this is what his football speed is. This is what he can go at top end. Um, much more accurate and better for us to be able to gauge guys' speed. Because some of those guys in tracks, they've been doing, you know, they've been working tracks since high school, junior high. They've got their little methods to run faster when they're out of pads. And it's like, you can't fade the funk when you're uh, in pads and you're it's game day and a guy's chasing you. Tackman says, Kamara must bounce back from 2021 season. Yes, he does. Uh, Brian Goski says, the Washington lobbyists. That would have been the most one. That, that, that would have fit the region best. That would have fed the region best. Um, Randall says, Hawks need to hit in the draft. I know easier said than done, but a great draft will change direction of a team. Very much, Randall. We've seen it here before. We've seen it here in recent 10 years. Draft will take you very far. Um, yeah. Well well said, man. Well, Very well said. Um, but I agree. They got to hit. They got to hit this year, Randall. They do. They got to get it done. Say nothing if they make a rust trade and they got all those those picks looking them in the face. But, um, you know, you've got money to spend this offseason, but you certainly could stand to walk away from this draft with two to three more starters, especially guys that can just hit the ground running. That would help this team out considerably. Uh, we got Washington Capitalists, Washington Republicans. <laughs> Go on, survive. Washington replaced the Redskins with the people that look that took their land. <laughs> I had thought of it like that, but it's true. Oh, Dante King, would you get Alex uh, Stroming if he is there in the second round? I have, uh, I've not looked at Alex Stroming, man. I'm sorry. I've been definitely grinding on tape this last week, man. So I'm getting through these names, but um, that's one name that I haven't gotten through quite yet. I'm sorry, but on all these guys you're mentioning, I will try to have a look at all these guys by the time we get back on the next stream, Dante. So uh, I'll take a look at him. I'll take a look at him on the next stream for sure. I'll have a breakdown for you. Adiel Williams is Washington Wiggers. The mascot is a skinny white dude with cornrows, a do-rag, and one pant leg rolled up. <laughs> oh, Brandon McDaniel, UW cornerback Kyler Gordon will blow up the combine. 45 vert, sub 4-4. Four, four. I was uh, I was looking at his running mate Randall. I, he's him him along with the kid from Michigan are my next two cornerbacks I'm taking a look at. Uh, but I was pretty in, I was pretty impressed with the other kid the the running mate that he has for him. Got to remember his name. Uh, Trent McDuffie. 
I liked what I saw to Trent. Yeah, boy, did he have ever an amazing year for, uh, look at his PFF scores. He was number one in the uh, college football last year with uh, his coverage grade, number one with a completion percentage, fourth, fourth in forced completion percentage, and he was second in passer rating allowed. Um, Trent had a really good year last year. Now teams just ran the hell on the Huskies right and left. So some of that was that, but, um, Trent's interesting as well, but I, I'm Gordon's my next guy to look at on that Randall Gordon and the kid, uh, Paxton or whatever is from Michigan are my next two corners. I want to take a look at, but if he does that 45 vert four, four sub, I mean, that's, that's first round numbers at that point, right? Productions on the field. And then there's that, that's going to, that's going to vault him into the back end of the first round. Kind of like it did with like Kevin King, another u Dubber. Alexander says, since they have no name, we could have went with uh, Washington whatevers. I always like the, t- the two to be determines. Herbicide, hey, y'all. All Washington had to do is flip the pick of Native Americans to a potato, and then they could have kept the name Redskins. <laughs> or how about the peanuts, right? Gone with a peanut. Those are my favorite peanuts, by the way. The Redskins peanuts from Planet Fan. That stuff is good. Randall Champagne Supernova, yeah. Yeah, my wonder why. Hey, he's such a whiny singer. Brian Kowski, I still believe that number 84 Parkinson needs more opportunities to show his talent. Just saying. I agree with you, Brian. He came on at the end of the year, man. And, and the part that really jumped out to me that surprised me that wasn't there on his college tape was his run blocking ability. He's really come along in that respect. You know, gotten in that weight room, gotten bigger, gotten stronger, um, gotten better in his technique. I really showed out in that. He's already, I already knew he could catch the ball. I already knew he's got some good hands on him. But uh, he added that as well, and I think he's got some potential to him. I do. But at least we not forget, Brian, that this team supposedly had a first-round grade on Parkinson in, in the draft he was taken out in. Goxo Vax says, I said, maybe, maybe going to be the one that saves the day. <laughs> maybe. You're going to be the one that saves me. And if they oh. Uh, Randall McDaniel says, when you watch the Otten tape, check out 2020. Okay. I will take a look at just the 2020 tape. Joe Biden's make-a-wish. Malik Williams Willis is a good quarterback. His short throwing is iffy, though. Now, we've seen how the short quarterbacks struggle with those, those short throws, right? So it seems like it wouldn't be that way, Joe, but it is, huh? Um, Malik has got the, the biggest boom, boom bust factor of any quarterback in this draft, not a quarterback draft filled with a lot of boomer, bigger boomer bust guys. You've got a lot of guys that I'd call middling, um, vaguely interesting. Malik is a guy that's really interesting. Um, but he also has a that bust factor is there with him. Um, who's going to be that team that steps up. And I think it's going to be a team with him that's going to mold the offense around him, that's going to look to do a little bit of replicating of what the Ravens did with Lamar Jackson. We're going to get our five years of his rookie deal. Let's get the most out of it with him. We've got him in the back end of the first round or or mid to back end of the first round, which means he's not a significant cost. Um, I think a team will go that direction with it. And uh, we'll see what kind of success they have with it. I mean, he's got a – there's such a variance with him. Um, His throwing motion is all over the place. Um, he's kind of a one read, one read and go kind of quarterback. If the one read ain't there, then he's running a lot of quarterbacks in college are that way, but there just, there's not a lot of refinement, I guess is what I'm saying to his game, as well as you got the lesser competition aspect of things. Kind of like a modern age potential, hopefully uh, Steve McNair, right? It's like a little bit of a thinner version of McNair. Sean proper, as far as Kamara goes, it will be interesting to see if it's a potential victim was a man or a woman. It will indeed. I'm going to guess if it happened at a club, that's probably a dude. I'm going to hope it's just that. I don't know. Um, Brian Gosky says, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas unless you're caught on camera. Unless you're caught on camera. <laughs> I almost butchered that, Brian. Nice. <laughs> unless you're caught on camera. Uh, Jaden Cruz, what do you think will f- who do you think will fall in the draft and who do you think will go too soon? <laughs> caught on camera. Um... Who do I think will fall in the draft? That's a great question. I'm giving you, I'm thinking on my name for you on this one, all right? So bear with me. All right, so I'm 
my my faller in the draft would be Neil of Alabama because he's looked at as a guy that'll go top five and he might end up going like top 15. If you're looking at a guy that's going to, you're talking about like a significant drop, like falls off a shelf from first round to like a second round pick. And we're going to go that deep with it. It's a great question because the fall, the, the fallers haven't really stood out as much. I would probably go with, with Trevor Penning. I think that he's not going to go as high as some people think he's going to go. I don't, the small, the, the foot, the game film with him was not as impressive as everybody was telling me it was when prior to looking at, at his film. I think Stingley has a top chance to fall out of the top 10 as well. He's kind of, those would be my two kind of fallers at the moment. Um, who I think will go too soon. Another, another great question and fantastic question on that. Um, Well, I think the quarterbacks are going to go too soon, but that's kind of an easy answer. But I, I think Hal, I think Carson Strong, I don't think those guys should will last into the second round where they should go, and, and they will get taken um, a little bit higher than they should be taken. Um, who, would be the, who would be the guy that would rise up boards? I think Jennings is going to rise up boards off this senior bowl performance. And I think he's going up higher than he should because I think he doesn't play the run at all, at all, at all, at all. Um, and so I, I think he, he's going to get taken because he's a prolific pass rusher, but that's all he really provides you. And uh, I don't think that that should be necessarily a top 15 pick, but I think it's going to be. And he's going to get vaulted up because of that a bit. So I think he gets taken taken a bit high. He's my boomer. He'd be the one that I think he goes a little too soon. If you're gonna have a if you're gonna be top picked in the top fifteen, I'd I'd really like more of a rounded out skill set from you. From him at least. Uh Herbicide, anytime a band compares themselves to the Beatles, it just proves their ignorance. Yeah, nobody should compare themselves to the Beatles. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. That's what they did. They did combine. Yeah. They like, they had a weird relationship that band did with the, uh, the Beatles. They both loved them and revered them. And then also were like, Apple yeah, were just as good as them. Okay. Uh, Brian Gosky, I love Chris Cornell singing Jesus Christ pose. That dude was a badass. Cornell was awesome, man. One of the great all time voices in rock history. Hey, Dale Williams, uh, Chris Cornell was a top three front man all time. Soundgarden and audio slave can't do much better than that. He's definitely up there. He's definitely up there. I mean, that, that voice was his own. Nobody could copy that voice. Very unique. You know, I was just hearing him on the radio. Like a stone, I'll wait for you here. Alone. I love it when he gets that low tenor where he says, alone. He's like singing from the pit of his soul. Um... Megan says, oh, hell no. Decides being courted by the Giants. Grab him now, Hawks, for F's sake. Hey, grab him. The thing that I mentioned, the place that you could, you could pick a guy like this up and override it to a team that might even be willing to give him a, a bit better of a job or a position, just throw more money at him. You know, there's no salary cap on coaches. Just bring in a briefcase of cash and be like, Sean, you want to go to the Giants or you want to go to Seattle? That's a pretty big briefcase of cash, Pete. Yeah, it is, isn't it, Sean? Yeah. So I guess you're going to be a Seahawk then? Yeah. Herbicide says, love me sound garden. One of the worst line bands ever though. They sounded horrible. Oh, live bands. One of the live bands ever. Really? That's interesting to hear. Including Cornell Herbicide? Or just the rest of the backup band was just brutal. Tagman says, Desai and Dubai. Nirvana was amazing live. Such a good show. Yeah, that, was, that would have been a treat to go see any of those two bands going. Aaron Zang, Alvin Kamara just got arrested in Las Vegas. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about it a bit here. We were talking a bit. Don't know what that's going to mean. You think that makes it more likely he's probably going to be moved out of uh, New Orleans one way or another. Rattle says, let Dar Donald barrel down on Russ during skills comp and see how he does. <laughs> the PTSD flashes and, and, and shakes and... Uh, 
and wincing alone would not allow him to win that win the skills challenge at that point, Randall. Uh, Randall says Easton is Dan McGuire minus the cool brother. Bingo. Bingo. Well said, Randall. Right on point with it with that one. Herberside says, who do I got in the Super Bowl? Uh, the Rams are going to win, unfortunately. I'm not happy to say that, but they're it's just they're running right now. They're rolling and Bengals are plucky. Bengals are interesting. Bengals are exciting. Bengals are going to lose. Uh, Randall McDaniel, is, is Eason related to Tony Eason? He's one of the 80s Patriots. I believe he is. Randall, I believe he is. Uh, Kyler Robinson, I really like DJ Dallas at kick returner all year. Really consistent, I think. Yeah, he runs hard. He, you know, you want those guys on those kick returns to just not be tentative, not be hesitant. Plant your foot in the ground. Get uphill. Go. And get up to full speed as quickly as you can. Don't be worried about getting hit from the side. Just get up. And, and he really was a master getting up again into the you know, 40, 42, 43 yard line by just pressing that, that kickoff return. You know, full speed going at it. Uh, fearlessness to him in that respect. I'm fine with him over there at it. I'm, I'm much more down on Swain at the punt return position than I am Dallas. Um, Swain just doesn't do much for me at all at the punt returner position, but that's all right. Uh, Herbicide, do we keep Homer? Um, I, I think that there's a good chance he's your best third down back right now. He's the best probably blocking back you have on the roster, and that carries some value no matter what you can do in running the football or catching the football. Both of two things he did pretty good last year in the small sample sizes of uh, carries and touches that he did get. So, um, yeah, we probably do keep him, but I tend to think we're going to probably keep five running backs next year, so it's they're going to keep just more of a stable, I think. Randall says, I'm riding with the Bengals. I got on that bandwagon early in the year. <laughs> nice, Randall. You, you did indeed. I remember you saying that. So keep, keep, hopefully, hopefully they pull this off. Like I said, I don't want to have to hear Rams fans talking about their title for the next year. Say nothing of the next couple of years. Jackson, I'm back. Sorry about that, Brandon. No worries, man. Stuff comes up. Uh, Kitty goes meow. Go Bengals. <laughs> Jackson Shore, have you taken a look at uh, Trent uh, McDuffie from Washington? If so, what are your thoughts? Yep, he was the one. He was a, who I was looking at last night. Uh, let me give you my breakdown. Our, Trent McDuffie, University of Washington. He's a five eleven, so not quite into that same sort of size range that Seattle looks for in their outside corners. Uh, but then again, they have taken flyers out on DJ Reed recently and Trey Brown, so they might open that up a little bit more. Very smooth zone cover corner. Um, this guy would be absolutely easy fit into this defense. He's been doing a lot of the stuff at UW that the Seattle Seahawks defense does, especially with their cornerbacks, the, the kick step bail type technique that he incorporates. They incorporate there very much is incorporated here with Trent. Um, Kitty's a little bit under the weather, I think, right now. Um, He's got nice feet. He's never taking false steps or getting turned around. So he's got a, a level that the Seahawks like to have their corners play very patiently when they're dropping back into that bail technique. Don't bite on the first move. Don't bite on the second move. Don't take false steps. Um, you know, if, you, if you're, if you're going to break on the ball, be sure that he's not double moving you, that he's not going to get over the top. You're not getting over the top on McDuffie. He's going to stay clean in that respect of things. While still being able to make a play on guys underneath, he doesn't just keep to the responsibility of the deep coverage. He also can stay draped on a guy really close, which is uh, something that I really like about his game. Um, he, uh, he's able to keep his eyes on the quarterback while in zone, another key part of this, of this defense you like to see because a guy that keeps his eyes on the quarterbacks while he's still able to keep his own responsibility is a guy who's going to be ready for the tip passes that come his way or the errant missed thrown balls and will, and will flip the field when that does occur. Um, he's overall good in the run game. Uh, he, when, he, when he comes downhill, when he really goes, he goes, and it's impressive, and he'll lay a hit and a stick, and he, I mean, he'll chase plays down on the backside. It's very impressive. Um, isn't always there. Sometimes a little inconsistent in his want in the run game. Uh, but he always, if the, if the run game goes to his side, he keeps the edge, he turns it back inside, he's strong up against the block. Uh, a good, complete player is Trent McDuffie. Um, my bottom line for him is Trent would be an ideal zone corner in Seattle scheme. He would know just what is needed from him from day one. He has the size, athleticism, somewhat of the size. He's close on the six-foot mark, so close enough. 
Uh, size athleticism, the Seahawks covet at the cornerback position. He might be a tad short, but they've been more forgiving lately with DJ Reed and Trey Brown. He can tackle, he can stay clean over the top in coverage, and he drapes receivers. What's not to like? I do think that McDuffie's probably going to sneak up into the first round in this draft. Maybe just the fact he's not six foot tall might be just enough to keep him back, especially if he comes up with gator arms. If he's got little gator arms on a five foot eleven build, that that might be enough to get him knocked back a bit. But boy, is he athletic! Boy, can he move! And he would just he understands what this scheme would require of him. Randall says, "Does another seven to ten years spell the end of Pete, <laughs> or does another seven and ten years spell the end of Pete?" Not necessarily, Randall. It de- it depends on what form that seven and ten year looked. You know, were fans booing in the stadium from start to finish? Was it just bad football? Did they luck their way into the seven wins? Did some weird injury thing hit them? Um, were there other explanations outside of Pete just sucking as a coach? Um, it's a possibility it could end it, but I don't think it's a guarantee. No. I think he, he's still got a couple of years on his contract, and I, I'm, I'm just not certain that Jody is as willing to push on this as hard as she'd have to push. Herbicide says, would you put money on the Bengals, though, for Randall? I don't know if Randall would. I wouldn't. Jackson Shore says, looking back, it's weird that Aaron Donald fell to 12. Watched the draft last week, and everyone said he's going to be a stud, yet he fell to 12. Yeah, um... Coming out of Pittsburgh, so not necessarily a, 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 as big a program as some of the, the bigger trend-setting programs at the time. Um, he's a guy that was six foot tall who was probably 290, you know, um, which was going to be undersized at that point. This meant a couple different things. First off, it meant that Aaron Donald wasn't going to fit in any three, four defenses. So if you look at those top 12 picks, Jackson, I'm going to guess that probably half of them, if not a little bit more than half, were running a three, four defense at that time, which immediately removed him from their boards. Now you got the four three teams remaining. Of those six teams, who needed a three tech defensive tackle? Um, I'm going to guess not a lot of them. Versus other positions that were maybe available of more need at the time, because the three tech defensive tackle just wasn't looked at as a t- as a position that you could necessarily dominate from in the fashion that Aaron Donald has dominated from. Some guys have here and there, but most of the guys that have been the epic pass rushers do it from the edge. He's been one of the few to do it in the way he's done it from that inside. Um, harder to have that kind of imagination for that type of player. So there's a little bit that goes into it. Um, just a tiny bit with that that's just beyond, you know, there are 12 teams that passed on him. If you have a 3-4 team, you weren't going to put him in as your nose tackle at 290 pounds. And you probably weren't looking to move him out of a defensive end at 290 pounds either. Just it made him a made him a pure fit scheme for a 4-3 defense. Uh, Zorn76, since he's going to beat the Rams in their own backyard. Uh, indeed. I hope so. I hope you're right. Uh, Jackson Shore, favorite prospect in this draft, Brandon. <sighs> Still developing on that one, Jackson. I'm hesitant to necessarily say I've got my favorite prospect yet uh, when I haven't looked at all the prospects. You know, that's one thing I got to make sure I do is have a chance to see everybody. So I just haven't had a chance to quite check out uh, all that I've got to take a look at quite yet. Um, I'm just looking and see if there's maybe a name right now off my initial list that I would look at that I'd say um, that this guy stands out to me. Man, there's there's not a lot. I, I do like Aiden Hutchinson quite a bit. I really do. Um, he's, he's a fun player to watch. But again, that's kind of boring because he's the number one pick in the draft, right? So it's not that's not very much fun. I don't know. I think I'm going to wait a little bit, give you an answer on that. So I, want, I, don't want to, I want to be able to look at the guys fully across the board and see who's who and what's what. Um, there's some guys I like, though. There's definitely some guys I like. I like Devontae Wyatt. I do like Daniel Fa'alele. Um, but I'm, I haven't seen enough of the guys yet, and I want to watch through all the prospects before I give you my favorite one, Jackson. But those are some early ones that I'm liking. Uh, Brian Koski, I have a long-distant cousin playing for the Rams. Okay. Forgive you for, for being informed for one game, I guess. 
<laughs> Randall, I put money on Bengals plus four. Ooh. Uh, Jackson, well, so much for Russ Watt and Kamara. I don't know. I may still open the door for it. Front office has said they won't sign a player who's laid his hands on a woman, but if you've laid your hands on a man, that's not going to preclude them. Heck, Frank Clark punched Jermaine Effetti on a practice field, and they still kept Frank. So, Jackson, sure, what's one move Seattle can make that would get you excited and say we're Super Bowl contenders? I don't know if there's one move that would be driven above any one other move, Jackson, to, to make me feel like this makes us Super Bowl contenders. If I can say, if, if you address the left tackle and center position, if you t- if both of those are addressed with an equal amount of fervor, uh, with an equal amount of uh, assets put into them, then that's going to make me feel like you've got a lot better of a chance of getting closer to the Super Bowl contention because you're now addressing the offensive line in a way that you not you never had. But it would take them going for both left tackle and center for me to feel like that. Say nothing of even looking at the right tackle position. Um, but I don't know if you're one move away from a Super Bowl contending status. You're a couple moves away, but you it's it's a variety of things need to be done here. You know the line's got to be have at least two great parts added to it. You need tight ends, you need a pass rusher, you need cornerbacks, you need a free safety, you need a will linebacker, um, variety of running backs. There's a lot to be done. Herbazide says, did you see that post from Roger Goodell? Said it was an unfair advantage for a team to play in their home field in the Super Bowl. Happened twice in a row now. So all future Bulls will be played in Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's no chance that they're going to play at home for the Super Bowl, so understandable. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that, especially since, since Seahawks Stadium would never be selected as a Super Bowl venue, so we would never have a chance to ever play that game at home. So that's fine. You know, that's fine from my standpoint. And it's, it is a little bit of an advantage a team shouldn't have in the NFL. It should be a neutral site. Half Daddy says, bro, I am ready for Jody Allen to sell the Blazers. She can hang on to the Seahawks, but just sell the team to someone who cares. It's a little bit of my worry with what we have going on here in Seattle, Half Daddy. Is, is, is she invested? Does she care? Does she want to be an NFL owner? Is she just, you know, treading water with Paul Allen's legacy? You know, doing the bare minimum, um, which kind of feels a little bit of what's going on here a bit, in my opinion. Um, feels that way a little bit. We'd, we'd, I certainly wouldn't mind a little bit more of an active owner. I wouldn't. I'd feel a little more confident about the direction of this organization going forward if we had one. Jackson Shore, would you be upset if we spent a pick on a quarterback in this draft and not a seventh, but a guy that could have upside? Uh, yes. Yeah. You don't have a first-round pick in this draft, Jackson. You're theoretically holding on to Russell Wilson for another year. You're going to give up some kind of significant draft capital at that point to the quarterback position thus weakening your ability to add and fill holes through the draft at that point. We already just saw with Jordan Love and Aaron Rodgers as, as the, the quarterback waiting in the wings. That, that And we saw it before, frankly, with Rodgers and, and Favre. Um, this isn't a great situation to go at this with. If you have a Ryan Fitzpatrick and you draft your quarterback in the future, that's fine. If you have a guy that's a legitimate upper-level starting quarterback in this NFL – who's still got a lot of good football ahead of them, and then you draft a quarterback of the future behind him, it just doesn't, it doesn't sit well with these quarterbacks. You know, you can call them touchy, sensitive, whatever you want. They don't like it. And uh, so all of that, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me to go in that direction of it. On top of the fact, I'm not all that particularly high on these quarterbacks. You're going for a guy to pick at that point in the third, second round, who maybe isn't even all that particularly good. So you, you burn out Russ, you piss him off. He doesn't even end up being your quarterback of the future as it is. And you ignore a position that's more of a vital need. I, I would be upset. Randall McDaniel, uh, Thibodeau kind of a Nick Bosa, six foot four, six five in the 260 range. It's a little bit. Bosa played with a little more power. He played a little bit more power coming out of Ohio State. And Thibodeau's a little more finesse. He's a little more purified finesse. As well as Thibodeau's a little more... Even more than Nick Bosa, a little more twitchy, a little more quick, a little faster. Uh, so they're a little different in that realm of it. Herbert says, I guess I'm related to the Shanahans. They're like my distant third cousins or something. Oh, okay. Nice. Nice. Paul Third, thank you for the $2 donation. Thank you, Paul. Says, uh, with the $2 donation, says, you watching Peacemaker? If not, treat yourself. 
Uh, I've been thinking of doing the HBO Max just to check out the show. I haven't gotten Matt Max as of yet in recent times, but I'm thinking about doing it, Paul. So I, I'm, I, it's, I've watched a couple of the clips offline that laughed, and I wondered about it. But like, you're going to do a show on this guy, and I don't, is this really going to work? But it's, it's doing really well, and I laughed my house off at some of the clips. So I think I'm going to have to check it out. I think I'm going to have to do it. Thank you for the, the $2 donation, though. Um, but herbicide, man, you got to get on that Shanahan connection, man. <laughs> you got to take advantage of that, that inside connection with the Shanahans. Randall McDaniel, the other kid from Michigan. I bet he has a great career, both of them. Me too, Brandall. I, both Hutchinson and, and David Ojo Gobi both have a right to be picked within the top 10, in my opinion. And David has just been playing football since 2017. But he does a great job of pressing the arc's edge and getting there quicker than the tackle can get there one way or another. And then once he gets there, he just sort of just presses down on the tackle. He sort of flattens his route to the quarterback and presses down, hand fighting. He can just sort of force his way in front of the tackle to get to the quarterback at that point. It's part of what sort of – he draws parallels to me with, with Chandler Jones. Chandler has that same kind of ability of just sort of winning initially – but not winning like just completely beating your ass off the snap winning, winning in a subtle way where they sort of quickly wearing you down to get to the quarterback, and that's what he does. Really good player, though. Really good player. Also a great, great uh, tomahawk chop. Billy to really uh, generate fumbles when he gets the sack, too. Heady. Randall says, I'm one of the only people from Washington who, who roots against Gonzaga. Can't stand them. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Jackson Shore, I like Aiden Hutchinson more than Thibodeau. I think he'll go number one, and Thibodeau could fall. I do like Aiden more than Hutchinson. More refined, more of a technician. Um, maybe not as quite as twitchy as Thibodeau, but also has twitchiness to him. Also has some quickness to him, some bend to him. Great bend to him. So um, not maybe at the same level, but not that far off, whereas Thibodeau's far off from him as far as hand usage and um, fundamentals go. Half Daddy B., Thoughts on San Francisco getting two more third-round compensatory picks for, from Miami for hiring their former biracial offensive coordinator, Mike McDaniel. Now San Francisco will have 10 picks in 2022. I, I'm not happy by it, Half Daddy. It seems like whether or not these, these teams in our division get extra picks or teams around the league bail them out of bad contracts, it always seems like they get a helping hand from somewhere or another, doesn't it? And boy, does it lame. Because our division's already so hard. It is already the toughest division in football by far, by what I'm going to call a 15%. And no, that's math mathematical-based, that's gut-based, and that's way more accurate in this case. But my goodness, it's like every team just keeps loading up more and more and more, and the watermark to get up there to be a division winner in this, in this uh, division is getting harder and harder and harder. I've said, Half Daddy, that I feel like San Francisco, if I look at the main threat in this division over the next two to three years, to me it's San Francisco, beyond the Rams, Beyond St. Beyond St. Louis, beyond uh, Arizona, um, those teams will still be good, but the Niners are the team that really has me sort of kind of freaking out a little bit about where they're going at from a team standpoint because they're doing a lot of smart moves. They've got still some good young players, um, and they're going to they're going to remain dangerous, I think. And um, yeah, that gets me worried. I mean, isn't going to suck. We got Rams win the Super Bowl this year, and we got to go watch like 49ers going this offseason, pick up Aaron Rodgers, and go win a Super Bowl next year. We're just sitting here just like, oh, dear God, please, no more of this. No more. It's going to be hard, Half Daddy. I ain't going to lie. It's going to be hard to watch if it goes that way. Keldon, unfortunately, Trent Williams' ankle injury was hurting him against the Rams. I was watching uh, tape breakdown, and he was not able to put weight on it. Was getting pushed around. Yeah, not he wasn't in the same shape in that game, Keldon. But, boy, throughout the course of this year, he was absolutely dominating. Just in a variety of techniques, um, his slingshot blocks, where he's got a, you know, a defender gets inside of him and he just finds a way to sort of use their momentum and sort of, you know, throw them past him. Um, he's really good. He's really good.
Team 12, I just filmed through video. If I don't film during the weekend, I have to wake up at 4.30 a.m. to film. And for some reason, can't fall asleep till at least 11 p.m. So I did the other one I did uh, the other week. I was dead. <laughs> it happens, man. It's, it's a hard grind, this YouTube life, Team 12. It is indeed. And congrats on getting the sub count, man. Keep keep your grind going, man. Jackson Shore, if, you, uh, if we're talking basketball, let's talk about the NBA saying piss off to us. Save our Seahawks. Yeah, we need to get our Sonics back, dude. Save our Save your Sonics. Got to get our Sonics back, man. It's got to happen. Sean T says, if the Hawks hired you, what position would you be comfortable in? General manager. I'd be a good general manager because I'd allocate the hell out of my job. I'd hire smart guys in around me. I'd lean on my analytics department. And I think that a lot of the decision making at that point, the general managership is look, you you the decision making rides on your shoulders. But if you have the proper people in uh, educating you and informing you below you um, on players on where they are, then it's about just making tactical decisions. And I think I'd be okay in in the realm of making a tactical decision. May not be successful in it, but I'd be very comfortable, very comfortable doing it. I think. Plus, I was awesome at it in Madden, so that absolutely means I'd be awesome at it in the real world. Jackson Shore was watching the 2006 wildcard game versus Dallas. Matt threw a beautiful ball to Stevens, then big play Babs with the clutch stop. So much fun watching old games. Oh, it is. I love going back and checking old, old games. Especially uh, Lofa had a great play in that game. Stopped, uh, stopped Witten right at the line, right at the end zone. I mean, just right there, just held him up, kept him up out of the end zone, won a great tackle in open field. Helped win that game too. Randall says, I bet there's a great book yet to be written on what went on in Hawaii during the Pro Bowl, talking about the nightlife and shenanigans of the Pro Bowl. Yeah, somebody was, text, somebody was uh, texting out who's, who's on the team, who's most sweaty, sweating out the alcohol in the field today. <laughs> and that's probably why a lot of these guys are playing kind of light, is that everybody's a little bit probably uh, partied out. Um, but it's, it's the way it goes, man. I bet there would be some awesome stories. I already, I've heard a few of them said that they're pretty out of control. Uh, Team 12 says, Brandon, are you okay if I talk about my channel if someone asks about it? I don't want you to feel like I'm trying to use your channel to get subs. No, it's all good, Team 12s. I'm, hey, man, we're all supporting each other out here, so it's all good, brother. It's all good, man. Uh, Brian Kosky, one effing playoff, one effing playoff win in five years. Ugh. Yeah. It's, it, I try to find these things that, are, that, that kind of lift people a little bit out of the realm of understanding this has not been a one-year problem. Because this has been one of the narratives that's sort of driven me crazy over the course of this offseason. Well, it's been just one year. What is it? Just one bad year and you guys all bail. No, it's been, we've not been a good team now for a few years. We've won more games than we lost, but we've not been an elite team. I don't know if I can say at any point in time since 2018, we've been a top 10 team in the sport. Well, is that a consistent winner? 2018, 19, 20, 21, four years, five years. Not a top 10 team. Is that being a consistent winner? I mean, if you're the 13th best team in the NFL, I, I guess technically it is. But is it really? Is it really? You know? Randall McDaniel says, I heard Mark Few's a flat earth guy. <laughs> Herbicide says, dang it. Who was the baseball player that came out of Spokane, played for the Cubs? Can't think of his name. Ryan Rhino? Is it Ryan Sandberg? Rhino? If my name was Ryan, by the way, it would definitely be Rhino. I would definitely be going by Rhino. Uh, Alexander Matthews, it's not going to happen, but I'd like to see what Josh Allen would look like in some Hawks gear. Ooh, he looks sweet in Seahawks gear, man. He looked big sweet in Seahawks gear. Uh, Jackson Shore, I was mad when we picked Brooks, but I'm liking what I see. Needs to play middle linebacker this year to tap into his full potential. Agreed. Agreed. I think once he gets to middle linebacker, he'll be far, fairly decent over there. I think he's always going to have a little bit of struggles and coverage, but he brings a lot of good to the to the table as well. It's not all bad. It's not all good. It's just a little bit of a mixed bag. More good than bad. And it was Ryan Sandberg. Nice. My old memory's still holding up. Team 12 says hit the subscribe button and almost at 6,000. That's right, folks. If you're not subscribed, you might be the 6,000 subscriber right now if you hit that subscribe button. We are we're this close. I'm an inch away, man. Help us get over the top. Help us get there. And if you've already subscribed, then just hit the like button for me, okay? Helps out the channel considerably. Makes me show up on other uh, Seahawks fans looking for great Seahawks content, and I really appreciate it. Uh, Alexander Matthews, he's almost at uh, he is almost uh, he is almost at six thousand. Nice, ten k by summer. 
10K by summer is my goal, Alexander. I'm going hard this, this year. We're going to try to really push this up this year in a way we haven't before. So I'm going to be doing some uploads. I've been slow on that. I know that's going to drive a lot more. I'm going to be doing a couple little bits and skits and stuff. We're going to get this going, though. We're going to get this going. Tacman says, hit them likes harder than Alvin Kamara's jab. <laughs> Some solid Kamara jokes coming out, folks. You didn't even have some prep on this stuff. It's coming off the top of your head. I love it. Alexander Matthews, Brooks is solid. He is solid. And definitely not one of the problems on this team. Uh, Jackson Shore, my roommate's dad just got us a new TV for our dorm. Going to break it in for the Super Bowl. Ooh, nice. A lot of TVs being bought this week for the Super Bowl. It's the biggest time all year the TVs are bought. Randy McDaniel says, as a community, let's decide on a mid-level local media guy to target for the Hawks nest. The Hawks, uh, the Hawks blogger got Jacob Heaps. Let's decide one, uh, someone and then keep tweeting them. I'll have anybody on over here, man. Randall, you know, I have anybody on over here. So I, I'd love to have some folks on. I reached out a couple people here and there. I haven't heard anything back yet. So, you know, got some people hesitant a little bit here, but I probably should do a little bit more uh, being proactive in that respect too, Randall. I should. Um, Jackson Shore, Randy, but then we need a Hawk blogger, Hawk's Nest collab. I'll be down to do it with them, man. They do good stuff over there. Half Daddy, how did how bad did Russ look today? He struggled to get rid of the ball many times, underthrew a few balls. Ugh, he destroys the individual precious pass comp, but freezes up in a flag football game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there probably wasn't a lot of uh, intensity, you know, of, of competitiveness out there either. It's probably just going a little bit through the motions, but you never like it when your quarterback's throwing interceptions, right? It always sucks. Half Daddy says, Norb and Brando would be a dope collab also. I'd be down, man. I would be down. Like I said, I got to reach out on my end a little bit too. I got to be a little more proactive. I get a little lazy with it. Corwin Miller, do you guys ever feel that Pete continues to hire his buddies instead of looking around for real coaching talent? I think many of us feel that way, Corn. Like I said, you, you look at a lot, three of those last four hires have all been in-house. In-house. And my question to that is that you've got a landscape of coaches in the NCAA and NFL and hundreds, thousands of coaches, right? And what, your la the best candidates, your last three best candidates have all been in the building in Renton? Kind of hard to believe, isn't it? Kind of feels like you're not overturning turn over every rock, every stone. Uh, just looking like you're looking for a certain type of guy more than you're looking for the best guy for the job. Keldon, it's so awkward watching Pro Bowl players trying to not play, trying to play, trying not to play. Yeah, it is a little weird. You got their muscle memory built in where their initial instinct is to go hard, and they're like, oh, hold up, hold up. It's a tough sport, though, to do a Pro Bowl, too. Football is so dangerous as it is. I mean, hell, we had a guy who was a New England running back, who had a good first year, went to the Pro Bowl, played in some flag football thing in between the week on the, that was on the, in the sand and ended up, like, having a hellacious injury that ended up costing him his career, basically. And you don't want to see that. You, know, you definitely don't want to see that. Megan says, okay, 12, sorry for being so quiet, but I've said it before, I'm getting over a severe allergic reaction and I'm high on levels of antihistamines, which make me drowsy. I'm dozing off, so it's time to go. Well, no worries, Megan. Thank you for jumping on in the chat and I'll take care of yourself over there now. Uh, I, allergies are nothing to mess with. I'm, I get my share of allergies every year right at the change of seasons. And man, I just get, it just hits me upside my head. So hang in there, take, take care of yourself. Uh, Randall says, uh, Levi is okay. Uh, Levine's okay, but he's on TV. I bet we could get Luke Wilson, Bumpus or Lofa. I take any of those. I reached out to Lofa on Twitter. So we you guys should hit up Lofa, man. I saw him go on somebody else's show. that was like they had 12 years. Like, come on, Lofa, come over here. I mean, I can pump you up. He's got a, he's got a little podcast he does with another guy. So, um, hit Lofa up. Cause I would love to talk to Lofa. I've got some very pointed questions I'd like to ask him in regards to Carol and I think that he'd help to give us a little bit of a view behind the curtain, which is maybe why he's not responding. Um, Half Daddy, yeah, B. Wags is a first ballot Hall of Famer. B. Wags is our first ballot Hall of Famer. Yeah. He probably retires as a top five, top six, all-time middle linebacker in the sport. 
There's a little bit of people that will make a little bit of an argument to you about Zach Miller, uh, not Zach Miller, but Zach um, Thomas of the Dolphins, who put up more total tackles, but that's really the only place that he's better at Bobby Wagner than, and he had about four or five more years of play than Bobby's had so far to get those more tackle stats. So I, I don't think Zach Thomas is a very good comparison for Bobby. Uh, on top of the fact that Bobby's a Super Bowl winner, been to multiple Super Bowls, I don't think Zach Thomas went to one Super Bowl. So to me, Bobby Wagner's the first ballot, no doubt about it. Brando says, so let's start targeting Lofa on Twitter. Brando, your thoughts? Yeah, target him on Twitter, guys. Like I said, I reached out to him on DM on Twitter a couple weeks ago, actually, when some of this stuff was all percolating. So uh, yeah, hit him up. Hit him up, hit him up, hit him up. Get Lofa over here. I want to talk to him. I want to get into this. I want to get down to the nitty gritty. I ain't going to ask no softball questions though, y'all. I'm not going to ask anything that ain't going to, I am going to, I'm going to drive hard on it. You know, you guys know how I do with this. Jackson Shore, uh, Brandon, I'm wondering why we, we care if Russ wins Super Bowls with another team. If it happens, oh well, I would be petty and rude against him, but that's just me. Uh, I, no, it's not a matter of caring about Russell winning Super Bowls. It's a matter of, did you not have him winning Super Bowls here because you were hard, you not being you, Jackson, but that the front office was hard headed in their approach of not being willing to build around him in a way another team is being willing to build around him. And if you were just being that silly and stupid about it because you have some sort of base philosophy that doesn't allow you to deviate from it and, and be creative in your approach, then that's silly. And that's the part that I would draw, uh, you know, I, I would draw a little bit of, um, measure of frustration with. It's very hard to find franchise quarterbacks. You have a franchise quarterback. You're paying the money. You're paying the money because you've acknowledged the fact you understand he's a franchise quarterback. So then build the proper team around him to get the most out of him. Protect your most vital asset. And um, that's the place that they haven't gone at with. So it's not as much about him winning Super Bowls on our team that makes me bitter. It's about that you could have had him here winning those Super Bowls. And while he's winning those Super Bowls at another team, you're not winning Super Bowls. And, and it's really more of just that, for me, almost just kind of that simple a little bit. Coaxo 5 says, perfect offense. Armstead, Lewis, Kelsey, Jackson, Falele, Line. I uh, love it. Go Hawks. Uh, Russ at quarterback, Penny, running back, DK Lockett, Eskridge, wide receiver, Everett, and OJ Howard. Ooh, get me excited, Go Hawks. You get me excited on that one. I like that. I like that offseason. JT, rock out with your hawk out. Got to get some rest. Good night, Hawks family. Good night, JT. You have a great night of rest. And yeah, rock out with your hawk out. That's right. Uh, have yourself a great night. Jackson Shore, did you see DJ Reed tweet? Seems like a deal is in place. That does seem to be the case here. The eye emojis and the contract next to the eye emojis is undefeated. It means a deal's in place, no doubt. That's how these players talk now on Twitter. <laughs> That's how the young uns do it. Um, so it does seem like there is a deal in place and makes sense. Makes sense though that they'd keep him. They have a very they have a need, double need at cornerback this offseason, right? I mean, Trey Brown, you hope can come back and be a starter for you, but you have a little bit of a need there. So um getting that cemented before free agency makes a lot of sense with a guy in house who's played really good for you, who's earned that contract. Herberside says Lewis needs to go back to right guard. Yes, he does. I don't think he will, but he does. Goxo Vice says perfect defense. Taylor Dunlap, Edge, Akeem Hicks, and Puna. Defensive tackle Sam, uh, defensive tackle Sam Hassan Reddick, Will Barton, uh, Mike Brooks, um, safety Jamal Anthony Harris. Ooh, I like Anthony Harris. There go Hawks. I like that. That's creative. Cornerbacks Reed and Jones or Brown. I'm good with all that, man. Corwin Miller hammering, ham, hammering Hamlin was insane, man. Oh, he was. And it was in that era right before the NFL was legislating those kind of hits where it was going to be a flag. Hamlin would just kill guys. I mean, he was one of those guys like, did he just murder that man? I think he just killed that guy in the field. Didn't have a long period of time here. It was, it was a short little deal, but he burst onto the scene as a really good player. Um, the definition of a hitter. Just, a, just made to hit fools. And it was fun to watch. It was beautiful to witness. Tack man, are we cutting Gabe Jackson? I don't think so. I don't think so. My theory on this is that you're going to have to deal with the left tackle, the center, and the right tackle, and there's only so much you can address on a football team in a given offseason, um, especially when you have other holes to address. Uh, they could do it. It's a possibility. I'd love to see it. I just don't think it's going to happen. I think you get at least one more season of uh, Gabe Jackson here. 
Jackson Shore, I'm all in on Jamal for next year. The trade was bad, but people act like he's trash. Nope, dude will be great next year. I'm with you on it, man. He he used uh, he wasn't used in the proper fashion last year. Too often he was put in as a single high or as a cover two safety. That is not Jamal Adams' game, and the team would do much better to try to use him in the right way, to use him in a similar fashion to how the Jets used him, to use him in a similar fashion to what drove you in the first place to go put two first-round picks and a third-round pick on him, right? So I, I'm with you, man. I don't think he's trash, but they got to use him in the right fashion. Uh, WRPB says, have you looking, have you taken a look at Andrew Stuber? I have not taken a look at Andrew Stuber past. I think he was at the senior bowl and watching a few of his reps where he was holding up really good. Um, from the inside, I believe if I'm not mistaken on the name on that, I could be confusing him with somebody else. Um, I'm adding him to my list right now. So I will be taking a look at him. I, I think he's a center guard. I think he's a guard, but, uh, WRP, I will take a look at him. I'll have a breakdown for you on the next, uh, live stream. So he's on my list. Uh, Why Team 12 says, I saw something funny the other day. The Washington team's name should be the Republicans or Democrats based on who's in office. There we go. <laughs> I like it. Dak, man, I took, uh, uh, make Bobby the defensive coordinator, says Sean T. Could be worse than Ken Norton, right? Jackson Shore, is there any chance Gabe Jackson gets cut? Three million saves. Saved and Phil Haynes could be the left guard and move D. Lewis back to right guard. It's possible. It's possible. And $3 million is nothing to shake a stick at, but there is some dead money there on the, the books if you do move him. Um, and they have to address other positions on the line, which makes me think they'll just be like, we're fine there. It's good enough there. Tackman says, hire Jay Gruden as an assistant head coach. I don't mind cutting Collier and Jackson. Collier is going to get cut this offseason, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. I'm not sure on Jackson. Jackson George says, Kate Otten's a stud, and so is Gordon and McDuffie. No, I'm not biased. What are you talking about? Also, Jake Browning is the best you'd have quarterback of all time. Warren Moon knows it. <laughs> oh, JJ, uh, Collier needs to go like tomorrow. Collier's going to go. The only reason he wasn't cut this last offseason or this season, the reason prior to the season he wasn't cut, because he was inactive on a lot of the games this year, right? The only reason he wasn't cut was because he was going to cost more money to move off from him this season than it will be this next off season where uh, he's only, he's going to save us $1 million this off season to cut him. He would have cost you a couple million dollars to move him last off season because all the bonus money would have accelerated. Uh, Anime Thighs says, do you think Pete would try and make a move on Juju if he's cheap? Sure. Sure. Pete's got connections to USC. Maybe people told him that this kid's still really good. Give him a chance. Don't think Joe Juju's going to make a whole lot of money on the open market. Might even be in that one-year, $2 million kind of range, which there's some potential there, especially as you're slotting him in as your fourth, fifth guy. That's pretty nice to have. MR, uh, WRPB says, uh, who do you think is the best fit for the Seahawks out of Jordan Davis, Perion Winfrey, and Devontae Wyatt? Uh, Devontae Wyatt would be my best fit, WRP Beast. Uh, with Perion and Jordan Davis, you're getting a little bit of those in-betweeners, right? Not quite a one-tech, not quite a three-tech. What's his position? You already got those guys on the roster uh, as it stands right now in Brian Monet, um, Al Woods, Puna Ford. We're already kind of there with those. Um, Devontae Wyatt, I think, is the best pure three-tech defensive tackle in this draft. Uh, he has uh, awesome moves insanely quick off the snap. Um, essentially, you know, what you draft, the way you draft it up for um, three tech defensive tackles and their build and, and the, the win, their natural ability to win with leverage, uh, great hand usage, um, quickness. He's got all that. He's got it all. Um, there's not a lot of holes, in my opinion, in Devontae Wyatt's game in that respect. And he would improve your pass rush from the inside tremendously. Uh, I like Perry on Winfrey. A little bit of Perry on Winfrey is a little bit of the projection. Played a lot of played only really significantly one tech in in college, but you're looking at him as a three tech at the pro level. Uh, Jordan Davis is freakish, probably the highest upside of all three of those players, but also the guy that could be left as a, a little bit of a man without a position. Uh, um, 
impact is nullified because he just isn't one or the other necessarily. Not a pure one, not a pure three. Um, but absolutely the freakish size that he brings, the mobility he brings, you just don't, those don't fall off the truck every other day. But why it's the cleanest one, the easiest one to pick of those three, from my opinion, because he's that pure three tech. Seahawks Gaming, this free agency and draft class is full of pass rushers. We better come out with at least two. I'd expect us to come out with a couple of them, especially later in the draft. They'll be, they'll be looking. Randall says, I was thinking about Juju. Think he's a distraction. Maybe. Probably been humbled a little bit over the last couple of years. Not quite on that star ascent he was early on. Herbert says, I agree, Jackson. Uh, I agree, Jackson. Gabe was not a step over Lewis. Step up over Lewis. No, Gabe wasn't a step up over Lewis. And, um, you know, I, I didn't like seeing them make that move when they made it because you're, you're, you're now going to take a step backwards at right guard, and now you're also taking a step back at left guard, uh, which uh, under the auspice that you're improving the position overall, which you weren't. Uh, it wasn't a great move. I'm not a big fan of Jackson, but I don't know that they're going to really address Jackson because of the worries that are out there. Uh, Tackman says, I always like Haynes ever since his days at Wake Forest. Me too, Tackman. I don't know what's been able to, what's been holding him off the field at times, especially if you've had times they've had bad guard play. I mean, there was a game this year that you put Jake Curry in at left guard rather than elevating Phil Haynes off the practice squad to be your starter in that game. And then when Phil Haynes plays in the back half of the year here for a couple games at left guard, he's great. One of our highest rated defenders in them, all those games he played at left guard. I, I don't get it either. It's kind of strange in how they've, they've approached Haynes. Very odd. Sometimes you just get in Carol's doghouse, I think, and you get stuck. Jackson Shore says, I'll take Juju if he deletes his TikTok. Ban TikTok. <laughs> Tagman says, I'm shocked the Pats haven't released Ninkiel Henry. Me too. Ninkiel Harry, sorry. They, they keep trying to get something out of that. Blood, of, blood from a turnip. How's the saying go? Herbert says, I'm not a fan of coaches playing dudes out of their preferred positions. I'm not either. It's one of the places the Seahawks have have taken a mistake at recently over and over again, and the results always seem to be like this, which makes me wonder why they keep choosing to do it. Anime Thighs, Juju is just dancing. I don't think that's a distraction. He already knows not to do it on the logos. Hopefully not. Hopefully he's learned that lesson. Random McDaniel, I wonder why Nkeel Harry has struggled so much. Change of scenery may do him good. He struck me as less of the, I, I, sometimes it's a bad fit going to certain places, you know, and, and to me, Henry, Harry wasn't a pure route runner, right? Like he's, he would have like a Brandon Ayuk going to the, the Patriots would have made sense. Harry going to the Patriots didn't make a lot of sense. Harry was a, um, you know, a trust ball throw, throw it up to him, let him just kind of run his routes out there as he runs them and he'll find a way to get open and then throw him the ball. You know, like secondary route stuff was, was big with him in Arizona state. He wasn't just, he just wasn't what, Patriots really like those pure route runners. You know, it's five steps and you make your cut and make sure you're making that step, that cut precisely at that five steps. No, no wasted motion. Um, has that necessarily the greatest quarterback play though. Mac Jones was better this year. Um, the, Tom Brady was there, I guess for a year, but he was still kind of a rookie at that point. Just isn't developed. Some guys don't in that respect, you know, but I'm surprised by that one, Randall. That's a miss for me. I thought Harry would be a lot better than he has. And maybe there is still a little bit to your point of uh, potential there. Yeah, Jackson, I'm surprised on Nikki Harry. I thought he'd be better coming out too. Very lazy route runner, JJ, you're right. Floater and lazy route runners are a way to put it. Just hasn't tapped in the same way. Boy, he was a beast in college. And I thought, I thought he'd be a good fit with Russell with some of his ability to go up and get the ball up over the top of defenders where Russell could throw those trust balls to him and put it in a precise place and Harry could go up and do something with it, but he just hasn't gotten into it. Adele Williams says, if I see a Hawks player do the gritty, I'm going to throw popcorn at him. <laughs> Tech man says, Jalen Waddle has the best touchdown versus the celebration. I haven't seen this. I got to check it out. Jackson Shore, I was wondering why did we release Percy. I remember being surprised by it and the reports were he was a locker room cancer. And is that true? Uh, well, first off, we didn't release Percy Arvin. We traded him for a fifth round pick to the New York Jets. Uh, secondly, yes, he was as a locker room cancer. He was a problem in the locker room. He was a problem in the locker room with Minnesota, a problem in the locker room here. Um, there is, of course, there's the story out there, Jackson of Super Bowl week, literally gets in a fist fight with Golden Tate. Um, he hits, hits Golden Tate in the face and supposedly dropped him on his head. 
I don't know if those reports are true or not, but that's what we've heard about it. Um, just had some problems, man. He had some problems. And he's, he's talked about himself, but not the easiest person to deal with. But he also came out of that Florida program that seemed to really build up a lot of egos and a lot of, a lot of diva mentalities coming up out of there. Jackson Shore says, my brother told me Fortnite is the greatest video game of all time. We are failing this generation. I don't know. I like Fortnite, though, so I might agree with your brother a little bit. I don't think it's the greatest game of all time, but I like what they've done as far as the video game market sucks right now. And they're one of the few places out there actually pushing things that are new and interesting. Everything else is just lame and old. Got some Mario Brothers love. Little radiant historia love. Okay. Uh, Jackson says when Pete does leave, a lot of this fan base will probably hope they at least acknowledge how much he did. Hey, I, he'll be revered here. He'll be loved here for all time. He brought us the Super Bowl championship, no doubt about it. I mean, I can separate the two. I can appreciate him while still being uh, tough on him. Chris Snape says, "Don't resign Everett. Save seven million and give Parkinson the ball." Well, you still do need another safe. Tight end from somewhere, right, Chris? Because you only got Parkinson on the roster. Disley's also a free agent. Ethan says, I believe Red Dead Redemption 2 is one of the best video games on this generation, or at least what we're talking about consoles. I, I hear it's a good one. And I mean, that, that's fine. When I'm talking about two, you got to kind of separate them between first player, I think, and two player games. Uh, Attack Man says, I'd rather pay Will Disley three years for $8 million. Makes sense. Makes sense. Jackson Shore was, uh, was about to say if Eddie probably deserved that punch. <laughs> probably did. <laughs> probably did. <laughs> Jackson Shore, my mission is to get, on the Sam, is to get you on the Sam Howell type uh, hype train by the end of the summer. You will be on the hype train with me. I, I, you can try to get, bring me over there, man. I watched a lot of his tape. He's got some good attributes to him. As he showed in the Senior Bowl, he's got, he's got some mobility that's a little underrated in his game. He's got this thing that he does where he, he engages the mechanism on his deep throw. And it's like there's this little bit of wind-up hitch to his deep balls. And it's like when he throws the ball deep, everything's got to be perfect, perfectly mechanically for him to get the ball out. And when, he, when it's, it is and it's good, he can get it out with some authority and some pop. When it isn't, it sails, it drifts, it holds up in the air. Um, it can be a little ducky. But that, that little, he's got this little mechanism gear, that, this wind-up mechanism gear that just bothers me. Uh, there's just something about it. I don't know what it is. Just something it just I don't, I don't like. In tech world, oh my God, Peacemaker is sensational. Do what Paul said. Treat yourself. <laughs> I will, you guys, for sure. Seahawks Gaming, thoughts on Jermaine Johnson? He has the boomer bust potential. Could be Micah Parsons or could be Clavion Chason. Well, the, the jury's still out on Clavion. He's a young guy. Remember, he's 20 years old coming to the league, though he's not been good. Um, Jermaine Johnson may be the best behind, behind Aiden Hutchinson, uh, David Ogujubo, Ogujubo. I can't pronounce the guy's name. I'm calling him the David guy from Michigan from now on. That's where it is. That's where it's that's at. I'm not going past that. Um, past him, past Kayvon Thibodeau, you probably can make the call that Jermaine Johnson's probably the next best pass rusher available on the board at that point. He's all pass rush. He does want, he wants nothing to do with stopping the run. So to me, he's a rot rotational pass rusher in this league. Um, at that point, is he top 15 worthy? Not really. Now I'll say this. He's a really good pass rusher. He's further along than Clavon chase on was. So further along as far as his pass rush ability, his moves. Clavon did a lot of his work on stunts. Coming out of college, he got a lot of his sacks off stunts. This guy can get, get it done traditionally. Um, very good player. Very good player in that respect. But again, he does kind of just one thing and doesn't do another thing. What's the value in that? And should you put a top 15 pick on that? I don't think so. But then again, probably doesn't go past like 20 with that skill set. You know, being the fourth best pass rusher. The fourth best pass rusher in any given draft probably doesn't get past the top 20 picks. 
because pass rusher is valued as it is. But it does bother me when it's that difference of a want and ability on that, you know. Just having that guy just being able to do that does limit him to me just a little bit. Jack and Shore, it's so good. John Cena is my childhood. <laughs> nice. Zao Zero, fun fact. In 1946, the Seahawks were in Miami as the Miami Seahawks. Only lasted a year, but imagine them never folding. Being called the Miami Seahawks. Thoughts. <laughs> Weird. I didn't know there was any Osprey in uh, Miami or, or Florida for that matter. Um, would have been weird. A little weird there. I guess we would be like the Seattle Evergreens or something at this point, right? Um, Dolphins kind of fit. Though I will say with, with Miami and the Dolphins, like you do need to choose a, when you choose a, you know, a team or whatever, a mascot or whatever, you do kind of want it to be a ferocious animal, right? And you go Dolphins, it just doesn't strike a lot of fear in the heart. Like the Cardinals. You're just not striking a lot of fear in your opposition's heart with that, you know? There's nothing, there's nothing in it that's like, oh, we're going to play the Nerf balls? Okay. That's what it, that's what it little, comes off sounding as a little bit to me. But uh, I'm glad we got to keep our Seahawks. It fits for our team. It's very phonetic. Alliteration. However you say that word. Jackson, did you see Malik McDowell got arrested again? Dude can't get out of his own way. What a waste of talent. Yeah. Got up in a, like a playground or something, buck naked. Cocaine's a hell of a drug. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Jackson Shore, it's bull crap. The Niners got those picks, but in 2020, we're the only team with zero vid cases. And remember, the Titans had two to forfeit a third, and we didn't get it. It's good in that respect, we didn't. Jackson, I'm just worried about this division, man. It's not getting any easier going forward, that's for sure. Paul Third says, Come on, Brando. San Francisco isn't getting gifted picks. It's unfortunate, but true Pete Carroll's coaching family tree is more bush without a lot of diversity. They need to bring back some ex players for coach spots. Well, now that I know this rule exists, Paul, I'm I'm going all minority hires going forward, and this has got to factor into the minority hiring, right? So, uh, I mean, hell, we've we've had Gus Bradley be I think become a head coach leaving Carroll. We've had Dan Quinn leave a coach, so it's like they they do go on to be coaches outside of his tree, but uh, yeah. We got to get a little, got to, got, to, got to tap into this, man. This is a resource, Paul. This is a big resource. Uh, Shervin's SVSFO. Thank you for the $1 donation. Appreciate you, Shervin's. You're awesome. Awesome, my man. Um, Jackson says, would you rather take a blindside hit from Aaron Donald or take a 10-hour car ride with Russ? 10-hour car ride with Russ. Aaron Donald's a psychopath. Aaron Donald's got a lot of mean intentions. And after he hits me, he's probably going to try to strangle me. So I, I'll, just, I'll just put in some earplugs and just shake my head at Russ for 10 hours. Plus, maybe I can talk Russ into a few things during that time. <laughs> Brian Koski, the NFLPA needs to review their players' pension plan again. There are so many devastating, uh, debilitating injuries that players have to go through. Eric Dickerson is 61. He can't sleep either. Um, yep. I, I think, uh, definitely the NFLPA could definitely stand to, to help out a little bit in that respect. Um, some of this is that they could just force the players hands, I think, by taking a little bit more money off them off the front end that gets easily spent every other different direction and actually then, um, get it, get it more applied to having that pension program in place. I agree with you. I do think that it has to come from the NFLPA and that they've got to, rather than asking the owners to give up more, more ground, they themselves need to ask it from the players. And, and it almost to be something that they do for the players that's for the player benefit, even if the players sort of are kicking and screaming in the moment of doing it, because the players don't understand where they're going to be at at age 50 or at age 60. So I, I think it's, it's smart. Uh, Tag Man says, Hal is, Hal is a stud, but his O-line was pure trash. That part I do agree with. We did fight through a bad offensive line this year. They were a tiny bit better the previous year, but he did fight through it big time this year. Prath Rob, what happened to Alvin Kamara? Heard he got arrested. Yeah, it looks like he probably got in a fight in the club, Prath. That seems to be what the, the case is. Got in a fight, and he, he obviously can throw hands because somebody seems to have been uh, battered enough that they had to be in the hospital to where the cops had to visit him in the hospital, which is what uh, drove, which would, which would cause the uh, arrest warrant. Herbicide says, I'd rather take the hit from Donald. I don't know, man. 
Donald arrives with mean intentions. Ethan, 10 hour car read, I think that would be fun as long as Russ isn't continuously doing the religious stuff like he does on Twitter, if you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, our Arcanothorosaurus, I believe that Miami Seahawks were the All American Football League, which lasted four seasons, and all four championships were won by the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> nice. Oh, man. Miami can't even win when they take our name. JJ, uh, they should scrap the Pro Bowl and keep the All-Pro selections. Just have the athletes play another sport like a uh, basketball game, baseball game, soccer game, etc. Something light and fun. Keep the football skills challenge if you want. I agree with you, JJ. It doesn't do anything for me. The Pro Bowl hasn't done, any, do, hasn't done anything for me for, I don't think, ever. Even in its heyday of the 80s and 90s, it wasn't really... You watched it. It was an event, but it was like, there's just nothing else on football. It's February. You know what I mean? So he's just... You, you put it on, but it wasn't because it was like much watch TV. Uh, in tech world, Brandon, I can't stand this lockout, man. It's making my stomach turn. I need to know that the current most exciting up and coming Seattle team will have a season. Please end. No guarantees on this one, Ethan, and I can't give you a, a silver lining on this one. It's getting closer and closer to that time and neither side is giving an inch. Instead, both sides seem to be digging in. And we need to look no further than, what, 90, 96, 97, when our Mariners were doing pretty good that year. Griffey was on an epic pace, and they just shut the whole year down. No World Series. So if they were willing to do it once, they could be willing to do it once again. Uh, Paul Third says, how do you think the QB landscape changes this offseason? I think the Bucs are going to trade for Carr. McDaniels will trade for his old pal, Jimmy G. Uh, Broncos get Rodgers, and Steelers get Deshaun Watson. All right, Paul, let's, 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 play, this. let's play this game a little bit. I'm going to give you some different looks on this, okay? And I actually feel kind of good about them. All right, so first I think Carr remains in Las Vegas. I think that Aaron Rodgers ends up in San Francisco. I think Deshaun Watson ends up in Pittsburgh because they already have a little bit of a willingness there to deal with rapists. Oh, wait, did I say that? Allegedly. <laughs> uh, the Broncos. The Broncos end up trading for Kirk Cousins. How you like that, Paul? How you like that for some bold takes? And you got Russ staying in Seattle? All right, I'll ride with you that. I'll ride with you on that. I think, again, Russ either stays in Seattle or ends up in New York or Philadelphia. Go Oxo 5, can we get a 30 for 30 on the 08 Florida Gators? They had a convicted murderer, multiple criminals, Tons of NFL stars led by Urban Meyer and Tim Tebow. And Tebow has that odd, odd duck in the, in the crew of guys that were just a little hard, right? They rode life just a little bit on the rugged side. And then you got Tebow there as the devout Christian. Um, and Urban Meyer at the center of it all. There's going to have to be a 30 for 30 on him at some point. You know, there'll have to be. Um, and Urban, part of why I was a little bit down on him with going to Jacksonville as I was, is the guy's a little overrated as a coach in my opinion over the course of his career, just by a tiny, tiny little bit. But that Florida team had some, it had some people on it, didn't it? It had some dudes. The, the, uh, the what, Hernandez brothers on the line, Percy, um, not the Hernandez brothers, Hernandez on, yeah, the, it was uh, Aaron Hernandez and then the other guys. What were the other two guys? The, the center and the, the other guys. Pouncey, the Pouncey twins. Yeah, they had some dudes there. There's, good, there's some wild stories there. Herbicide, if we don't address the O-line, I won't blame Russ for leaving. Nor would I. Nor would I. I can't, I can't hate on that. Lolo, keep Everett. He's perfect for a fast-paced offense, which we are, we're supposed, we're quote-unquote supposed to be. Disley, I'm fine with letting go. Parkinson's big and has decent hands from what we've seen. I'm in favor of bringing back Everett at a good, good rate, right? I, I don't want to pay him a lot of money, but I think that he does add something to this uh, team that we don't have. I, Parkinson's not going to give you any yak ability after the catch. And a lot of this offense is based on getting the ball in the receiver's hands early and letting them go and make some yak yardage up the field, which is absolutely Everett's game. 
Uh, what is the cost? What is he worth? What is the price we're willing to pay? That's that's the good debate to go on right now, Lolo. But the three guys that I looked at this offseason, that we four guys that I looked at is four guys I'd actually look to retain on this team at a price is Rashad Penny, Everett, DJ Reed, and Sidney Jones. Those are my four guys that I would put as retainers. Go Oxo 5, not to mention Ryan Lochte was on the campus that year. <laughs> wow, that was a wild bunch. Uh there must be a LLB as well, Jackson. Sure, you better believe there must be. Shervin says, what do you think about my guy, Veron McKinley? Oh, my gosh. I have not. Uh, I'm so sorry. Man, you guys are ahead of me on these names. You're ahead of me on these names. So I'm so sorry, Ver- Shervin. But um, I have not looked at him. But what I'm doing right now is writing down both the two names you're mentioning. Mikel... Mikel Wright, all right, Veron McKinley and Mikel Wright. I will look at both those guys, and Shervin's by my next stream. I will have a breakdown ready for you on those. So I'm grinding on tape, man. I am grinding hard. Um, As I like to say, Shervin's, I go through a lot of the tape, so I don't just do the highlights. I really do try to go in and look at their game film uh, and as many snaps as I can get for each of these guys to give you guys a real true read on what they are. Um, But I will take a look at both those guys. I've got a nice little list here of uh, folks that have been mentioned here on this uh, stream. So we'll... We will take a look at all these and hopefully have you a nice little breakdown on the next stream for you on those. But great suggestions. Thank you, Shervins. Sorry, I don't have a off the, off the top of my head uh, view on them. Go Ox 5 Hurt better be a head coach. Hopefully so. Uh, Ethan Techworld, I drafted Mikhail Wright in Madden. Got him to an 84 overall. That means he's good. Nice. Nice. I'll take a look at him. Uh, TJ Zing, I hate being indifferent for who I want to win the Super Bowl. I hate the Rams, but they have so many deserving players. Stafford, Ramsey, Cup, Hecker, Havistein, Whitworth, Beckham, Akers. They got some great players, TJ. It is. I do go solidly with Cincinnati because I just have a hate in my heart for the Rams as, in general and being LA team and all that. But um, as well as I got I got a root for a team like Cincinnati. That's been a fan base that's, that's had to had to hear be the butt of jokes, be talked about as the worst of the worst for years and years and years and years. Um, them to go get a Super Bowl win would feel pretty good. That'd feel pretty good on that. Uh, Sherman says he was a Thorpe finalist, being uh, uh, Mc- Mikel Wright over Ryan McKinley. Uh, led the league in Nation 90s. Well, we're, you're smart to have me look at him, Shervins, right? We want to get some more guys that can take the ball away. So uh, it's good, good you're looking at that type of guy. That's where this defense does need to improve. Jackson Shore says, I hope we have a season... The Mariners were named the number one farm system in baseball for the first time ever. We're doing it the right way. That's why I'm hopeful. Uh, I'm hopeful with you, Jackson. I'm with you on this. I, I would love to see a team, this team play this year. I'm, I'm thinking that they're going to be a good team. I, hopefully they're going to be a good team. Um, they've got a lot to work with, and they've still got some money to spend. They still probably can sign a couple of these guys once the lockout ends to round this team out and make them a contender. Uh, hopefully we do see get to see a season this year. But again, when, when you see these two parties dug in like this, there's no guarantees. Go Hawks 05, we really need to fill our holes in free agency so we can go into best player available in the draft. I'm talking Falele, Winfrey, and other guys like that. Agreed. Uh, that's been a place that I think that we've been, this is, one of the way, this is one of the reasons why I think that we've been missing this way in the past is we've gone for players that are need. You know, oh, we need need this guy. We need LJ Collier because we need pass rush. And you end up drafting for need and you overreach on guys. I think when you get to picking for best player available, to your point, it's done on the back of having accomplished what needed to be accomplished in free agency as far as rounding out your roster and turning the draft into more of a bonus. And that leads you more into the realm, in my opinion, of um, picking for best player available. 100% agree with you on that. Uh Sherman says, I'm, uh, I'm praying for Joe Burrow, man. His O-line might get him killed next week. Yeah, he might, he might tear two ACLs on the same play uh, with the way that that line blocks. And Burrow has had one of the great years at the quarterback position this season, really, and, and, and not just on the throws he makes and on what he gets done as far as being prolific in his production, but in the fact that he's getting it all done while getting hammered every bit as much as Russell Wilson was getting hammered, if not more so this year, behind that line. It has been amazing to see that guy be able to still withstand that. Coming on the year where he tore an ACL, you'd expect him to be jumpy, to be fearful. Nope. Nope. Plays absolutely fearless. And uh, he's legitimately going to be one of the better quarterbacks going forward for, for the next probably 10 years. 
He's awesome. Lolo, I mean, uh, people have come to the conclusion that Russ had a hard time seeing over his offensive line. I imagine it's worse for Murray. What's weird is they're both known for being mobile quarterbacks who move out of pocket. Uh, probably is a little bit worse for Murray. I think he is a good inch shorter than Russell even is. Um, though I will say that the Cardinals at times are a lot more proficient in their short and intermediate passing attack than we've been with Russell. Some of that is that them they use a little more of the spread concepts than what we use. Um, some of it's just that they've been better at it. Um, but I think it's still short quarterbacks struggle to look over the line, and it's going to affect them. It is going to hurt them in certain respects. Do they have plus skills on the other side of the on the other side of the column to overcome that? Are they good enough plus skills? Are they are they lethal enough with their legs? Do they have a big enough arm that then those those detriments those deficiencies aren't as big. Uh, Sean T, go Hawks. Thanks, Brandon, for the outlet. Oh, man, I love doing this, Sean. So thanks for watching, brother. I appreciate you. Uh, Dante King says, I hope we draft Alex Lindstrom in the second round. Well, I'll show you this, Alex. I went over and did a uh, mock draft over at the SBN over there, which you can look up online. Just do a Google search. You'll probably like look at my first mock draft. Completely unrealistic, Dante. I'm putting it over the screen right now. You can see completely unrealistic. But if we got this draft, I would love it. And in my draft, I have Alex Lindstrom being taken there in the uh, fourth round. So, uh, yeah, I got our left tackle of the future. I got our uh, right tackle of the future. And I got our center of the future. All in the first three rounds, you know, no biggie. No biggie. But I like Lindstrom a lot. He's a solid, solid center. Solid center. Pretty clean prospect. Uh, Immortal EO Technique says Seahawks have more deserving players. Deserving. Uh, Herbicide says, I'm tired now. You guys have a wonderful night. Paul Third says, I think the Raiders know they are rebuilding after Gruden and Bucks still have the bones of a Super Bowl team and they aren't in the same conference. So that trade makes sense. Could happen. Could happen. I, I could see definitely uh, Arians liking, um, liking Carr, liking his game. So I could see it as a possibility and, and look, new coaches, especially offensive minded coaches are going to tend to want their guy at the quarterback position, at least the guy they get to choose as opposed to what they've inherited. Um, McDaniels has indicated here initially that they do want to hold on to Carr. Obviously that can change on a dime. There's no guarantees with that, but that has been his initial, um, you know, that has been his initial thrust. Um, and Carr technically from a skill set angle would fit into that offense. Lolo says, Joe Burrow has been hit like 70 times this season. He's got to be sore and under painkillers. It's definitely an, an add on to that, what he had last year too, right? And I think he's, he's definitely a little unfazed right now. I will say the Bengals continue to do this with them. They're going to get the guy skittish and he's eventually going to see ghosts. You can only do this for so long with the quarterback getting him hit this much. But imagine how good he's going to be when he's not getting hit this much. Uh, Paul Third, I was thinking the same thing about Watson. Steelers don't care about off-field issues. Green Bay will never send Rodgers to San Francisco after those playoff losses. He will go to the AFC, and Denver has the most weapons. Denver certainly seems like the front runner, Paul, and this is just my bold take on this with the 49ers. The 49ers did call Green Bay last year to inquire about Rodgers' availability, so there was some interest from their standpoint of it. I don't think that the, the Packers are going to look at the situation of um, we're moving Rodgers to the 49ers and now he's still within the conference and he's going to come back and beat us. I don't think the Packers look at their team, look at the fact they'll be losing Devontae Adams, losing a couple wide receivers, losing um, their tight end, losing Zadarius Smith. I don't think that losing their, uh, their, their linebacker Campbell, I don't think they're going to look at that and they're going to say, oh, we're a contender next year with Jordan Love. I think that they're going to look at it as we're now in more of a rebuild state with Rodgers gone and moving on. And if that's the case, then does it matter as much where he goes, especially understanding that Rodgers is not going to be playing at a high level or even playing in the NFL when the Packers get back to being a contending team. And Watson, the Steelers, just, that's been one of those ones to me just feels like it makes some sense. Charles Riley is in the house. What is up, Charles Riley? Good to see you, brother. I salute you as always, sir. And thank you for the $5 donation. He says, if they do a three-headed monster on defensive coordinator, I hope it's a two-to-one vote on scheme. Reminds me of when Tony La Russa tried the three-starting pitcher experiment. <laughs> yeah, he did do that at one point, didn't he? Uh, I'm good with that. Though what, where, how much does Carol's vote count for, Charles? You know, you got Sean Desai, you got Hurt, you got Donatel, but then now they got a vote. What happens when Carol comes in and he adds in the extra vote and it's 2v2? 
What about that? Because you know Carroll gets a vote. You know he gets a vote. You know he gets a vote. Uh, Tac Man Clan Killer says, this stream is off the chain. Thank you, Tac Man. I appreciate you, brother. Thanks for watching. I'm glad you like, man. I love doing this, man. This is my favorite thing in the world to do. So, uh, Shervin uh, says, who's your edge in the draft, Shervin? Who's my edge one in the draft? It, it's Aiden. Aiden Hudgens is my edge one. And David Ogajabobi, Ogajagogi, he might be my uh, edge too, actually. He might actually have me, I, I've got more tape to watch between the three of the guys. Uh, Thibodeau might be my three. And then I got Jennings as my number four. Jennings is four, and then... Yeah. And then I got to look at more guys beyond that. A lot of inside-outside guys in this. Maybe DeMarvin Leal would be my edge, would be my five. He might be up ahead of Jennings because he's more of a complete player, even though Jennings is a better pass rusher. So it would probably be... It'd probably be a little more of, uh, you know, Leal over the top of him. Those would be my top five guys. But then I got I to gotta go deeper after that. Zachary Carter's pretty nice. More of a second-round guy, though. Uh, Immortal EOT Technique says, Joe Burrow proves you don't need a good line. Uh, I don't know. Is, it, is, this, is this proof of a rule, or is this more of an outlier to the rule? And I think that what we tend to see with this immortal is that when you don't have a quarterback getting the hell beat out of him, it doesn't tend to be good for your offense, your team, or for the quarterback long term. Um, I, I think that it's they're getting away with it more than they're. This is the this is the path. I think you if you're going to get a young quarterback, get him a great line in front of him, protect the kid, don't have him start to develop bad habits like falling off of his back foot because he's getting drilled every other snap. Um, they're getting some returns off it. They've, they, they played with fire and they haven't gotten burned this year, but it burned them last year, right? They lost the whole season, half a season of Burrow last year. Cause you didn't have him pass protected. Good chance that that ends up happening again. Tech man clan killer says Corey Littleton regrets leaving LA. Probably. I guess so. Uh, why do I long time? No, see my man. What's up? Why do I good to see you, buddy? Rough season, but very hopeful for next year. Well, I am as well. Why do I? I'm a, I'm a little skeptical. I'm a little pessimistic in regards to next season. But that doesn't mean that they don't have the ability to go out there and fix things. That if they don't, if they don't just maybe start to apply a little bit of a solid approach, that, um, that they can turn things around. So I'm still hopeful. Paul Third, it won't matter where they send Jimmy G. He will be a bridge quarterback, and McDaniels will want someone who knows the Patriot offense. It makes sense. It would make sense to me, Paul. I, I, it's not out. It's not insane. It completely could be a, a, a way he goes. Um, and it's probably the best type of quarterback who would know his system that would work there. I also think McDaniels maybe isn't as much of pressure to land there and instantaneously take that team off uh, to winning status that he might be given a little bit more time to develop things around there, which might be less of a push to need to find the top end bridge guy and just roll with Carr. Because again, the, to get Jimmy G, you are going to have to trade for him. He's not just a free agent. First, you already have Carr on your roster as it is. You know, does he want Jimmy G that bad to trade for him and then move Carr? Maybe, maybe. Lolo says, it surprised me that we have two quarterbacks throw for 5,000 yards this season. Brady, Herbert, and no one has talked about it. Well, I think a little bit of it, Lolo, is a little bit of people acknowledging that the extra game helped them right? That definitely helps you pu push you a little bit over the top in that respect of things as far as the yards go. But it's more of a commonplace now to hit the 5,000 yard mark. And so just less, less spoken about, but Brady to do it at the age that he did it with, with some of the wide receiver help as, as down as it was this year for him. Very impressive, very impressive by Brady to pull that off. You got to give him props in that respect. Big props. Um, uh, Shervin says, which receivers do you like in this draft? Uh, so Shervin's the way I take the draft approach is this. I'm looking at the draft 
completely through the lens of what Seattle's going to look to target and who are likely players that they're going to pick up, what positions they're likely to go look at. So you have a need at three tech, you have a need at running back, you have a need across the board on the offensive line, you have a need at free safety, you have a need at cornerback. When I look at wide receiver, it's not a need. So I'm going to get around to the wide receiver, Shervin, but they tend to be on the back end of my, like I, there's so many names to already get through on all these other positions of need. They're going to be one of the last ones I kind of get into to really dive into too much because I don't think the Seahawks are going to be drafting a wide receiver and certainly not going to be drafting a wide receiver high. You're already three deep. You just put a second round pick last year on D. Uh, D. Eskridge. Um, you've got four or five guys in the roster that they maybe feel okay about. Say nothing if they go get a veteran receiver to add to the mix. That'd be good enough as a group, I think, at that point. Um, I will get to the receivers. I will end up taking a look at them. There's some really nice names I'm getting, I've got on my list to take a look at, but I'm not going to lie. They'll be kind of one of the last positions I take a look at, um, a lot like middle linebacker, right? I'm not going to look at little middle linebacker this offseason with these guys very much because it's not a very good chance we're going to end up drafting them. You know, I want to look at guys that for sure I'm going to be able to know who they are and what they are the moment they become Seattle Seahawks. But sorry, I don't have a name for you on that, Shervin, right, right out the gate. I will look a little bit in. I'll give you a little, I'll give you a once, once over glance this week at a couple of them. Maybe just check out a couple highlight tapes. Uh, Immortal Technique, Murray is trash. Don't compare him to Champ Russ. No, he's not. He's not as good as Russ. Nowhere near as good as Russ. Um, I'm just comparing him as far as undersized quarterbacks and throwing behind bigger lines and the limitations that that sometimes leads to. Tac Man Clan Killer, what's the ceiling for Desmond Ritter? I actually think he has a rel- I think he has a pretty good high ceiling. Actually, um, I think he's one of the more underrated quarterbacks in this draft. Um, Carson Strong gets a lot of the talk. Pickett gets a lot of the talk. Malik Willis gets a lot of the talk. Part of me feels like Desmond Ritter should kind of be in that same, somewhat of the same discussion. I, I like his throwing motion. I like his uh, mobility. Um, he, he's got some power to his arm. He can make, I think, pretty much all the throws. Um, I like Desmond Ritter quite a bit. I do think there's a little bit of roughness to him. He's not always consistent in his delivery. Um, but when he's on, it looks really good. And uh, I, I'm pretty high on him. I, I, think he should, I think he should be taking the second round. He might dip into the third round. But again, I don't think that there's a huge talent difference between him and Sam Howell. And I, all those guys kind of fall very close together for different reasons and in, in where, where their upside lies. Um, if you're looking for a pro comparison for Desmond... Oh, that'd be a good question. Who'd be a good, be a good pro comparison? <laughs> God, he's so so long and big too. He's kind of a. Hmm. You think about that. I got to think about who Desmond Ritter would be a, who'd be a comp. Somebody, nobody's dry, nobody's jumping out of my mind right now for some reason. I got to think about it, but I like him. I think he could be a, I don't know if he could be a pro bowl guy, but he could be an upper level guy. He could be in a Kirk Cousins type range as a, as a top ceiling point tack. He doesn't have Cousins deep ball, but he's got more mobility than Cousins. Um, I think he's got that kind of that kind of upside to him. Drunk Squitter says, hopefully Trey Brown can come back and play lights out. I hope so. I don't think you can count on him as cornerback one per se, because as we've seen in the past, ligament surgeries are dicey. Coming back from lower leg, major lower leg injuries is dicey. And if you end up counting on that, that guy ended up sustaining some small tissue, you know, soft tissue injuries, pulled hamstring, pulled calf strain, end up missing half the season, and you end up really lean at the cornerback position because you're counting on a guy you probably shouldn't have been counting on wholly. Uh, I, I still want him in on the mix as a starter, want him on the mix for that competition, but uh, I also know we need to stack a little bit deeper past him. We can't just go DJ Reed and ride with Trey Brown and call it a day. But I like Trey Brown. He was awesome last year drunk. Dante King says, I like that we are adding Ed Donatel. It seems like we are sort of going to a cover two scheme. A little bit. Donatel as well with Fangio does a lot of the split safety looks to Dante, where the safeties will, will basically the, the safeties become um, ubiquitous. The free safety and strong safety designation falls away, and they basically just become safeties. And they do different things each snap. And uh, I like that. It makes it a little bit harder to know what's coming. 
Uh, all, somebody mentioned on the stream about maybe doing a video breakdown on what he adds to the secondary and the kind of coverage schemes that he brings. And I will go ahead and maybe do a little bit of a breakdown on that because I think it would help inform us on that. Uh, but Donatello's a good hire. Donatello's a good hire. He knows his stuff. He knows how to coach a secondary. Ian Deckwell, I recently watched Shutter Island for the first time. Whoa, talk about bizarre. Had a great time with it. It's a good movie. It's a good movie. Uh, Scorsese and uh, Leo are a pretty good combination. Tackman says, as long as they don't put Brooks and Dunlap in coverage. Yeah, please just don't do that. Let's learn that lesson. It's been talked about so much by the fan base at this point. It, it's almost a meme. I can't imagine they would do it. TJ says, the Rams are going to be elite for a few years. The Bengals, not so much. I don't know, TJ. I don't know that they are going to be elite. They're, they're, they're running into a really weird cap situation this offseason. Um, they've given up all of their draft capital of any real significant um, value in this upcoming draft, and they've been doing that the last couple of years. So you don't have any money to spend. You don't have any draft capital. You're going to lose some players. Um, I, I'm not as certain that they're going to be elite. Good, yes. But elite, you got to pay the piper at some point. Uh, Drunk Squitter says, what's up with people saying Sean McVay will leave LA if the Rams lose to go to TV? I don't buy that. I don't buy that at all. No way. Nope. He's one of the revered coaches in the league. He's going to, he'll remain. Lolo says, car to San Francisco and Jimmy G to Las Vegas sounds interesting. I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it either. Uh, attack man, Bengals need more pass rush other than Hendrickson and Larry Oga. Onajobi. Boy, some of these last names of these pass rushers coming out. Uh, they do. They do. Um, they got the other guy, too, that they drafted the second round a couple years ago. It's pretty good for them. Forget his name. Um, Hubbard. He's all right for them, too, Tack Man. But they could use more. But that's the tough thing with the Bengals. They don't spend money in the free agency. They barely even use up all their cap space. Um, it, they got to get it done in the draft to get it done. Tack man says, who's going to, who's willing to take Jimmy G's contract? I don't think it's that significant left, is it? I mean, it's a little bit, but as far as quarterbacks go, and especially when you're talking about it being a one-year deal, it's, it's, it's not a significant portion, especially if you're, if you're going to have him be your starter. Um, but uh, this is why maybe the Patriots make a lot of sense because they have a rookie quarterback on a rookie deal and can afford to do so. Um, but I, I don't think the, that's going to be the part that precludes people from looking at Jimmy G, looking at what he signed. Yeah, so he's he's got a twenty four million dollar base base salary, which it's that's mid level for a quarterback, right? Upper mid level maybe, but I, mid, maybe there's nobody. It is you know, but it is a one year deal. You're not on the hook for any bonus money. You can cut him at any time. I don't know. I don't know. Charles Riley coming with another donation. Big fat $10 donation this time, Charles. Thank you. I appreciate you, brother. He says, uh, could Pete possibly have a vote if they've hired three people to respectively do the work of a number one competent defensive coordinator? Maybe Jody is taking the it takes a village approach. <laughs> oh, um, maybe Jody told him, Charles, to your point, to stay out of things. Uh, with the defensive side of the ball, to just be a head coach, that you need to concentrate on being a head coach, that she was informed by the eight-person committee that sits above Carol that that knew what was going on and understood maybe some of the problems at play, and she said, okay, here's what's going to happen, Pete. You're going to be a head coach. You're going to stay out of the offense. You're going to stay out of the defense, and we're going to see how this goes. Um, I'm hesitant to believe that Jody had the guts to go to Pete and do that. I'm hesitant to believe that Pete would accept that. Uh, is it a possibility, Charles? It is, maybe. I mean, obviously, some some change was driven for here with Ken Norton's fire, and it probably, at the very least, came from ownership. But um, I don't know. Maybe she's in, maybe she's she's pushing more of this than I'm thinking on that. And uh, Jesse Guillen, thank you for subscribing. You're awesome, Je you're awesome, Jesse. You might be on my uh, six thousand subscriber here. So we were very close to the start of the show. If you are, I appreciate you being that uh, magical one. Um, could be, could be, maybe Pete recognizes, understands that the new approach needs to be more of a, it takes a village, you know, maybe it's more Pete recognizing I need to have more than just one guy running everything over the top. I need to have a variety of people in here doing a variety of things. That's very specialized. Makes sense. Carl Nerney. What's up, Carl? Long time. No see, man. I hope you're doing well. He says, man, Trey Flowers deserves a Super Bowl with the way I acted this year. 
<laughs> well, you and a few fans were on top of him, I think. So uh, he might just get it. He might just get it. And good for Trey. He's carved out a little bit of a role there, Carl, with the Bengals. Good to see for him. You know, he's a good guy. Wasn't just, just wasn't a great cornerback for us, but a good guy. Um, Megan Gock Roger with a $5 donation. Thank you, Megan. Says, have you heard about the rumor that the Giants are interviewing Desai? Please, God, no. I did. Somebody was mentioning that in the chat, Megan, and thank you for the $5 donation. Um, yeah, I was mentioned in the chat that people were saying, and, and look, the Giants did, they're, they're doing some smarter hires than they've done recently with the coaching positions. I like the Brian Dable hire, and then matching Brian Dable with Desai really gives you some good brain power there with the Giants going forward into at least from a coaching standpoint, guiding that ship in the correct direction uh, in a way that it's not been guided recently with Ben Wackadoo and uh, the guy they just recently had in there. Um, so it would be uh, it'd be a solid hire by the Giants to do it, Megan. Hopefully they pass, though, and we can bring Desai back in here, and you can still get Desai here one way or another. Maybe not as a defensive coordinator, but maybe as an, a, an assistant defensive coach, quality control coach, whatever you want to call him. Like I said, like uh, Charles just said, let's just get a let's get the brain power. Let's get the it takes a village approach here. Weston Corbett says I glanced over an article that was talking about the Rams being good for years to come. Any thoughts? I, I'd love to see how how. You know, Weston, I, I don't understand that, that deal with it. Aaron Donald, as good as he is, is moving into the back end of his prime. He is not going to be the game-wrecking force Aaron Donald for the next five years. That's not happening. Jalen Ramsey's getting a little bit older as a player. Not old, but getting older into, the, into his edge, into his prime, too. And then you look at them, defensively speaking, um, can they keep Floyd going forward? Not sure. You're going to lose Von Miller. Uh, you're going to lose a, one of your better cornerbacks this year in free agency. Um, they don't have a lot in that secondary going forward. They don't have a lot in the linebacker curve going forward. Um, so defensively, it's a little bit tough. Uh, Whitworth is going to retire any day now slash probably get released this off season. They're going to lose, um, maybe your brother, Weston Corbin, Austin Corbin, right? The right guard's going to probably leave in free agency. Um, you know, Akers is going to be there for a few years. He'll be, he'll be good. Beckham's probably going to go. They're not going to have the money to retain him unless they do something crazy. I don't see how they have the money to re retain Odell Beckham. And then on top of this, you still have to sign Matthew Stafford to a contract extension. Oh, by the way, that little bit. And, and again, another guy who's never taken any less money than he can absolutely possibly get at every turn. I think you put all that together in a blender and you come out with a team that's still good, but as somebody else was saying, elite, elite. I mean, they're, they're going to have to be perfect in their decision-making in the front office to accomplish that. Lolo says, Trey Flowers lost all his self-confidence. It's good to see him in a place. It's good to see him in a place to win. It is. I'm glad. I, he's, again, good guy. They, the, the Bengals have carved out a very specialized role, one which you could, you could maybe wonder why our Seahawks didn't try to carve that out for him, being let's put him on the bigger tight ends. Let's put him on those mismatched tight end mismatches that give our linebackers so much problems, that give our safeties so much issues. Um, Makes sense in the way they're using him. Would have been great if Seattle would have tried to use him in a similar fashion. Brian Goski says it does take a village, especially at defensive coordinator. Yes, sir. Uh, Paul Third says it does matter. Brando, Green Bay are a very proud franchise uh, run by the fans. Title Town isn't sending A-Rod to help the 49ers get super number six, especially after eliminating Green Bay two out of the last three years. Very well could be the case. And again, to your point on this, Paul, uh, San Francisco's down a first-round pick. I would think at the very least Aaron Rodgers would net you at least one first-round pick in a trade, if not two, uh, which probably makes it up more unlikely. It's just my little gut instinct on this, Paul. I could be wrong on it. It's a little gut instinct on it. And again, I would acknowledge the, Bronco, the Broncos are probably the front-runner, being that it's probably the most advantageous landing spot for him along with being getting him out of the NFC, along with them probably giving the most returns for Aaron Rodgers', Aaron Rodgers services. Lolo, the Rams have no future picks. Donald, Whitworth, Stafford, Floyd are all aging. This is, this, this is a do-now, think-later situation. Agreed. Agreed. What's up, Megan? Uh, Megan says, trying to stay awake. Not sure how long I'll last with this medication I'm on. Good to hear, man. Glad you're you're a gamer, Megan. You're strapping it on. Uh, you're you're working through the torn ACL, but you're making it happen. 
Jason Tudor, I uh, just got in, but did you all hear Kyle, Kyler unfollowed the cards on Insta and took out all the cards related content? Nuts. Eesh. Never good when they do that, is it, Jason? Never a good sign when they do that. Well, he's up for a contract extension. The Cardinals may be not willing to pay it. Long, many of us had wondered if maybe Kyler would look towards going back to baseball if, uh, if it wasn't working out clean and smoothly here at, in, on the football level. Um, <laughs> certainly there's some questions to Kyler's game and sitting at the head of him is leadership and leadership could be as much as anything, the thing that, that, that holds him back from getting that contract extension. Um, he's just not a good body language guy on the field and the quarterback position has got to be a good body language guy. It's got to be, a, you can't, you can't be petulant like he is, but, uh, interesting Probably an indicator the Cardinals might not be as willing to give him that contract extension that he's wanting. Brian Koski, I wonder if Malik McDowell is comeback player of the year in a cell block C. <laughs> Go Oxo 5, I'm excited for the offseason. I feel like you can craft a contender if you're smart. You can. Going, and especially, it used to be if you went into free agency, that was fool's gold, and there was no way you could build your team through that fashion. Teams have now started to be able to do it and do it successfully. I think with the implementation of analytics that has made teams smarter in their free agent process, less of the, I'm gonna, I'm just going to go with what I feel here. Um, and you can do it, but you got to be smart about it, right? Go Hawks 05, you got, that's the key part, is being smart. And that's a place where I don't think we've been smart in recent years and how we've attacked free agency. Somewhere in flyover country. What's up, man? Good to see you in the chat. It says, what's Seahawks ceiling next season? Are they in the mix? Uh, somewhere in flyover country, this all depends upon this offseason. You've got a lot of work to get done. You have a lot of positions to fill. You're playing in the toughest division in football. Um, my initial instinct is that this team wants to do what they've done in recent years past and that they just feel like they've gotten unlucky. Well, if that's the case, then your high end is a one-and-done squad. But if they attack this offseason with the ferocity, if they attack this offseason with a willingness to go all in on it, like the, we've seen the Rams do this offseason, during the season, then they absolutely can get themselves back to a p potential Super Bowl contention. But they've got to diverge from the path that they have been walking along for the last couple of years. And, and that is a big question mark that I don't have a good answer for. Brian Koski, I'm kind of happy to see Coach Ken Norton Jr. go somewhere else. Maybe uh, Miami? I'm laughing out loud. Well, it is a place you retire, isn't it? That is a place to retire. <laughs> um, go Oxo 5. I feel like we'll see much more 3 4 fronts with Donatelle and Desai all being Fangio guys. Well, we don't have Desai quite yet in the fold yet. He's still, uh, he's still interviewing here, even with the Giants, for their defensive coordinator job. Um, I'd be okay with it, man, and it certainly would open the door more fully to getting the more out of Jamal Adams at that point because you can do some more of your traditional 3-4 looks, blitz-heavy looks, out of that 3-4 package uh, easier. Um, I'm in favor of it. I'm okay with a Lolo. I'd love it. Or not Lolo, go Hawks. I'd love it. Attack uh, man, how's Trey Flowers doing at Cincy? They've carved out a role. He's not an outside corner for them. He's a specialized guy that comes in and takes on the big, uh, the big guys, like big tight ends, and takes them away, as he did against the Kansas City Chiefs. Very good in coverage against Kelsey in that uh, conference championship game. So um, he's carved out a little role, but an important role with the, with the Bengals. Goxo I says Bengals winning it for Harambe. That's what I heard. Yes. Win it for Harambe, Cincy. Paul Third, I had a theory Brady only announced his retirement to sway the MVP away from Rodgers. Could see him standing at the podium at NFL Honors putting on a coming out of retirement speech after he gets it. <laughs> oh, oh. Ooh, Paul. Okay. I could see it. These quarterbacks love the spotlight, don't they? There's not a quarterback who hasn't loved a spotlight wherever he can find one. They all seem to be a little bit wired in that way. So, uh, I, you know, yeah, I could see it. I could see it. <laughs> I've, I, it was weird that he, he came down and decided to do the retirement coming off a year again when he, what, led the league in yards thrown, touchdown passes, or second in touchdown passes, whatever. 
Uh, Dante King, I like the cornerback Andrew Booth Jr., but he will probably be taken in the first round or the beginning of the second round. I'll take a look at him and on my list here. There always is usually a good run of five or six corners through the first 35 picks. Brian Kosky says, Brian Flores got screwed. I hope that lawsuit will shake shit up. Me too, Brian. Me too, man. The NFL needs a little bit in this respect of a, the, the, some of the stuff that's being talked about is out of control. Paying to lose games and whatnot, that's, that is wrong on so many levels. So many levels. So hopefully it does. Hopefully it does drive some change in this respect. Brian Costco was hoping the Hawks would hire Brian Flores as a defensive coordinator at least. Yeah, I think he's, he probably sees himself more as a head coach at this point. I don't know if he might feel like he's taking a step down to take that kind of position. I would have loved to have seen it. I don't think that Coach Carroll would have brought him in, though, as, a again, a 3-4 guy who would want to run a 3-4 defense. Elliot Clark says, Pete needs to understand he's not an offensive coordinator and keep his little mitts out of the playbook. Agreed, Elliot. Agreed. It's hard enough to be a mastermind on one side of the ball, right? Hard enough to be that good, that wise, that able. You're going to be it on two sides of the football and offense and defense. No, no, I don't buy it. No. And I do think he needs to stay out of it. And I think when he, when he butts in on the offense, a lot of times it's to sort of protect his defense a little bit. And that's, even makes me even more perturbed by it, annoyed by it. Megan says, B uh, was watching some of rugby yesterday. Thought you and the twelves would love to know that the Fijian women's rugby team is named the Seahawks. Oh, I like it. I like it. It's a good name. It's a good name. Women's Rugby League rocking. Okay. Okay. Uh, Lolo says, hey, night all. Take care, everyone. We have an interesting offseason coming up. We'll see what happens. We will indeed, Lolo. You have a great night. Thanks for jumping in the chat. Drunk Squidward says, Cardinals should bring back Josh Rosen. Ooh, the irony, Drunk. The irony. <laughs> Brian Kosky says, Charles, so sad about Dr. Johnny Fever passing at 81 years old. WKRP was way cool back in the day. You guys, uh, you know what's interesting on that? Um, what's interesting on that is go, I'm related to Dr. Johnny Fever. Yeah, guys, I think I got my new nickname. I'm actually a distant, he's a third cousin of mine. So uh, Johnny Fever of WKRP, if you guys look at him, you can see some similarities here. If you look in the behind me, my dad looks just like him. So my dad back here on the, on the photo here, maybe this is too far away. He looks just like Dr. Johnny Fever. Um, so yeah, the only person in our family somewhat famous, uh, also on the show, head of the class, but uh, RIP, cuz, RIP. Ghost says, yo, what's up, Brandon? What's up, Ghost? Good to see you in the chat. Do you feel like it's uh, bad to have too many good coaches? No, I don't, Ghost. You certainly run into a little bit of a worry at times that you have too many cooks in the kitchen. But I don't think having too many cooks in the kitchen has been the problem of recently. And so this is a different path, a different take, a different way to go. And I think that as, I've, as I believe on this, um, the NFL's hard. It's hard to coach, hard to be a great coach, hard to be a separator as a coach. The more you can specialize in on certain things that are your expertise and what you need to concentrate on, the better. The more minds, the more brain power you can bring to the room, the better. Um, the greatest coaches out there that are revered above on else, uh, the Belichicks, the Carrolls, the um, Andy Reeds, they, they always assemble monster staffs. And um, I, I think that that's something you can't be scared to do. And Carroll shouldn't be scared to do it. So I, it's nothing but a good thing to me, Ghost. I don't see any downside on it. I think it only... It only helps to round out, and I think there needs to be as many new ideas in the room as possible. And you get there by getting a lot of guys that are, are very good at their job, very smart. And they seem like they're doing that. Paul Third says, Rams won't be good for years to come. They weren't even that great this year. They didn't play clean enough to be one of the least penalized teams all year. The refs pocketed flags for them. Well, third, well said, Paul. They definitely got some benefits on flags in certain games this year. And yeah, they weren't exactly the elite of elite teams this year, right? To your point on that, absolutely not. They barely kind of eked out the division in the last game of the year. Um, 
There were other teams that played better throughout the course of the season overall. They got hot at the right time, which you have to do to go win a Super Bowl, to get to the Super Bowl. That's sometimes what I talk about a lot. It's not necessarily the best team that gets the Super Bowl and wins it. It's the team that's the, the hottest at the right time of year. Um, but I, I can't buy on Paul being some juggernaut going forward. I think there's questions with them going forward. I think they're going to be up against it. The salary cap is a real thing. You can bend it, but you can't break it. And as the Saints are learning this year, the Piper gets paid eventually. Dante King, if I was the Seahawks, I would draft I would draft two running backs in Damian Pierce and Kennedy Brooks. Love Damian Pierce. Uh, Dante fits the mold, definitely fits the mold. Don't know a lot about Kennedy Brooks, so I'll take a look at him a little bit deeper, but uh, Pierce does fit into like a little bit of like a Thomas Rawls type, right? A little Thomas Rawls to his game. Um, shades of that a little bit. Um, but he's a good player, very good player. Runs hard, runs mean. Impulse, what position do you think our first draft selection should be? Uh, left tackle, center, or right tackle, Impulse, in that order. Of whatever, whoever the best player is available on the board, if it's a left tackle, I'll take it. If the center is, then I'll take that. And if not that, then the right tackle. But I, I think the offensive line, that's the money spot in the second round to hit, is the offensive line. You're going to get a very good player at one of those positions, maybe not left tackle, but definitely center and definitely right tackle, will be staring you right in the face uh, at number 10 in the second round. Uh, Megan says, okay, B, explain to me what the actual job of a team's head coach is. Well, Megan, it changes, it changes team by team, you know? So some teams have a, have a coach. I don't think there's any defensive-minded head coaches that actually call the defensive plays. I do think that there are offensive-minded coaches who actually call the plays. But traditionally, if we want to go back through NFL history and what really a coach has been normally, they are the they are the motivators. Uh, they are the they are the buck stops here guy when there's um, when there is uh, drama, when there's infighting, when there is a decision that needs to be made between coaches and they can't come to a consensus. You come to the coach and he makes the decision. Um, it varies in the level of how how much those coaches put themselves into things. There are those hands-off coaches that are just there to do the bare minimum, like uh, McCarthy with Dallas, for instance, strikes me as that kind of coach. I'm here to do just the bare minimum. I'll let my assistants do the heavy lifting. But then there's some coaches who do a lot of the work, who take on a lot of, the, a, a lot of what's going on. Carroll's that way. Belichick's that way, right? They, they have a lot of ownership on the team past just sitting in sort of that figurehead state. Um, the head coach also is going to try and manage the timeouts throughout the course of the game. They manage the challenges throughout the course of the game. They're going to have a, just a general feel to the whole flow of things and what needs to go on. And they're sort of there to catch anything that maybe is being lost by the defensive coaches as they're just in in their in their role on what they're doing. So it, it does definitely vary, Megan. It's it's not just a one answer fits all on that for for everybody all the way around. Paul Thurs has uh, got them a division and a home Super Bowl for the LA market. I can't wait for the cap to catch up with them and the wheels to fall off that bandwagon. Couldn't even fill SoFi for a Cards playoff game. Yeah, it's pretty pathetic. You can't fill a stadium in a playoff game. I mean, that that is pathetic. It is pathetic. And uh, yeah, the NFL has helped them out. It's bumped them up as much as it can to try to generate excitement in that market. We'll see how long it holds, Paul. I don't think those roots are going to take, if you know what I'm saying. Um, I think that you're going to eventually see a softening of that market, especially once they start losing, especially when they're not a good team. You'll see a half full stadium there in that LA market. But, uh, you know, they're propping them up as much as they can. They're propping them up, and I'm going to enjoy watching the wheels fall off along with you. And you better believe it. The price comes paid. You got to, the bill is due. Nobody gets away from that. People try to tell you there's no such thing as a cap. Salary cap's fake. Salary cap isn't. Yes, it is. You can push it off, you can kick the can down the road to a certain degree. But when you operate from that state for multiple years on end, the bill does come due. Uh, Megan Gock Rogers says, Howard Hessman and B related, no effing way. Effing way, Megan. Effing way, I'm telling you. Go, um, go look at Howard Hessman's picture. All right, Megan. So go look at Howard Hessman's picture and then look here at my dad. Give you a good view here. And if you look at a picture of Hessman and you look at a picture of my dad with the, the soft, 
you know, light colored hair and all that. Dead ringer. Absolutely a dead ringer. Get you back up next later. <laughs> um, Megan says, "Okay, cool. what is that?" <laughs> Ghost, is there any team do you feel like can take on Wilson trade in the NFC? There's a couple teams that can. Ghost, I think the the Giants can with their multiple first round picks. Um, so they stand out to me as being one of those type of teams that could do that. Um, Eagles with multiple first round picks could do that. Jalen Hurts is a, as a, as something that they could dangle in addition to the first round picks along with Daniel Jones, who could be dangled by the giants. Those are two teams in the NFC that stand out to me. Um, that would make a lot of sense. Washington football team, um, not to just attack all AFC's teams here, but the Washington football team, Russ, I think played his high school ball on the East coast in Virginia Maybe going back to a local area in that respect could make some sense for for Washington if they wanted to go hard and on trade on that. Um, those would be about the only three teams. I think the Saints are now out. Um, I don't think that there's anything that anybody that makes sense in any of the other spots, not to me at all. So yeah, that's probably about it in the NFC. Uh, Go says, "What? Who do you see shaking free from the, these NFC teams like the Packers, Bucks, and Saints?" Who do, who do you see shaking free? Um, what do you mean on that ghost by shaking free? You mean like players leaving? Brian Kosky says, wow, you're related. Dr. Johnny Fever was a badass in Cincinnati on WKRP. Way cool. Yep, thir- I think it's third cousin removed, Brian. So I didn't know the guy. Um, but they hail my, my people's hail up out of Missouri, up out of Missouri. And, uh, I believe that's where he came up around, but, um, yeah, my dad did my real, looked very similar, especially my dad younger. They looked, they looked like dead ringers at times. Um, but yep. Johnny fever. It's my cousin. Johnny fever. Uh, Charles Riley with a $5 donation. Thank you, Charles, man. Coming hard on the donations today. I appreciate you. So is that Brian Kosky? Thanks for bringing it to my attention. And now we know Brando is related to fever. The Bengals need to win for Harambe, fever, and Brando. It's a must at this point, Charles. It's, it's, in, it's literally in the stars, you could say, Charles, right? It's all coming into the alignment. The binary stars or the binary stars are floating up past each other and coming into conjunction. And that is what is occurring. Yeah, Johnny Fever, baby. Johnny Fever. Got a fever for the Bengal win. Thank you for the donation, man. I appreciate you, brother. Uh, Megan, add to the further coach question B, is there a better way of coaching, i.e. defensive, offensive coach, et cetera? Um, Offensive coaches right now, Megan, are having a tremendous amount of of, um, success. So if you looked at this year, for instance, the top maybe 10 teams in the NFL, eight of those 10, eight of those 10 teams is probably being driven by an offensive led head coach, a guy whose background was offensive, right? He was a former offensive coordinator who eventually became a head coach. So offense wins the day um, in this modern NFL. And that makes a lot of sense, right, Megan? Because the league has litigated and mandated within their rules now to help the offenses really flourish. So it's it's no, um, I don't think it's happenstance that offensive coaches are having more um, more of an effect. But it does vary on what those coaches do. And no one coach probably does it the same way as another. You know, you might have some coaches that are very involved in the game planning during the week, but then they stay out hands off during game day. Or head coaches that are maybe hands off in the game planning during the week, but then very hands on during game day. You know, some coaches that want to call some plays, some coaches that don't. Some coaches like Carroll that'll be on the offense and the defensive side. Some coaches that just stick to the offensive side or just stick to the defensive side. Um, but I think it's, it's, you have 32 teams and I wouldn't be surprised, Megan, if there was 32 different ways they all sort of dole out responsibilities and who does what and what the head coach is truly fully responsible for. It's kind of a, there's no one way to slay that sort of dragon, so to speak. 
But I would say, bar why I say, Megan, I would have wanted an offensive coach if we moved on from Carroll rather than going for a defensive-minded head coach is because of that success that offensive-minded head coaches are having right now. Just a quicker, easiest, easier path to get us to being a winning football team. Ghost, you know tons about football, I can tell. I respect that. This definitely is a good channel for sure. Well, thank you, Ghost. That's, I try to pride myself on being pretty well informed and that I, I do my research and I, do, I dive in and I know what I'm talking about. So uh, thank you for recognizing on it. And that's, that's what I'm trying to do here, man, is give you, get as in-depth as I can on that. So I appreciate you and thank you for watching. Charles Riley, uh, pretty sure uh, there was a WKRP episode where Fever got more sober than got more sober the more he drank. I don't think that applies to Brando <laughs> or me. No, I don't have that in my family. I didn't inherit that gene. <laughs> I drink more, I get drunk. Go Hawks 05. If I were a coach, we were running the most fun offense in the NFL history. We're not winning games, but it'll be must fun CTV. Well, of course, Go Hawks 05, you're kind of describing the early Seahawks offense, right? Before we got to Knox and ground Knox, you got you usually got like three or four trick plays a game. They play, they play wild and free, just do whatever they felt like doing, running quarterback in a time when you didn't have any running quarterbacks in the sport. So uh, that was sort of the early Hawks, Hawks offenses, but it'd be fun. I, I love it. I'd love it, Go Hawks. Uh, Megan Gock Rogers says, oh, hell yes. The resemblance is strong. And was that Baby B in the photo? That was Baby B. See, Megan? See, Megan, if you notice... I'm taking a family portrait. You guys want to know how dedicated I am to my Seahawks? There's a family portrait of me wearing a Hawks jersey in 84. That is 84. Can you believe that? I started young on my Hawks. Started young on my Hawks, and that is a baby bee. That's me with the pops. It's me with the pops. Megan says, how old were you then? So let's see, at 85, I was seven, seven years old, I guess right there, about seven or so, give or take. Brian Koski says, damn, don't break the frame photos. I know, man, it wouldn't go back up. I gotta, I'm gotta. i going to have to fix it after, after the stream. Jerome Blossom says, Clint Hurt is our defensive coordinator, and he's crying laughing. <laughs> yes, Jerome. I'm sorry, my guy. That is the case. At least on the plus side, you're bringing Donatell in addition to it, um, and potentially getting in Sean Desai, if he doesn't get the job with the Giants, might also be coming here. So, you know, strength in numbers. Um, maybe they could help him out in, in getting the learning curve fixed a little bit. But like you, Jerome, uh, it's hard to have a lot of excitement on my end for this type of hire, uh, going from within the building. It feels a little bit like a yes man to pick rather than grabbing the, the best guy on the board. Go Hawks 05 says, go Washington commies. <laughs> that would have been funny if they picked that name. I could have gotten by that name. Uh, Ghost, uh, talking about players being cut or released. Um... Uh, so the guys that stand out, at least on the team for me, Ghost, that I think are going to be released on our team, the four guys that I go to are Chris Carson, who you saved $3.4 million by releasing him. LJ Collier, LJ Collier you'll save a $1 million by releasing him. And then you're going to save $1.5 million by moving on from Ben Simeoa. And then last but not least is Jason Myers, who you're going to save an additional $4 million uh, in salary at that point. So you got another $10 million in savings. I believe those are the likely guys to be cut. I don't think Dunlap gets cut. I don't think Jackson gets cut. Um, if you're talking about around the league, guys that, you know, maybe could be cut slash trade candidates, it's hard to tell between, you know, where those guys sometimes land. Guys I might take a look at would be uh, Daniil Hunter with the Minnesota Vikings, Grady Jarrett with the Atlanta Falcons would be an interesting option for a three-tech. Uh, Chris Lindstrom, also with the Falcons, up for a new contract. Maybe he could be a guy that you could go out there and pluck. James Bradbury, a very talented cornerback for the New York Giants, could be an interesting guy who might be released because they can save a significant amount of cap. And Giants are actually weirdly in a bad cap situation. Uh, Mitch Morse, a center with Buffalo, is a guy that maybe you could pull, pull from them uh, if they're looking to, to kind of balance out their, their salary load a little bit. Uh, Taylor Luan is up for a contract extension with the Titans. And right now the Titans are over the cap and they also are due to have to sign A.J. Brown and Jeffrey Simmons to big 
market setting kind of contracts. Um, sorry, one sec. So the Titans could be caught in a pickle where they're over the cap and then they have to sign A.J. Brown and Jeffrey Simmons to huge deals and then they have to kind of move Taylor Lewan because they just don't have the resources to sign him to a contract extension as well. Those have been the guys um, I've looked out. The last guy would be Andrew Norwall. He'd be kind of a dream scenario. Jaguars guard had the highest run block win rate of any left guard in the NFL last year. Top 10 pass block win rate in addition to that. So he's good all around as a player. Those would be guys that I would like to look at if we could, um, uh, that I, I'd like to look at if, as possibilities as far as cut slash maybe trade possibilities. But that, that'd be league wide. Big Country says, I have a feeling Clint Hurt is Ken Norton 2.0. I have similar feelings on that, Big Country. I don't know if he could be as bad as Ken, but I mean, I don't know if he's an improvement. Go Hawks Vive, I'm happy for Hurt. He's a good guy. Players love him. Glad to see he's got a job. Let's hope Donatel and Carroll help him ease into a dynamic coordinator. Let's hope. Let's hope indeed, man. I hope we see that. Brian Koski, I, I got a long-distant cousin playing for the Rams. Oh, well. Enjoy the game next week. It'll be interesting. I'm pulling for the underdog as usual. Kitty goes meow. Kitty goes meow. Jason Tudor, pretty glad to see McDaniel leave the Niners for Miami. He seems to have a brilliant football mind. Indeed, Jason, the only sad part is that they get two third-round picks for him going. Uh, Niners didn't need that help. The Niners didn't need that help, you know? But I agree. It's, it's at least a little bit of a brain, brain uh, drain on their part. Cool Breeze, theoretically, if we started over and you had the power who is your dream coach quarterback combo and maybe general manager and general manager maybe as well the next five years? Ooh, great question, Cool Breeze. Fantastic question. And I'm thinking on this. That's why I'm taking a minute here, Cool. I'm just trying to think on going through the names in my mind. <laughs> Goodness, it's a good question. Uh, all right, well, let's start with, uh, well, we'll go Justin Herbert. I'll pair Justin Herbert with... Um, I'm going to pair Justin Herbert with Kyle Shanahan. And then for my general manager, who would be my general manager? That's a tough call. That is a tough call. I kind of like the Ravens general manager. I forget his name, but I do kind of like him. Doesn't seem like there's as good as many good general managers as there once was. Maybe the Indianapolis Colts general manager. So one of those two would probably be who I would uh, I'd lean to. That'd be my combination, though. I'll go with that. Go with that. I tried to be. Uh, I tried to be uh, cre a little creative with that one for you on that. Charles Riley, the five dollar donation. Thank you, Charles. He says Brando's dad looks pretty burly. He might have been a lineman or a backer in the day. Thanks for sharing the pick. I assumed. Uh, I assumed it was Jack Patera. I, I like. I like your thought that it's Jack Patera better. I'm just going to call him Jack Patera. I'm going to tell my kids it was Jack Patera. The kids I'll never have. <laughs> but uh complete tv thank you for subscribing man i appreciate you we're, we're getting to nearly six thousand. you might have just been my six thousand sub so uh thank you for doing that brother you're awesome uh he is a burly man he's a burly man that's for sure but not an athlete strangely enough 
Uh, my father was more of a man of the theater. And funny enough, um, my dad was a morning uh, uh, radio host for about 15 years, Southeast Idaho. So uh, he also has a little bit of that in his uh, background as well. We, all, we, we like to talk in my family, I guess. You know what I mean? But uh, we're going to get Brand. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I've been trying to look at maybe seeing if I get my dad talked into playing uh, my Ken Baring role in the skit that I want to do coming up soon uh, for one of the uploads I'm going to do on the channel. So I'm going to try to talk him into it because I think he'd be a, a good Ken Baring at this point. But uh, he's definitely a burly man. Burly, burly man. Uh, Megan says, just like my three year old nephew who always grabs my Hawks hat, and there are many photos on my phone with him wearing it. Oh, uh, oh, you're bringing, uh, sorry, speaking of Brian. I didn't break the frame. No, it fell, but it didn't break. It's, it's an unbreakable frame. Go Hawks 05 says, hope the Giants go wink. Wink Martindale. I see what you did there. Go Hawks. I see what you did there. And thanks again, Charles, for all your donations, man. You're, you're amazing. Megan says, if Decide comes to us and Hurt and Donatello are already here, who the hell is in charge? Well, Hurt's in charge, uh, but those guys are there to support him and to, to fill out and round out his knowledge base of what's going on. Uh, Donatello specifically, I'm guessing, with a lot of the secondary stuff, Decide would be working with Donatello as well. But at the end of the day, Hurt's going to be the man calling the plays and the one in charge. Ghost says, do you see Bobby Wagner getting cut and would you do it to free up space? So it's definitely two different answers on that, Ghost, right? There's the answer of what I would do and what I think is likely to happen. I think what's likely to happen is the Seahawks are going to renegotiate Bobby, probably take him down to something like, a, you know, $10 million, $8 million, uh, one year, last year deal, whatever, and move him down just a little bit. Uh, what I would do is I would release him. Um, you save $16.6 million in cap space by moving on from Bobby. That is a significant portion of salary cap space to clear. You um, have his backup waiting in the wings and has been waiting in the wings the last two years in Jordan Brooks. You have the backup for Jordan Brooks as well, also sitting there in Cody Barton. You have the backup for the backup on the roster in Ben Burkirvin already. So you're sitting on basically four middle linebackers as it is. You can create $16.6 million in cap space. Bobby's not the player he once was. It's, to me, the smart decision to make. But it's not the one that they will make, Ghost. Uh, Attack man, kill it, clan killer says Trey McBride reminds me of Jason Witten. I could see that. I could see that a little bit. Witten's a little bit bigger. Feels like he's a little, Witten maybe has a couple more inches on McBride. McBride feels a more 6'3-ish. Witten felt a more legitimate 6'5". Um, but again, the, there's, there's, some, there's some comparisons there. You know, they, they win with effort. They win with smarts. They win with um, being tough pass catchers when guys are hanging off of them. That makes sense as a comparison. Jay says, you don't know how much I wanted to spam <laughs> the, the cake emoji, spam in the chat when he was holding the frame. <laughs> uh, Daniel uh, W I know you aren't too thrilled for the defensive coordinator hire but one underrated benefit of having a defensive line coach as a defensive coordinator versus linebackers coach uh, as a defensive coordinator is we won't spend as much resources at the linebacker position hopefully go more line you touch on the thing Daniel that had me the most hopeful within this hire the most I, this is the thing that I hope he is able to drive because he comes from that background. Being that you've gone so light on the defensive line in recent seasons, here's the guy that maybe can now upend that, that can change that, that can move this in a different direction. So I'm absolutely hopeful that that is what does occur, um, to your point on that. And there's it's reasonable to believe that, right? I mean, you had here Norton here, and the second Norton arrives, you pay Bobby more money to the middle linebacker position than anybody else in the sport. You're paying money to KJ Wright, a significant portion of money to KJ Wright at the same time. Then you go out and you draft Cody Barton in the third round. You draft fifth round Ben Burke Irvin. Then the next year after that, you take a first round pick on Jordan Brooks. So to your point, that's what happened when you got a linebacker coach as a defensive coordinator. He loved himself linebackers, right? Even on, he had a whole, we had a whole season that we basically ran base 67% of our snaps in 2019 for the whole year just because Karen Norton loved himself linebacker so damn much. 
So uh, yeah, I hope that changes. I hope that stuff goes now in a different direction from where it's been recently, um, having the defensive line coach. And I am Daniel hopeful from that aspect of things. I don't know if he's going to give us a whole lot in, in new wrinkles and changes and additions and ideas, but at the very least with that, we can go a long way by putting more of an investment in our defensive line. Uh, it's Complete TV uh, says Go Hawks, and I say Go Hawks right back to you. It's Complete TV, and thank you as well for subscribing. Like I said, one of you guys is just about to be my 6,000th subscriber, so how, thank you for helping me get over this last little hump here. You are awesome for doing so. Appreciate you. Charles Riley, another $5 donation, Charles. It says, uh, Brando, if your dad does a Ken Baring impression, that would be brilliant. Truthfully, he has a bit of Paul Allen look to him as well. Yeah, got a little bit. Of, you could do a little Paul Allen. I could get dad for both. Um, and dad is, a, dad is a thespian. Like I said, he's not an athlete. He was a, he was a thespian coming out. So um, he is a ham. He is way even more so than I am. I know that might strike you guys as weird. I am, I'm mellow compared to my dad. So I'm low-key... I'm, I'm the, I'm known as the emotionless one, you know, by him. So he's a live wire and, uh, I would love to get him on the stream or, or on it as an upload to, to tap into some of his, um, creative spirit. If I can, if I could talk him into it, he's, he's retiring now, you know, he doesn't want to do a whole lot. So it's the motivation's not there, but, uh, nonetheless, nonetheless, I'm going to get him in to do something here. Fat Boy Ka, Eric DaCosta. Thank you for uh, saving me on that one, Fat Boy Ka. So Eric DaCosta, Eric DaCosta would be my dream general manager. We'll take Justin Herbert as my quarterback, and then uh, I'll go with uh, I'll go with Sean Payton as my uh, as my coach. I'll go with that. Feels good. Um. Uh, Daniel W says, if we draft, if we could draft Cameron Thomas, the defensive end, and then trade back into the second round to draft Perry and Winfrey, I would be ecstatic. Our defensive line could be solidified on cheap contracts the next four seasons. Uh, yes, I do like Cam, Cam Thomas as well. I did watch a little Cam Thomas. Let's do a breakdown of Cam here real quick. Um, I thought I had Thomas done. I didn't. I didn't put it down. Um, so the thing with that on that, I'll say is, I, I think that they're both kind of similar in what they're bringing to the table. Um, both are inside outside guys. They can both do a little defensive end, a little defensive tackle in watching the tape. Um, I, I feel like Thomas is more an outside guy. So that's probably to your point. You're feeling like he can more do the outside than Winfrey's your three tech at that point. I think, I think Cameron, though, he did a lot of three-tech stuff and a lot of defensive tackle stuff in college. I don't think he's going to be as good with it at the pro level. I think he's going to be more of a defensive end. He is a little tweener. He's a little tweener with me, and in, in, in I'm, I'm almost positionless, whereas Winfrey is a little bit of, he's just been played out of position at one tech, and he really is a pure three. Um, but I like both those guys, Daniel. I think both those guys got good upside. Both those guys should go in the second round. That's appropriate value for them. Flag Zappa says, congratulations on 6,000, Brando. Oh, did we hit it? Did you hit it? Let's, let's take a look. Take a little peek here. Let's take ourselves a little peek, right? Let's take a little peek. 5,999. So we might have just pushed over with the last one because YouTube's probably not updating, but we're right there on it. But thanks, Flag, man. I'm loving life, brother. We're growing as ever, and it's, it's a beautiful thing to see. A beautiful, beautiful thing to see. Big country, a lethal combination would be Baker Mayfield, Urban Meyer, and Bill O'Brien. <laughs> Who's the coach? Who's the general manager, Big Country? <laughs> One thing is for sure that uh, that franchise will be in flames and soot and ash when they are leaving. <laughs> Megan says, You like to talk? Wow, B, never would have guessed. I know, shocker, right? TJ Singh, is MLB season going to be delayed? I can't find a clear answer. Uh, nothing is driven yet to be delayed, TJ, because you're not into the witching hour yet. You're not into the, oh, we're at the point where we're going to be losing football games now. You're in the place where they're still doing a bit of the dance. Uh, the worst thing you're going to see at this point that could happen is a, is a, a dialing back of, train, of training, spring training. And let's face it, spring training is already like over a month long. 
they can certainly whack out a couple of weeks and get guys ready a little quicker with that. So that'll be the first thing that gets uh, put on the chopping block as far as the year goes. We're not there yet because we're still into to February. The pitchers and catchers haven't even technically supposed to have been reporting yet. But I'm, I'm worried beyond a delay at this point, TJ. I think a delay is absolutely in the cards and going to happen. I've fully moved on to full worry about cancellation of the season. Myself. Tackman says Mayfield's got one more year to prove his worth. That's right, Tackman. He's getting one more year. One more year where you're either a starting quarterback in this year or you're going to be a perennial backup. I mean, that's that choice, that decision is going to be made on Baker this season. And I think he's more of a proverbial perennial backup than he is uh, a frontline guy. And thanks for all the donations, Charles. I appreciate me. Tackman Clan Killer says Dellinger equals Mercedes Lewis 2.0. Ooh, get me excited, man. Well, check him out. I like Mercedes. He's a good player. He's been a good player for a long time. He's a little older now, but good player. Ghost says thanks for the input. Good talking football with you. Good night, bro. We have a good night, Ghost. Great talking football with you, man. Anytime. Anytime. Please come on in. Daniel W., don't forget we had Michael Kendricks laughing out loud. Exactly. That's the base season. Ha, ha, ha. Ken Norton loved linebackers. We won't see Clint Hurt do that, and he will learn from the mistakes of his predecessor. <clears throat> I hope he does, Daniel. I hope he's pulling out lots of pages of what not to do from Ken Norton's book. And the base, the base year was so ridiculous by Ken Norton and the Seahawks, and it's Coach Carroll there too. But running out base defense, 70% of your snaps, when opposing offenses would run out, three wide and you'd stay in base. It was, no other team was doing it. I mean, the, the, the second team that ran the most base that year was at like 30%. And we were up at like 67% that year. Just an incredible amount of base looks. And we didn't run it well either. We weren't even good at it. Uh, Brian Koski, I can't imagine D.C. Hurt in charge of the backfield. He's a defensive line dude. He hasn't played that position since six years old. Yeah, Brian, that's why you bring in Donatel. Donatel's your passing game guy. If you brought in uh, uh, Sean Desai, that's also what he does. So you're specializing a little bit in what you're having those guys do with that. Uh, absolutely. I don't think you're going to have him touching much of anything in that secondary. He just His job is to run the defense, run the defensive line, call the plays. But certainly he's going to be taking in a lot of input in from Donatel and potentially Desai. Tackman says, Pete always hires his yes man, and Pete will keep his lap dogs under leash. You better believe he will, on a tight leash. One of those leashes with the, that you got to do on the, on the badass dogs, right? The ones that got like poke into their neck and slightly, like, slightly uh, choke them in order to get them to stop from chewing somebody's face off. Mike Zappa says, I want a seven-hour Christopher Walken uh, 6K extravaganza. We got 6,000 subscribers. Who could see in any time we're going to do this good? Brandon never was going to be this good. I didn't think anybody would listen to him. I'm listening. Who knows? Maybe tomorrow. We'll do it, though. We'll do a 6,000 subscriber count. I'm a can. I'm not doing a good one tonight. I'm six hours in, so it's a little rough at this point, but... We'll do, we'll do some walk-ins. We'll get some more walk-ins in their flag. 6,000 subscribers. More cowbell. Brandon, 6,000. Celebrate today as much as you can. It's a big, big achievement. Big achievement. Great job. That's so good. How are you going to do that? How'd you do this? 6,000. 6,000 subscribers. It's, it's horrible right now. I'm, I'm walking's horrible. <laughs> it's, good. it's scratchy. Uh, Megan says, when do we find out what games are being played at Lumen next season? Need to start booking tickets for the trip. Uh, you're not going to learn until I think June. They already released the home and road schedule, but I don't know that the days, they don't have the dates posted yet, Flag, I don't think. 
I think you don't get the exact days until like May or June. So you got to wait a little bit. In the tech world, are you on any particular side when it comes to the lockout or you just whatever, get this S over with? Um, honestly, when I looked at how much you look at the sports and how much the players make of the percentage of profits. If I'm not mistaken, baseball players make the highest percentage of profits uh, of the hockey players, of the basketball players, of um, of even the football players only make like 49%. I think the baseball players make like 54%. They're making a significant portion of the profits. They have some of the least amount of long-term injuries from their playing careers. Um... I would be lead to ble- I'd be led to believe a little bit that I would probably be landing a tiny bit more in the owner's camp on this than the players. But not by a wide margin, but just a little bit to the owners because the players have kind of, they got the strongest union in all of sports. Um, and some of this feels like they're sort of taking the dog out for a walk. You know, we got the power, so let's flex it. Let's see if we can push for even a little bit more. And I'm not, there's not a bad guy or good guy in this situation, but th- that does feel a little bit like what's kind of going on here. Baseball, stop being so grainy. Come on. Owners, come to the table. Players, come to the table. Negotiate. Come to the deal. Sign it. Play some ball. Summer. Sunshine. Baseball bats. Let's play ball today. Charles Riley with $10 donation. Damn, Charles, always coming with the $50, $60 hot. And I dig that about you. It says, that Megan Gawk, Roger. I feel like Brando's dad was the Paul Allen free to live his life and not slave away creating what he and Bill Gates did. Pros and cons to both, but Brando is the pro for Hawks fans. <laughs> Very well stated. And yeah, dad, dad was a little more free, free willing in his life than Mr. Paul. Not as, not as much about the man, man. You know what I mean? Dad was definitely a little bit of a hippie in his day. A little bit of a hippie in his day, my pops. So, yeah, that's for sure. That is for sure. But I'm on the other side of it. <laughs> oh. Flags out, but that base year was frustratingly bad. So many missed tackles. Yes. Yeah, and isn't that the weird thing about a flag is if you're going to go heavy – and I'm putting more linebackers on the field than, than quarterbacks, you'd think I'd have less missed tackles, right? Like, you'd think it wouldn't be that, but it was the opposite. Is The opposite of what you think you'd get is the benefit. You'd think you'd at least get more, be more sure tackled. Maybe you'd give up more plays deeper down the field in the pass game especially, but yeah. I don't know. 6,000 subs? We there? 6,000 subs? How do we do this, folks? Three years old, this channel, 6,000 subs. How did it fast so quick? How'd you do it? How'd you do it? How'd we do it? I did it because of you. You people out there, I can happen all day, all long, all night, all day. Seven hours, I talk. You don't get bored. You don't leave. You stay. You hand. You hit the like button. Thank you, you people, for doing that to me. Appreciate it. All day. More cowbell, please. (laughs) <laughs> thank you guys you're awesome i appreciate you through the congratulations hey we've been through only three years old to get here this quick from my standpoint i wouldn't have thought we got there this fast i was starting from square one i didn't have a podcast didn't have anything started just hit record on the first video and we have landed here and it's amazing to see this kind of growth this quickly and uh i'm loving it man i'm loving it man and women i'm you guys are awesome for as supportive as you are and you guys are what made this the like button the subscribing the support of the channel it's how we get here, man. It's how we keep pushing through on these on these subs. So um, feels good, man. Six thousand feels like a real good number. And we're getting to that legit area of uh, YouTube where, you know, there are those people with the hundreds of thousands, but they're few and far between. There are those people with the tens of thousands, but they're few and far between. And we're getting closer and closer to some of that uh, rarefied air on YouTube. And man, it feels nice. It feels real nice. Flag Sabbath. How about Christopher Walken draft preview one of these days? Yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. Let me tell you about David Ojibowie, Michigan Wolverine, wow, Wolverine, just started playing football, 2017, already a monster, traditional, high-end, outside, 3-4, linebacker, does a great job, pressing the arc, 
Speaking of tackles, hand fighting, fighting with his hands, keeps his head up, aware, tipping passes, forcing fumbles, not by happenstance. I'm doing a bad walking tonight, folks. I'm sorry. Can't get my can't bring my walking right tonight. <laughs> walking walking's light tonight. He's more Wiccan. Ah, thank you for the crack and grats, big country flag. Appreciate you. Appreciate you, tack man. 6,000 K, someone give this man a free Obama phone. <laughs> Megan says, so proud to be repping Aussie 12s along with Paul Third, I think. Congrats on 6Ks, B. You make me proud to be a 12 and a member of this awesome fan base, even though I'm down here. Well, I love having you aboard on this fan base too, Megan. It's a great addition to this fan base having you here. And thank you. I appreciate it. I'm, uh, I love doing this. Like I say, it's my favorite thing. I love talking Hawks. People always go, oh, you're still on five, six hours. It ain't nothing. I enjoy doing this. It's really something that I love doing. This football is just that awesome of a sport to talk about. Flag Sabbath, man, I like Abraham Lucas, but if Boy Mafi or Devontae Wyatt is there in the second round, they'll be hard to pass up. It would be tough, especially Wyatt. I'm, gonna, I'm with you on Wyatt. I have to look at a little more tape on Mafi to get a, more of a feel for him. Um, but Wyatt, I'm with you on. I would take him over Lucas. And that's even with me really putting so much onus on the offensive line. But Wyatt is really potentially the best three tech in this draft. And um, just, I, I don't see a lot of holes in Wyatt's game necessarily. I love what he'd bring. Love what he'd bring. No, Charles Riley, five, another $5 donation, Charles. Thank you. Says, Brando, the rumor is you do a Pauly Shore impersonation. Save that for the 7K celebration. Work on it, though. What do you mean, buddy? I want to squeeze the juice. I can do a little bit of a, yeah, I can do a little Pauly Shore. I just, got, I just do a lot of, hey, buddy. <laughs> well, I got, we'll do the 7,000 Pauly Shore one. I got to get my impression game up tonight. My impression game's lacking tonight. Why are you getting down on me, buddy? Get up in the snoochy boochy boochy bro, bro. Tack man says 6,000 comes with, <laughs> 6, subs comes with a free mask, but only a cloth mask. Flags have not just from the linebackers, but that was the year Bradley McDougal forgot how to tackle. Yeah, that's true. Definitely got a little bit of a business decision vibe to him in, at times that year. Uh, Megan Gock, Roger Watkin, Cassell, Pacino, draft day. Make it happen, B, and I may stick around for the draft. Sounds good, one. Uh, so we go, Howard, who are we going to pick in this draft? I need to know. It's a hard decision to make for a petulant crew who's as pugnacious and obfuscated as the Seattle Seahawks organization is. Oh. Oh, Howard, Howard, you on? You're overstaying the position, Howard. Let me tell you, who? They gotta go into this draft. They gotta go good. Who are? What do you think, Christopher? I don't know. Seems like a good draft. It's kind of deep. It's not deep, Christopher. I've been telling you, it's overrated. Like that movie you made in 1978 about Vietnam. Who the hell cares about Russian roulette? Howard, I got nominated for an Academy Award, that movie. Watch it again. It's so damn long, Christopher. Oh, oh, long. You want to see long? I'll show you long. If you see my Godfather trilogy, that's long. Hoo ah. <laughs> uh, Ethan Deck will do. I got one for you. Christopher Walken is a Chiefs fan. We lost. This year, we lost. Mahomes too bad. Andy Reid, dumb. No longer knows how to coach. Seems a little tired. Fred Clark's got an Uzi. Firing it. Lamborghini all the time. I don't know why. <laughs> Megan says, you even put up with my love of coach, and that deserves hearty congrats, B. Oh, I don't mind you loving. You know I don't hate on folks. Like I say, Megan, I don't, as I always like to say, no one's got to, no one's got to agree with everything I say. That is definitely not a requirement on this channel to be a part of this channel. And I, I welcome disagreement. 
Uh, very much so. So, and I get it. Look, he's an amazing coach, legendary coach. He's earned the right to have somebody have his back, you know, in that way. Uh, Derek Ben says uh, Jalen Tolbert, wide receiver in South Alabama, is a stud. Check him out. Got some, got some small school guys out there, right? In this draft, Tack Man, right? Especially the wide receiver position. Some kind of under the radar guys. Matthias uh, two three four five one says, "How do you rank these possible defensive coaches hires one to ten? Um, are you talking about just for our Seahawks, Matthias? So, I mean, Clint Hurd is a hire is like a five on a one to ten. Donatell is a secondary coach, just in that role is like a nine. Uh, if you could bring in Sean Desai as another guy, that'd be like a you know an eight nine to get him in here as well. Um, or do you mean like league wide coaches?" Defensive coaches. So if I'm misunderstanding you on that, let me know on that. But that's how I'd rank them as far as who we brought in. Mm. Matthias23451 says, when do you think stuff starts happening for the Seahawks this offseason? The beginning of it will occur here right around the beginning of March, right before the start of the new league year, because then we're going to get a decision made upon what happens with Russell Wilson. That's the first domino that falls before free agency. And one that should fall in right around that time period if it's going to go in that direction. So once we know that, that's going to guide a little more of the direction into free agency. But then you're going to get into, obviously, then before free agency, you've got your own re-signings that will come out. Uh, so if we re-sign DJ Reed or any of our own free agents to new deals, we'll hear at that time. And then you get to free agency. But uh, probably Russell is the first domino, Matthias, that falls on that. Jason Tudor, hey, it's wheezing the juice off to watch Encino Man. No wheezing the juice! I'm just wheezing the juice, buddy. Come on. Don't be lame. Vlad, you uh, responded, Daniel, on that. So Daniel W., uh, Flag's wanting to know who you got on your big board. There we go. Um... Flag Sabbath, I'm not super deep in the prospect watch yet. I'm, I'm like about 30 names in myself, so I also am a little bit slow in getting rolling. I'd hope to get a little ahead of it this year, but I've been a little bit, little bit behind. But I'm, I'm getting like three or four done a day now, Flag, so I'm, I'm getting some – we're getting some forward motion here. We're getting a little forward motion. King Bloop says, uh, who do you think was the best head coaching hire? And I'm, I'm considering it, King, so bear with me. I, like, I kind of like Brian Dayball with the Giants. Uh, that one seems like the one that stands out to me. I, I, what, he got, what he did for Josh Allen, from where Josh Allen started out coming out from Wyoming and as rough as he was uh, to getting him to where he's gotten him, has been pretty amazing. Um, I think that does speak to to, to Dable's ability as a, as a coach, uh, as a, especially an offensive minded coach. He is untested, um, so there's a little bit of that to him. None of the guys that got hired of any of the guys really blew me away. You know, there wasn't any of the any of the ones that I went, "Wow, that was a, that was a fantastic hire." They're, they're okay. They're, there's a lot of risks here. A lot of untested guys. You know. Um, You know, I'd love to say that the guy who went to Jags is the one, but I, you know, I don't know with him. I mean, that one, that's the, that's the best one in theory, I guess. But it, I don't know if I buy it fully, you know. I'm kind of like, I don't know about him down there in Jacksonville. But it's probably the best one. Flag like Sabbath says Cameron Thomas is the San, San Diego State kid, right? Yeah. He's a, there, there's a couple guys on this draft, inside, outside guys. He's one of those guys where half his snaps you see him playing on the inside, half your snaps you see him playing on the outside. Real athletic kid, um, awesome with his hands, really understands how to, to, to chain pass rush moves together, um, can get free off if his first move doesn't work. There's a lot of pass rushers in this draft. If their first move doesn't work like Kayvon Thibodeau, they're done. Um, he's a guy that can chain the moves together where, oh, you, you, you took this away, and now I'll go to this and, and smoothly go to it. 
smoothly go to it. Um, not uber quick, not uber twitchy, but athletic, great technician with his hands. Um, some good upside to the kid. I think he's a second round, second round cat where he probably find, where he probably lands at the end of the day. Jason Tudor says, with Miami hiring an offensive-minded OC, do you think Russ considers them a viable trade partner? Sure. I mean, sure. I, I think that Russ would not necessarily, I mean, the one thing to consider with this, Jason, is that he's, you know, I'm guessing that he's going to bring a lot of the run-heavy approach of San Francisco with him to Miami. I don't know if they're going to go to more of the pass-heavy approach that Russ might want. Um, so beyond just having an offensive-minded head coach, he might want a guy that actually is going to throw the ball a little bit too, uh, rather than we're going to have you throw 23 times this game, Russ. Um, I don't know if that would appeal to him. But um, it's a possibility. It certainly opens the door up more for Miami versus having Brian Flores there. Daniel W. said the Josh Allen turnaround is probably one of the better turnarounds in recent sports history. Josh Allen's first two years, he looked like a complete bust. Third season, now a top five quarterback. Yeah. I mean, I, I think by second year, he was starting to round out last year pretty good too. Um, so he was, he was starting to get into that spot of things by last year. I could be off my timeline with him. But um, yeah, it's been an amazing turnaround. And he came out of the draft rough. I mean, Wyoming, 50% completion percentage. Obviously, he wasn't having a lot of great talent around him to throw to. But, man, there were some missed throws on his tape coming out of Miami, some wild throws coming out of Miami. And it tightened it all up since he's come to the pros. It's been very impressive to watch. Um, Uh, Daniel W., have you seen Darnell Parnham, center prospect, to go round three, fourth round? I would love the Seahawks to take him. Watched a little in passing, but not gotten a good enough field off him yet, Daniel. So I've got to, well, let me do a deeper dive on him. I'll add him to my list here. Um, and again, sorry, I am a little bit behind on my list of, of guys to scout, but we will get through them. We'll get them, we'll get all these guys locked in. So, especially at a position like this that's going to be potentially a position of need and a guy that can maybe help us. Danny McCormick, oh, baby, you're live. Long time see you, no see, brother. What's up, Danny? Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. Danny says, happy to be here, only for a little while. I have to be up at 6.15. Oh, no worries, man. No worries. Any Anytime you get in here is great for me, man. So it's good to see you. In tech world, would say, would you say Ichiro was a top 25 player of all time? No, no, maybe a top 25 positional player of all time. But when you factor in the pitch, the pitchers that have, that have been in this game from Sandy Koufax on down, uh, you know, you got to factor in, there's going to be probably 10 pitchers that make that list, which means there's 15 position players that are better than Ichiro. hundred percent. Yep. 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 Hoodie Jube. What's up, man? Thank you for the $5 donation hoodie. Appreciate you. Says, I'm a Saints YouTuber and would like to collab with you in the future, man. Also, what are your thoughts on maybe Wilson being out the door? Uh, Hoodie, I'm, I'm happy to do a collab with you in the future, man. And thank you for the donation. Very kind of you to do so. Uh, if you can, just reach out to me um, on Twitter. I'm Seahawks Nestor over there or on uh, Instagram, if not there. Either way on that one. Or just post the comment in this thing so I can reach out to you on, on where your path is on that so I can hit you up off online. But I'm happy to do coll collabs and uh, would love to do it. Um, my thoughts on Russell Wilson being out the door. I, I think it's literally a little bit of a 50-50. Um, Hoodie, I've been predicting for a couple of years now, and especially this last offseason as we came into this year, that if the Seahawks didn't do what Russell Wilson was asking them to do, which was build a great offensive line, get more dynamic offensively, um, that indeed he went through this season of doing more of the same of what you've done over the last four and five years, that that would lead to Russell Wilson demanding a trade this off season. And so what happens this year, you don't address the offensive line as he asked, really Gabe Jackson was it. And that's not a major addressing at that point. That's not really putting a lot of assets into it, is it? And then you go out and see him get hit every bit as much as he's been hit out over the course of his career, every bit at the same kind of rate he's been hit at the course of his career. And then he gets broken majorly for the first time in his career being hit by the player who has hit, sacked him, and harassed him more than any other player in the NFL by a wide margin. The same player who your Seattle Seahawks have never gone out and actually found an offensive lineman who could even come what, somewhat near to blocking him. 
Um, some of this makes me believe that this is going to stick a little bit in the craw of Russell Wilson. And I think that that's going to maybe cause him to drive for a trade. Some of the issue that comes up with this hoodie, as I'm sure uh, you know, your, your Saints would maybe be interested in a Wilson, obviously needing quarterback, is that the landscape has changed a little bit. Russell Wilson submitted a list of four teams last year that he wanted to go to that were offensive-minded head coached teams. So your Saints were one of those teams. The Bears were one of those teams. The uh, Raiders were one of those teams. You know? um, the Cowboys were one of those teams. Well, the Cowboys are off the board now, right? Dak's been signed to a contract extension. That's not going to happen. Sean Payton has left your your Saints team. Um, The cap situation that you guys find yourselves in, the lack of playmakers on the outside, though you have a good offensive line, you're probably going to lose to Ron Armstead this offseason. So it doesn't look as solidly necessarily as it did last offseason. The Bears went out and drafted their quarterback of the future in Justin Fields, so that trade's probably not going to happen that way. Um. And then you look at the Raiders bringing in Josh McDaniels. Josh McDaniels is not going to bring in Russell Wilson to run his offense. Russell Wilson cannot run the Josh McDaniels offense. So some of these, you, you put the door emoji in there, some of those doors have closed uh, that were there last offseason. And when you look at the teams that are available out around the league, certainly Broncos might appeal to him. But um, that's as much just because of the state of the team, not because of the market. Russell wants to go to a bigger market that can elevate his star brighter Those teams don't seem to be available out there. So I do think it does come down to, I don't like to sit on the fence hoodie. I like to actually come down and give you, this is what's going to happen. This is how it's going to go. But this is one place where I do firmly land on the fence of telling you, I'm not really entirely sure which way it could go. I think it's also a little bit of a fluid situation. And that some of this may be that the front office has come to Wilson this offseason and given them some assurances, i.e. we're going to build you an offensive line for the first time in your career, a legitimate one. But it is, uh, it is one that still remains a bit of a question mark for me, Hoodie, because of the, the way that this has played out this past year. You know, the front office basically ignored him when he called on them to stop having him get hit as much. I can't, I can't help but think that that's going to carry some kind of weight as we go forward. But uh, again, hit me up. I'm Seahawks Nestor on Twitter. Please hit me up over there and uh, DM me over there, and we can set up a time to do a collab, man. Happy to do it. Love to do it. Charles Riley with a $5 donation. Thank you, Charles. Another one, my man, says... Uh, from now on, any serious question I ask from Super Chat should be answered with the Pauly Shore impersonated answer. Mind you, this will be post 7K. All right, well, let me try out. All right, buddy. You want to do it like that? I'll do it like that, man. Snooch the Bucci, buddy. What question you want to know about our Seahawks, my guy? I'm going to have to work on my Pauly. <laughs> I just want to do it now, but he's basically just, he's basically Valley Girl with, as a dude. <laughs> Valley Girl with a limit, little fem, femininity. Is how you got to do Paul Shore. <laughs> Thank you for the five dollar donation, Charles. And it's it's a bet. It's a bet, man. Everybody will be wondering why I keep doing the voice, but you and I will know. Uh, Danny McCormick, I know none of us were happy with C- Seattle keeping Pete and John, but I'm buying in this season for some reason. I think Seattle is keen on getting a better pass rush and run game, and that will help. Uh, I'm still hopeful for the season two, Danny. I think you you sum up pretty much what we all stand at was that we didn't think this is necessarily the right direction to go, but we're supportive of the team. We're hopeful of the team. And and there's no guarantees in the sport of football. You're guaranteed to be bad. You're guaranteed to be good. There's wild fluctuations every single year. Um, it's about making the right moves in an off season. Um, you know, for instance, like, take a look, uh, we've got the Saints fan in here. You know, a couple of years ago, the Saints were starting to be on a little bit of a pathway where the talent was drying, drying up out the door. Um, it was, you were kicking the can down the road with Breeze's contract. And then they had that fabulous, what was it, the 2019 draft, where it was like every pick they hit on. And every one of those guys came out on the football field and was a player for them. And uh, really brought their team back up to a new elevated position of being really good. Um, one of the top teams in the NFC during that time period by just having that one great draft, that one great offseason. Well, Seattle can do the same here, Danny. One great offseason can accomplish it. And they, while they don't have a first-round pick, they have them all the rest of their picks. Uh, they've got, what, the seventh, sixth most amount of cap space in the NFL with an ability to clear a lot more cap space beyond that. They could be sitting with the, the second, the third, the first most amount of cap space depending on how many players they want to cut back. That's a lot of ammunition to go use out on the open free market at that point. If they can get it done. They can get it done. The key for me, Daniel, Danny, not Daniel, Daniel, Brian, the key for me, Danny, and this is, the, this is where the rubber meets the road for me. Do you fix the mistakes that have plagued you for the past five or six years? 
the places that you've gone wrong, the places that you've gone light, the places that you've not done enough on, do you address those in a fashion that you've not addressed them in five to six years? If you don't, you'll continue to make the same mistakes you made prior. You'll continue to be a team with its high end at a one and done state. Fix them and you can be elite as anybody else in this sport. Absolutely. ADL Williams, I listened for three hours, went and got dinner, ate, took the dogs out, took a 90 minute nap and just woke up and he's still freaking talking Hawks. What a champ. <laughs> Thank you, ADL. I go deep, man. I go deep. Daniel says, sorry, Dylan Parnum, not Darnell Parnum. Okay. Let me, let me change it on my deal because I'll be searching that thing and going, where's Darnell, man? Where is Darnell? Dylan. Gotcha. I'm looking him up. Looking him up. Uh, Danny McCormick, I need to grind my ass off this year to afford real estate school. I hate working 7.30 to 4.30, but I got to grind now to shine later. We're all on that point, Danny. You know what I mean? We're all in that grind. I got a full-time job. Do the channel in addition to that for someday where we'll be able to do this full-time. You know, and you, you, you put in a little bit now for the returns on it later. That's all what, we, what we're all kind of hoping for. Flag Zappa says, apparently my interior O-line scouting is bad because I thought and still think David Moore out of grambling was the end-all be-all, He's a pra and he's a practice squad guy. Flag, you and I missed, missed on that one too. That's one of my misses from last year's draft was David Moore. I was really high on him. I liked a lot of what I saw out of him, but it didn't seem to take when he got onto an NFL roster, you know? But boy, you watch some of his tape with grambling, and he is just crushing dudes, crushing them. Um, but that's one of my misses too, Flag. My miss too, man. Uh, uh, Hoodie uh, says, uh, I, su I subscribed to you on Twitter at Hoodie Jube. All right, man. I'll hit you up. I'll, I'll see it up on my deal. I'll hit you up on the thing. So sounds good, brother. Appreciate you hitting me up. And thank you for, the, thank you for all the donations too, by the way. Um, and yeah, I'm glad to do, glad to any day at time do a collab. So I do Wednesdays and uh, Sundays on the channel here for my live stream, but I've got a pretty good schedule around that that I can usually fit in. So um, let me know. Let me know. Love to do it. Daniel W says, Clint Hurd was upset when the Seahawks let Jadavian Clowney leave. I'm hoping he can push for JS to sign him in, off, in the offseason. Would pair well with Daryl Taylor. Um, I can confirm on this one, Daniel, because Jadavian is, of course, one of my, I think he's my only player inside contact that I've had here since doing the channel. Um, but I still have him on my friends list on Xbox. I can still go play with him whenever I want. I just don't get time to game anymore. Um, but he did speak to having a, a fondness for Clint Hurt. He liked, he liked playing for Clint. 100% on that. Danny McCormick wants us to grab Harold Landry. He's a possibility. He's a possibility. And boy, having Harold Landry and Daryl Taylor on both sides, that is some, that is some uh, giddy up and go off the corners. <laughs> That's some guys that got uh, some, some very good quickness to their game. Um, Harold's going to get paid. And the Titans, as I was just speaking about a second ago, you know, they've got to make a decision on A.J. Brown. They've got to make a decision on their interior uh, defensive tackle down there, right? Um, Jeffrey Simmons. And then you still have Taylor Lewan to deal with. And then you still have even Kevin Bayard, who might be eligible for a new contract. Probably leaves Harold on a little bit on the outside looking in um, as far as the Titans who are over the cap right now. So he will probably be on the open market. He's going to cost a tidy sum, but he's a very good pass rusher. Ethan Deckworld, now I saw this comment making a case. Now I saw this comment making a case that Griffey being outside of the top 10 is not crazy because of the second half of his career. What do you say to that? I put him in the top 10 still. Uh, well, let's put the people above Griffey on that list. You, you know, you have, you'd have uh, Babe Ruth, obviously. Mickey Mantle might have a say on that, of being over the top of him with that one. Um, Griffey and Willie Mays are probably very close to each other. Um, you would probably give some pitchers, you'd probably give a couple pitchers on that list. Um, Satchel Page, Sandy Koufax. Hell, Cy Young maybe even on that. Um, <sighs> Boy, Griffey's, Griffey's right there, man. 
He's right there on that near spot of it. I, I don't know if I could give it to him clear cut, but he's right there. And if he's not inside the top 10, he's just barely on the outside looking in. So it's, he certainly has a, he has a claim in my opinion. There's probably some guys I'm forgetting though, that probably like, you know, like a Brooks Robinson third bay. Was he, you know, Griff was Griff Bay and Griff Robinson, high plate third base. And maybe, yeah, maybe. It's good. It's a good debate on that one. It's a good debate. Charles says that Megan Grock Rogers, if you're lucky enough to meet Brando on your affairs in the Northwest, I think Brando would be wise having his father near. <laughs> uh, Jason says not disagreeing, uh, but why do you think Russell can't run McDaniel's offense? Uh, a couple of different reasons for this. Number one, McDaniel's runs as short route concepts as any offensive coordinator in the NFL. Um, and Russell Wilson struggles as much as anything in his game with throw, sh throwing short and intermediate routes. Um, Russ is also a guy that doesn't want to throw with anticipation. He wants to see it open. He wants to make sure he's not throwing into an interception. This is a good thing in a lot of respects, but it also throws, it also reduces Jason, a lot of his anticipatory throws from his game. Well, McDaniels asks his quarterbacks to throw with anticipation constantly. If you're running a, five yard slant or a four yard out route, you're not having as many yards to generate that separation between you and the corner. So there's going to be, it's going to be tighter, which means if it's going to be tighter, the quarterback's got to throw to a space, a spot rather than throwing to the man. All these things just aren't exactly part of Russell Wilson's game. It's just not how he rolls. So I, I think it would be a problem uh, the option route aspect as well as McDaniel's offense. I, I don't know if Wilson suits as well to that option route stuff. We're both going to try to read this on the fly and both try to read it correctly. I, I would be hesitant to believe that that's necessarily a part of Russ's game as much as well. Danny W, uh, Seattle's, Russell's trade options were better last season with so many coaches on the hot seat. Now with new coaches in Miami, New York, Denver, they all have time. They don't need to sell the farm to win now. Um... I, I kind of disagree a bit on that, Daniel. Um, a, a lot of what drove Russell's lack of market last year was that there was five top-end quarterbacks in the draft, right? Lawrence, um, Fields, um, Mac Jones, Trey Lance. I guess the, yeah, I guess that's four. I feel like I'm forgetting a name. Oh, and, and uh, the Jets quarterback. So you had five top-end quarterbacks. All five of those quarterbacks taken in that draft in the top 15 picks would all be taken, Daniel, higher than any of the quarterbacks in this particular draft. So the way this factors from my standpoint on this then is teams around the league aren't going to be able to look to the draft as easily in this draft and say, there's our guy. New York's not going to be able to say, okay, we don't think Daniel Jones is going to be it, but our guy's definitely in this draft. No, not necessarily. The Eagles with Jalen Hurts, who they, not, may not, they may not be sold on Jalen Hurts, are going to look at this draft and go, well, but the answer's not here either. So... That's going to drive some of this as well, I think. And, and my opinion is, is that there'll maybe be more of a market because you have multiple teams with multiple first-round picks and a bit of a need at quarterback. Now, their coaches do have the time to find the guys they want to find, but you do want to kickstart your quarterback as fast as you can as an offensive-minded head coach. You don't want to be sitting waiting a year. You wait a year, you end up waiting two to three years, and you could end up finding yourself as an offensive-minded head coach not ever really landing your quarterback that is your guy. You end up getting stuck with a guy or just trying to get by on a guy. Um, so it's it's possible that it gives them a little bit of ability to take some to take some of their time. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I think the market's going to be much more driven hotter than it was last offseason. Where Daniel, last offseason, who were the teams that were even looking at kicking the tires on Russell? It was Chicago and... And... I mean, almost kind of about it. This offseason, I could see the Giants, I could see the Eagles, I could see the Dolphins, even outliers, even like the Saints coming in and being more willing this offseason if they want to go crazy town with it. I don't think it's going to have a huge market, but I do think it's going to be a little bit widened out than what it was last uh, offseason. Mario Lara Quiros, uh, what's your score prediction for the Super Bowl? Laughing out loud, or should I wait till you do another live later in the week? No, Mario, it's never too early to ask a question like this. Um... Let's go with uh, let's go with twenty seven twenty four Rams. 
by three. But I got the Rams winning this one, Mario. What well, Yummy7947 uh, says, can someone explain to me why everybody seems to want Chandler Jones to come to us? Hello, by the way. Hey, what's up, Yummy? Good to see you in the chat. Uh, I don't know on this one. It's one of my ones that gets, it's, it's getting more increasingly frustrating for me on, on talking on certain guys that people want to see brought to Seattle who are three, four outside linebackers who don't really, don't put their hand in the dirt, have never put their hand in the dirt, have never put their hand in the dirt and rushed. And, and guys just have a comfortability with being an outside three, four linebacker, especially they've done it for 14 odd years versus now asking him to be a down defensive end and trying to do it that way. Um, I've been out on Chandler for a long time with this Yami. Not that he isn't a good player, not that he couldn't help the team out, but he's just not a scheme fit. And you got to look to what is a scheme fit and why go out there and find a guy that you're going to ask do something different for the first time in his career versus finding a guy that just does it naturally. Um, and Robert Quinn is the guy that I mentioned for this. Robert Quinn is great with the Rams, awesome with the Rams, amazing with the Rams, is a 4-3 defensive end blindside rusher. The Miami Dolphins sign him to big money, and what do they do? try to turn him into an outside 3-4 linebacker, and he goes into the tank. Then the Cowboys then sign him after it washes out in the Dolphins, and he's tremendous for them, and he's tremendous for the Bears as a down lineman. So you, know, you got to utilize the guys in the right way and into what they do well. Ethan says, Griffey was part of what saved Mariners baseball, and for that, I will forever appreciate beyond what I can express. Me as well, Ethan. I got nothing but love for Griff. Nothing but love. Ethan Deckroll, part of me, part of what brought him down for me just a smidge was how he didn't keep his conditioning and looked like he never even lifted a weight. Do you think he just lost interest with all the injuries? Now it's a little bit of a different era in baseball. And, and Griffey, there was a little bit of this, which was sandbagging done by Griffey, um, where he would, he would say, I don't lift weights, I don't do stretching, I don't do any of this, and then he'd be going home and doing the weightlifting stuff. So it was part of a little bit of the aura Griffey was trying to create um, that it was just this natural freak, um, freak show. Um, but he did work on stuff. He probably wasn't as much as he got later into his career into that stuff, but he also just came from that older generation of baseball where the weightlifting stuff wasn't as commonplace as it was becoming over the course of his career when the steroid era was really kicking up a notch. Um, well, baseball players were known for years for his, once they got in their thirties for being a little pudgy, a little paunchy. Flag Sabbath says, David Moore was just such a bowling ball in college. Oh, he was. Heavy hands, just hammering guys, playing with attitude. He could move well. I am surprised he was on the, on the practice squad for the whole year. Kind of shocked me, too. Kind of shocked me, too. Hoodie with another $10 donation. Thank you, Hoodie. You're being very kind of chat, man. I appreciate you on that, brother. He says, thanks for wanting to collab in the future. And night to you, man. I got to go to bed. Work two jobs in YouTube. Also, no problem, man, on the donations. Great channel, by the way. Read all your comments. Read all your comments like I do. That's the way you got to do it, me, Hootie. You got to read your comments, man. And not just the ones that pay, but the people that are talking. It's why I go for so long that I do. I love going for so long, but I also think you guys come in here and you watch me and you're going you're gonna to make a comment or have a question. The least I can do is answer because you've done me the, the great respect and honor of uh, having watched me. So thanks for the $10 donation. I'm happy to do the clap, man. Um, and always like uh, reaching out with other channels and stuff. So uh, we'll love it. And thank you again for all the donations. Glad to hear you do, the, do it as I do it, man. Some folks just like to talk with all the people that just do the donations. And eventually when I get too many subs, I'm going to probably be able to only do it on the folks that are doing the, the donos. But as long as I can now, I'm going to hold up as long as I can reading everybody's chat because I love it. Big Country says Ted Williams is probably better than Griffey. Yep, Ted would be better. Agreed on that one, Big Country. So you got Ted. I think you probably got to put... You probably got to put Mickey Mantle in there. You probably got to put a – gets harder with pitchers. Um, Babe Ruth in there, obviously. Hank Aaron's the tough one because Hank was longevity. He's longevity more than anything else. Dante King, how do you feel about Cade Mays? I think the Seahawks should draft him in the second round or third round. He's nice. Uh, good, great name. I've seen the name. I have not looked him up, though. So I'm definitely a little bit behind on my looking up on the, on the prospects. I'm sorry about that. But I'm adding it to my list, Dante, and hit me back in a week, and we'll have some, uh, I'll have some thoughts. I'm hoping I get another uh, good 15 players here before we get to the next live stream, so. 
Danny W., that's true with the top five, uh, with five top end quarterbacks. But this year, coaches can sit for a year or two and wait for a quarterback. They don't need a quarterback this year to keep their job or even next. But good counterpoint. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, Daniel. It will be. And some of it's less to do about thinking the market's going to be thriving for wanting Russell and more of that I felt like it was just a little bit last year. Um, there just wasn't any options. Just felt like it was almost like no teams were just in a position to do anything with it, you know. But we'll see. It'll be interesting to monitor. Brett Charles Riley, Brando, I got to tell it straight. Griffey might have taken the spike. What do we really know? Injuries are associated with performance enhancers. Are we really thinking Ken Griffey Jr. is not a human being? Uh, I don't think Griffey Jr. took the, the steroids. I, I don't think he took it. I don't, I, I, in fact, I, number one, Griffey's, Griffey's head didn't get bigger. Right, Charles? So Griffey didn't get a bigger head as he got into his 30s. Barry Bonds' head went two sizes larger. Mark McGuire's head went two sizes larger. Um, people that do this type of stuff, your head gets bigger. It's one of the, down, it's one of the ways that you can tell What's a going on down there? And that didn't go on with Griffey. He also didn't get into his most jacked shape and most ripped shape into his 30s, as was with Rafael Palmero and Roger Clemens and uh, Barry Bonds and the guys that were Royd now, they're Mark McGuire, right? Where they're, they're, they're getting better as they're getting older. Actually, what you would tend to see and what you've seen in baseball is that as you get into your 30s, you do start to break down. You do start to be lesser of a player. Um, and so really what happened with Griffey was more what happens to traditional ball players as they go along. And where really the injuries came from, in my opinion, Charles, was that Griffey played the majority of his career on AstroTurf. And that AstroTurf was really hard on the knees. 81 games a year on AstroTurf, about pounding on those knees, no give, no cushion, not like grass. It's going to wear your lower, leg out, lower legs out. It's going to wear them down. It's going to cause injuries from that. I think a lot of that came from Griffey playing for a lot of his career on that AstroTurf. But no, I... There's a, there's a famous story that happened, and I believe it is true. I don't think Griffey's completely confirmed it, but there were people that were in the room at the time that it's been spoken about where Bonds and Griffey and their families were having dinner, and they were talking about what was going on with Bosa, with Bonds and Sammy Sosa at the time when they were having their, their chase after Roger Maris. And both Griffey and Bonds were lamenting the fact they both knew these guys were steroid abusers. They both had used steroids to do what they were doing, and how... Griffey and Bonds were doing it naturally, but they weren't being held in such high revere, high regard, um, because they couldn't put up those kind of numbers because they weren't using the juice. And Bonds at that time says, I'm going to start using it. To hell with them. I'm going to show them what really happens when you use this stuff. They're going to let you do it. And Griffey said, I can't do that. I have too much respect for the game. Um, I think Griffey didn't do it. I don't. Daniel uh, says, one major outlier, though, we don't discuss is NFL as a business. A team like the Giants would make so much money just off having Russell and or making the playoffs even as a seventh seed. Owners want money. Russell brings in dollars more than first-round rookies do. Uh, this is a great point on this, uh, to counter a little bit of the coaches have enough time to be able to, to do what they want to do. Well, if it's an owner coming in to make a decision, if it's an owner who needs a win, um, that can drive this as much as anything else, as much as the fit on the football field, as much as the fit with the head coach. And certainly owners in the past have driven these type of decisions down the pike. They have. So um, it's a possibility. And that is the one thing I wondered. This is one of the things I've said that for me makes this the Giants fit the number one fit. Multiple first round picks, an organization in disarray, a fan base that has been you know, long proud of the, of the franchise. They have some Super Bowl championships. They're not the Jets as a fan base goes, but it's been pretty raw for a few years now. It's been pretty bad football for quite a bit of time. Russell Wilson gives them an instantaneous win in the public relations standpoint of things, instantaneously. And that, that's a decision that can go beyond a coach's call. Say nothing of the fact that, honestly, it's kind of beyond a coach's call anyway when it comes to making a trade like this for Russell Wilson. It's going to be driven anyway by the general manager more than it is by the coach. Coach will be included, but he's not going to be driving the decision-making unless he has that kind of control and power like Coach Carroll does. Charles Riley says, remember Griffey Jr. retired because he got caught sleeping in the clubhouse? He might have just been a lazy guy taking roids and got hurt because he wouldn't work. He wouldn't work. Maybe. Maybe. I, I don't know, man. He was, he was a naturally talented kid coming on. He didn't have that bump in, in performance. It was, it was his natural ascension as he got into his mid-20s. He was at his best. I, I don't know. 
I can't ascribe it unless I've got something as far as any, even just a, um, a, a bit of proof to it. Um, I do think he was very naturally gifted. Um, I don't know if he was as hard a worker as some of the other guys out there would be. I think definitely later on in his career, he got a little bit lax. I do. Um, but we'll never know, man. Sander Champion with a $5 donation, 6,000 subscribers, exclamation point. Congratulations, my man. Feels like yesterday you hit 5,000. Thanks for being a consistent voice all these years, especially in this tougher one. On to 1 million. On to 1 million. Six to 1 million. That's the jump you make on this standard champion. And thank you for the $5 donation. Thank you for all your support on the channel. Donated many times before to the channel and a longtime uh, subscriber and watcher. I appreciate that about you. And uh, it does. It feels good getting over 6,000. And yeah, we just hit 5,000. The growth here has just been consistently hammering away here through the last three years. Always going forward. Always going forward. Never going backwards. Every time I check and look in, oh, it's another 10, another 15. Oh, another 20 here. We'll do a stream. And oh my God, we got 50 on this stream. So uh, it's been good. The consistency has been there. We've been really running along with it. And uh, it's been encouraging. Been very encouraging to see. And uh, I, just on onwards now, man. 10,000 is getting closer and closer. That's my next marker. And then maybe a million. Maybe we'll go a million after that. Uh, it's Complete TV says, could DK be traded from Seattle? Yes, 100% he could be traded from Seattle. Um, he's due to be put on a contract extension. Seattle could seemingly probably get a first round and like a third round pick for him. That's in a year where you're out of first round pick, that could be a tantalizing uh, option for our Seahawks front office. They may not want to pay him that kind of money that he's going to command, which is going to be probably upwards of $20 million plus a year, which is a lot to pay a guy. Um, so those could drive it. I don't think it will happen. I don't think it will happen, but could it happen? Yeah. It's no guarantee that they just sign him to a contract extension, especially if a team is willing to offer some good assets for him. Danny W., it is weird to think about because you trade a commodity like Russell Wilson, they're paying him, but how much money do owners make a year if they pay him 40? They probably make 120. So over four years, that's 480. Yeah, I, I think owners make a good amount of money every year. You know, I, I think they make, owners are, are reeling it in yearly. And then when they sell the team, they make a, a kajillion dollars on those kind of deals. Um, but it doesn't, I, I think no team is operating at a loss in the NFL right now, Daniel. Not as popular as this sport is. Not with the rev revenue sharing that is in place in the NFL. Daniel says, uh, mill for having Russell that the Giants could make. Oh, yeah, they make a lot more money. Yeah, you can make a lot of money on stuff. Again, the, the NFL does do a little bit of the, it, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a profit-sharing situation in the NFL. Um, so they, they do a little bit of the revenue-sharing thing. What are you doing? Yeah. So I, I don't know if they would make more money by having Russell come aboard, per se. Maybe it would. Maybe it would factor out to somehow make out more money for them, like they charge more for tickets, for instance, potentially. Uh, Dante King, I also like Tyreek Smith. He's a beast on the edge. He played for Ohio State. I think he would be a difference maker on the edge for the Seahawks. I, I'm not as big on Tyreek Smith, Dante. I'm not. Um, he's, he had a really good senior bowl week, so I'll, I'll definitely give you that. Um, he's looked better this senior bowl um, than he did on the tape that he provided in Ohio State. But there were just times where he disappeared in football games that I watched of him just kind of disappeared. And I was, I was watching one game with him on one of the tackles I was watching. It might've been Daniel Fa'alele going up against him. And I think Fa'alele dominated him in their matchup. If I remember correctly, I could be thinking of a different guy, but Tyreek just didn't, not a lot of production at Ohio state. He only had a couple of sacks last year. Again, looked really good in senior bowl, but it, it doesn't match to what you really saw on the tape from him, in my opinion. Charles Riley with another $5 donation. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate you, buddy. He says, Brando, fair point, but none of the others besides Bond's heads got bigger. Sammy Sosa's head got bigger. Mark McGuire had a big, don big noggin already to start with, but it got bigger as well. The forehead got bigger on, on, uh, on McGuire. Though I will say with McGuire and Kinsenko, those guys were juicing so young, right? Like some of it's they're juicing so young. <laughs> Rafael Palmero's head got bigger. Look at that guy at 22, and then look at that guy at 36. That thing's a, that's a big old melon. And I know, and, and Rogers like Mark McGuire. Those guys already had big, fat heads anyway. But they, they definitely got a, a smidge bigger. 
when they started when they started putting on some of that clear some that clear stuff Megan I was just thinking about the Simpsons episode with Burns and the baseball players <laughs> and the over enlarged heads <laughs> hmm Daniel says, we all love Charles in the chat, but he's speaking sacrilege right now with his griffy hate. <laughs> True. I got to reverse him off this, man. I got to do it. Flag Zappa says, as a kid in elementary school in the 90s, Ken Griffey Jr. made 50 plus games in the kingdom. Uh, I, I made it to 50 plus games in the kingdom, and I, uh, I saw electric. Uh, best game I ever saw was him and Juan Gonzalez from the Texas Rangers just going ham. Yeah, he was to watch Griffey in person. It's say something. Baseball players aren't always the funnest to watch in person, right? It's really almost sometimes you can best appreciate a player um, almost at times with what you're watching off off the TV. You know, getting them see him kind of close up like that. Griffey was a guy though that just, especially in the outfield, man, when he would move and go after a ball, it was just something different. And the way the ball would jump off of his bat. I mean, I was in the stadium the night he hit, I think, the seventh home run in a row, and he put that thing off like the third deck and it, with authority. Like that thing, it, it, when it hit the deck, like it, in, a, in, a, in, the, in the stadium that was screaming at that time, it still like was louder than our screams. He hit the ball so hard. It's an amazing player. Larry Bird, thank you for the $2 donation. This is kind of blue, so trying to show some gratitude. Oh, Larry, man, I'm sorry you're feeling down, man. Keep the head up there. Thank you for the donation. I appreciate you on that. It's the we're in the doldrums of winter right now, man. You know, it's dark, over cloud, uh, gray. Or summer seems still really far away, man. It's everyone's everyone's having a little bit of rough go at it to a degree or a bit. But uh, keep your head up, man. Don't let it get you down too much. And you know, you're here with us, man. Hang in there. I appreciate you on that, man. Very kind. I hope uh, hope tomorrow runs around. Hope it's maybe a better start to the week next uh, tomorrow for you on that. Danny W., on a note of big heads, Peyton's, after needing neck surgery, grew about three times. He was definitely on steroids towards the ends of his career. There was something about his wife having it sent to her or something like that. Uh, yeah, Peyton's a little suspect. A little suspect to going from that, that surgery that he had and, and being in the place where he was at to being able to still throw the ball like he was able to throw post. And again, it's hard with those guys that already got the big heads to start out with. They have a little built-in advantage on the steroid usage front. You know what I mean? It's the small-headed guys that you can instantaneously find and go, ah, ah, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Dante King, if you haven't, uh, you should look at Leon O'Neal. He is a safety and should also look at JT Woods. Leon O'Neal and JT Woods. I gotcha. I'll take a look. Megan says, okay, 12s, I out, um, am out. It's 7 p.m. down here. Congratulations on 6,000 once again, B, and thanks for putting up with my deep and underlying love for Coach Carol. No problem, Megan. Easy to do so. I love having you in the chat, and you uh, have a great rest of your evening down there, Dan Ender. Dan Ender, don't you get yourself near crook? Not yourself near crook down there, Megan. You yourself safe down there. Uh, Brian Kowski, I was in Toronto when Griffey hit his eighth in a row. Oh, that would have been amazing to see. He always seemed to, he liked that stadium, Toronto. He always seemed to hit pretty well up in there, and that ball carries there. But one of the most amazing runs in baseball history to hit those home runs in that many games straight, uh, just amazing. But that, that, was the, that was who Griffey was, just an amazing player. It's almost an understatement to call him that. It's like doesn't doesn't capture it right. Charles Riley says, I apologize to you in the chat, Brando, but I will agree to disagree on the myth of Ken Griffey Jr. not spiking. And also being a team player. His father was a team player. Junior wasn't. I mean, maybe so. Like, again, for me, Charles, this is my one of my heroes growing up. He's right there with my largent love as far as this is the guy that was a hero for me. Baseball was my first love of sport. I molded my swing on Ken Griffey Jr. Um, so he's a guy that's got just that special place for me in, in my sport. I'm, I'm nowhere near unbiased when it comes to Ken Griffey Jr. Um, but again, I, I, I was paying really close attention to that steroid era and what Griffey was going through versus what Bonds did. And while Bonds was remaining on the field and remaining healthy and hitting balls into the bay, Griffey was falling apart, breaking down. And maybe it was a matter of a lack of work ethic, but it also 
makes just as much sense to say it's just him naturally aging as baseball players would, especially for a player like him who came up at 19 years old and had a lot of games under his belt by the time he got into his 30s. Flag Sabbath, I also told the story on here before, but my 12th birthday, I think it was Griffey was rehabbing after the ankle injury with the Rainiers, and he found out it was my birthday, and he sat me. Oh, he sat with me? That's awesome, man. With my family and George Carl, with his family and George Carl. Then he talked to me after the game, and it was a totally holy S moment. Oh, that's awesome, man. That just makes me endeared all that much more to Kenny. Makes me endeared all that much more to Kenny, man. And I, I, I just, I think at the end of the day, he's a good dude. Nobody's perfect. Um, he had a lot to live up to being the, the prodigy he was and coming up as he was. Uh, it doesn't always end out good for prodigies, right? A lot of them end up on the, look at a guy like Josh Hamilton and what happened with that guy. Um, but he was one that he, he realized his promise tapped into every bit of it. He was a joy to watch on the football field. He brought a lot of baseball fans to the sport. One of a kind, one of a kind. And no worries, Charles. Like I say, you don't have to, we don't all have to agree on here. It's the one thing I'm definitely okay with not having to be. Brian Gosky says the winter Olympics in China kind of sucks. Go curling. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, I, I have no excitement for the winter Olympics. I don't have any excitement for the summer Olympics though. Just kind of just, I just sort of, yeah. I like, I like team sports. Individual sports don't do anything for me. It's why I hate when we get to individuals starting to gl gloss themselves up over the team and elevate themselves over the team. The, the thing that draws me to sports is the team-centric nature of us all pulling together to accomplish this great thing. Not one guy dominating everybody else and, and, and the, the majesticness of that. Uh, Megan says, okay, B, for 7K, get your Aussie accent right, damn it. I'm trying again, Bob, damn it. I'll go, I, I'm going to work on it, Megan. I, I, if I said Dan Ender, I can, I can do that good. Put another shrimp on the barbie. Oh, I bet you love hearing that one, Megan. Put another shrimp in the barbie. Dango ate my baby. Dango ate my baby. <laughs> Brian Kosky, my, co my cousin uh, Colleen Jones is world championship curler, Googler. She's from Halifax. All right, I'll check her out. Is she a hot curler? Um, Charles Riley says, how old was Hank Aaron when he retired? Oh my God. What was it? 42. <laughs> he, he was old. He played a long time. Did Hank long time down to King. I, I got some more people for you to look at. If you haven't, uh, looked at, uh, their cornerbacks Cam uh, Cam Taylor, Britt and seven banks. I have looked at seven banks. Um, seven banks is, um, he's a little bit like, I'm writing down, hold on. I'm writing down Cam Taylor Britt. Um, seven banks is a really good zone corner with Ohio state. Um, very much a little bit like Trent McDuffie with Washington, where he's played in a real scheme. That's got some similarities to what Seattle does asked to do a lot of the same uh, similarities of what Seattle asked their corners to do. So he'd be a, a, a pretty fluent fit into Seattle if you were to bring him here, seven. Um, he's got a little bit more closer to, I'm going to keep things clean over the top, but I'm going to allow, I'm going to allow catches in front of me, kind of the stuff that we, we've seen some, like he's like the Shaquille Griffith type a little bit with that, where there's a lot of tools there, but he doesn't always make a play as you wanted to make a play and drive in coverage like you'd like to see. Um, but Seven Banks is an interesting prospect. And again, big corner, fits to the prototype of what Seahawks look for, is, has, a, has a, fl a fluidity with the zone scheme. So he, there's, there's a lot that he ticks the boxes of that would potentially bring him here. All right, folks, we're at 66 people in the chat here. I'm going to run a quick little, I'm going to go ahead and use the bathroom really quickly, and then we'll get the last couple of questions on into the chat here. I'm also going to run just a really quickly my um, sponsor of this show, which is, of course, Manscaped. So I'm just going to run a quick ad here with Manscaped. We will come back, and then we will wrap things up, do, get the last any kind of comments, questions, concerns, trials, tribulations that you'd like here in the chat. We'll cover it on in, and uh, I'll be right back. So give me about uh, just a quick two minutes here, folks. And then we will bring back back around. Barry Sotoro, thank you for becoming a member again. Oh, seven months as a member, Barry. Appreciate you on that. He says, uh, hey, bud, just got here. Hope all is well. 
very open. Everything is great over here on my end of things. So happy, loving life, doing well. Trying to bring up Larry a little bit. A little, little sad to see Larry that's uh, down, a little blue, a little, little, little down the dumps. So hopefully we can raise up Larry a little and maybe put a smile on his face a little bit. Come on, Larry. You got a smile a little bit. Gonna be blue sometimes. Team loses, bad. What are you gonna do? You're barely helping him out, Christopher. Why don't you say something nice? All right, I'll be right back here, Barry. Thank you for celebrating seven months. Seven months, Barry. And you're one of my OGs, by the way, subscribers in this channel. I appreciate you on that. Thank you for seven months of membership to the Hawk's Nest program. Wow. Time goes by fast. Uh, I will be right back, folks. Again, just going to run this quick little ad from our show, the sponsor of the show, Manscaped. Please go over to Manscaped and use my code, and I'll be right back. Valentine's Day approaches, gentlemen. You're going to go out on a dinner with your lady and enjoy a fine night, good food, good drink, laughter. You're going to get back home, and it's going to be time for that intimate moment, that special moment to cap off the evening just right. Now, when you drop your boxers, are you going to want to unveil a landscape of jungle to your lady? Or are you going to want to show off a clear, clean package that's going to get her excited? This holidays went by so quickly. Did you remember to take care of your package with the best tools for the job? The Performance Package 4.0 from Manscaped is just the thing every guy needs in their life to make each day and every day just a little more special. The number one product in this package is the Lawnmower 4.0. This electric trimmer is designed to trim hair on loose skin. And get this, the trimmer's advanced skin-safe technology reduces cuts and nicks on your delicate balls. It even has a 4,000K LED spotlight so you can shave anywhere your heart desires. Did I mention that it's waterproof too? I'd like to propose making Friday the 13th a national holiday as National Shave Your Balls Day. Who's with me? This package also includes the Weed Whacker, nose and ear hair trimmer to whack all those worst of your weeds. Manscaped even threw in two free gifts, their shed travel bag and anti-chafing boxer briefs to keep your boys stored comfortably. To complete the perfect package for your package are liquefied formulations like the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver Ball Toner. Start your day off with a deodorant for your boys, then stay cool all day with toner to keep you feeling your best all day and night. Manscaped created their products for a night just like this and will make your V-Day date say, wow, great set of balls you have there. Go to Manscaped for our exclusive offer, 20% off and free shipping with the code NEST, N-E-S-T, NEST. Your balls and lady will thank you. All righty, let's uh, wrap her on up here. Another great show here again today. We got over 6,000 subscribers, a lot of donations coming through the chat. I really do appreciate all of you guys on that. I know I say that, but I just want to make sure I'm really nailing that. And you guys, you get a special moment when you're around one of these 5,000, 6,000 marks, 7,000 marks. You, you, you do do, you, you look back and respect, go, wow, look at how far we've gotten. Um, the support on this channel is, as always, just been amazing from all of you folks. I really appreciate it from my OGs to the new folks who have come along and everything in between. Um, you guys are always so positive and encouraging, and I really do appreciate it. It helps me keep going on this channel. It lets me know we're going in the right direction. It lets me know we're doing this right. It's not just to, to, to bump up egos or whatnot, but also to know that we've got something special here going. And uh, it's days like this that do make me kind of appreciate that and understand that, what we got going on here. We're just getting warmed up here right? We're just getting started here at the Hawks Nest. This is just beginning. This is going to continue to expand, continue to get better. I've got a lot of stuff planned on deck for this channel and what this is going to uh, really become. But it is you guys who make this channel. It's you hitting the like button. It's you subscribing. It's the, uh, the donations are nice, but it's you just being a, also a part of this channel and, and being a part of the discussion, being a part of what drives this forward. Long said, I feel like my chat is as smart or the smartest chat you're going to find out there, especially in football land on YouTube. We got some deep thinkers here. We got some outside the box thinkers here. And I really do appreciate that about this channel. You guys are really amazing in that respect. Uh, Charles Riley coming in with a $10 donation to finish us off nice and right. He says, Brando, Griffey Jr. was as talented as Bonds. Both are malcontents that would sleep in a clubhouse. But if it comes to hitting... Give me Bonds and Junior in the field. Uh, Roy it up Bonds, Charles, or Pittsburgh Pirates Bonds? Because Pittsburgh Pirates Bonds wasn't as good as Griffey. But Roy it up Bonds 
was as good as Griff was better than Griffey as a hitter. I'll give you that. Um, I don't know if you can give Griffey as much the malcontent thing. I mean, he falls asleep, but what other stories do we have of, of Griffey being a bad locker room guy? He was very friendly with Edgar and Randy and best friends with Buner. Um, I, I'd watch him on the field, Charles, when I go into the stadium before the game. You go out and you watch the players on the field stretching and stuff, and Griffey would go out there and be wrestling around with guys. Like, if he's a malcontent, if he's so hated in the locker room, why is he out there wrestling? Like, literally like 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 toddlers wrestling. He'd go in and just start wrestling guys on the field. Um, you have Bonds who literally threw a punch at a player in the dugout when he was with the Giants. You know what I mean? So, like... He's, there's so many stories of Bonds being an absolute D-bag. An absolute D-bag. That I don't know if you can put him in the same territory. They've got some, there's some things about them that are definitely naturally talented players, came up really young. Fathers were, were pro baseball players. But it's kind of for me where it ends with those two guys. You know? I think Griffey was a little bit of a better, not a little bit, I think he was a lot better of a teammate than, than what we hear about with Bonds. Uh, Danny W., have a good night. Let's hope for the Bengals. But if the Rams win, it will just validate us that much more when the Seahawks win the division next year. Well said, Daniel. Very well said. And yes, let's hope the Bengals kitty go meow. Kitty go meow. Because I do not want to hear the Rams fans coming in here for a whole offseason, pumping out their chest, talking about their proverbial greatness. No. Please no. Um, Dante King, do you think there's a chance we could bring Frank Clark in if the Chiefs cut him, he will be cheap. We could probably give him a one or two year deal up to three to six million dollars. If the cost isn't at that price, Dante, I'm all aboard. If the price is pushing up into the teens, I'm off aboard. So it's 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 really largely going to be driven by what are we talking about the price being here? You know, is it in that low end area, which I agree with you? That's the appropriate market for him. He is a pass rush specialist at this point. He is not an early down run defender at the defensive end position. That's not his game. That's not his bag. He has no interest in it anymore, if he ever did. Um, it kind of seems like to me when he lost the weight coming out of Michigan to become more of the purified Leo for us, he lost a little bit of sand in the pants and ability to really hold at the point of attack, you know, and set the edge as well. Um, but again, three or six million dollar deal on a one year deal to add to the pass rush group, Dante. Yeah. I'm good with it at that price. And then, yeah, there is a good chance that we could do that because I would expect the Chiefs to have to cut him. He's the prime candidate for them to relieve some cap space uh, on top of the fact that he's not played particularly all that well for them since they signed him to the big deal and gave up all that draft capital for him. So, uh, yes, absolutely. Charles says, either bonds I'll take. Jeff Kent, they eat dinners together? Uh, Griffey and Bonds did, yes. But I don't think Jeff Kent and Bonds did. I think Jeff Kent's mustache was too mad at Bonds after it punched him. Bonds punched him in a mustache, and that's a place you don't touch Jeff Kent's mustache. You don't mess with Jeff Kent's mustache. Big Country says Bonds is a total jerk. Yeah, I mean, I've, I, I've heard it both um, nationally. I've heard it from... Um, I've heard it from insider reports on like just guys talking about just stories they'd heard. I've heard it personally from people that have had interactions with Bonds. Um, I've also heard a story of him being decent too on the other side of it, to, to be fair. Um, but, you know, there's that much smoke to that fire. The guy's probably a jerk. <laughs> you know? I don't know if Griffey's had that same kind of smoke to him. Charles says, Brando paints Bonds as 180 degrees from Junior, yet they eat with their families together. Yeah, because they, they both, because Bonds and Griffey had things that they could relate to with each other that nobody in this world could relate to. Nobody knew what it was like coming up as a phenom, as a young guy, when baseball was a lot more popular and all of the pressure that that puts you under. It, it naturally was going to bring them together um, and make them friendly. I don't know if their fathers knew each other. I don't know if they knew each other through their fathers, but there, there's a little bit of you know similarities to them. Um, and bonds off the field is maybe a little different than as a teammate than what he was indeed dealing with Griffey. But this is the story that I've heard. It could maybe be complete BS. Certainly bonds and Griffey have not confirmed the story, but there were people that were in the room. There were more than just the families that were eating dinner that had heard the story supposedly. Um, but who knows? Who knows? 
Uh, Flag Sabbath, man, baseball was just better in the 90s, just like basketball, at least for me. Yeah, me too. Both, the, you know, analytics took over in the early 2000s in both those two sports, and they really took hold. And analytics changed things in a real way that didn't make it as entertaining to watch, didn't make it quite as fun to watch. Baseball now with its strikeout walk or home run approach to hitting, um, basketball with its obsession with the three-point shot. Um, those things have really kind of hurt the sport on top of getting in baseball, basketball, getting softer, less physical. It's, it's not helped things. Uh, well, I mean, again, Charles, like I told you, I'm, I'm not, I'm, there's, there's, there are subjects that I am unbiased on most Seahawks subjects. I'm pretty unbiased when telling you guys where I land on stuff. When it comes to Griffey, when it comes to Largent, I'm not going to be unbiased. And I'm not, I'll be unapologetically unbiased <laughs> in that realm of things, Charles. So you're, you're, you're delving into a subject. You're talking about a childhood hero of mine. Um, but again, uh, I don't know that I'd say Bonds is 180 degrees different from Griffey. I'm not saying Griffey was some beautiful, te- the best teammate of all time. But I do think there's a lot of indication here that Bonds was a tough, difficult teammate to deal with. I don't know if I've gotten as much of those same kind of stories proliferated as with Griffey. Um, Griffey certainly is going to have some of that. I'm, I was a phenom. I'm a star. My S don't stink maybe a little bit to him. But, you know, like the story Flag Sabbath told about personally meeting him and sitting down with him. Again, I've heard a lot of people talk about that, those kind of interactions with Griffey um, in that kind of same way. Um, I haven't heard a lot of those stories about Bonds in that same kind of way. Dante King, do you think Hassan Riddick will be pricey because he'd be nice on the Seahawks? Um, the bass rush market is a little bit thin, a little bit, not completely bare, but a little thin, which will drive up the price theoretically for Riddick, uh, to a degree at that point. I don't think he's going to make record breaking 23 million a year type money, but probably into the realm of uh, 12, 13 million on average, um, shorter term deal, maybe even, um, He's a player that gives you some nice flexibility where he can rush the passer and he's got an ability to play some of that Sam linebacker role. So he can give you a little bit of a two for one there by signing him. Um, But I don't think he's going to come cheap. I don't think he's going to come down in that Frank Clark level. I don't think he'll even be maybe even Demarcus Lawrence type level. Might even cost a little bit more than those guys. Brian Koski says, don't forget, go go Zags, go Zags. Uh, Charles, excuse me for Griffey. Will be, uh, uh, Danny W. Ken, Ken Griffey was an elite defensive player as well as offensive. I'm starting to think Griffey took Charles' love interest or something. <laughs> uh, uh, ADL Williams says, Charles is committing blasphemy in the chat right now. <laughs> Daniel, we appreciate you in the chat, though, Charles. Uh, Charles must be uh, must not be from Seattle originally, but we welcome you to the fan now. Um, Proth, uh, uh, Par- Parth Parab says, bruh, I was watching this while getting ready to go out with the boys. Now I'm home absolutely hammered. How is the stream still going? <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. Only God knows. Uh, Jarl says, Brando, my apologies. I just think Junior is guilty as hell in that era. Wait, Black Sabbath met with Junior? I wonder what Junior thought of Oz- Ozzy. <laughs> and no worries again, Charles. Like I said, everyone's got their thing to their opinion. And like I was telling you, I don't have an ability to be unbiased when it comes to Griff. He, he was just, I mean, he made me, he was part of the reason I fell in love with baseball as I did was watching him play. So it's the, he is elevated to a status in my mind that is something just short of godhood, you know, not full saint, but just maybe saint, but just short of godhood. Um, Eddie Williams says, yeah, if I have Charles is making all the friends tonight. <laughs> Sam, uh, Donna, uh, D- Dottie, Dottie, Sam, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, Dodie, uh, says, why would the Hawks trade Russell within the NFC? Uh, well, let's put it like this, Daniel. You got Broncos are calling Seattle and they're offering picks. And the New York Giants are calling Seattle and they're offering picks. New York Giants are saying, we're going to give you two first-round picks in this draft, two high first-round picks in this draft, additional first-round pick next year, and maybe an extra second-round pick to throw it on in. Just a little kicker for you. And then the Broncos say, we'll give you the, the, the what is it, the, we'll give you the ninth overall selection in this draft, and then we'll give you a first-round pick next year and a first-round pick next year. 
Is Seattle going to be so scared of having Russell play within the conference that they would turn down the extra first round pick this year? The extra draft capital they could get from this draft as opposed to having to wait three years down the line to get the full returns on the Russell deal? I don't think that they would. I don't think that they would be held up or want to do it in that way. Um, Especially if that difference could be like how it is because Broncos are one of the only AFC teams that could look to target him whereas you've got Giants, multiple first round picks, uh, Eagles, multiple first round picks. I mean, maybe the maybe the Dolphins would jump into it. They've got multiple first round picks in the AFC. They could maybe be a possibility. But I, I think that's the reason to answer your question. That could be the thing that overrides it is the draft compensation is just so much more coming from the NFC teams that are offering than what you're getting as far as what's being offered on the AFC. And it's too too far away not to to bite, not to 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 jump on and grab it at that point. All right. Well, we're seven hours and 20 minutes in. I have gone deep and hard on this live stream, so I'm going to wrap it up and go get myself a little bit of food, maybe watch a little bit of that Peacemaker show on HBO you guys are recommending. A lot of great prospects uh, you guys suggested here, so I'll be diving into that tape. We're going to just be grinding and grinding and grinding on these prospects as we lead into the draft. So it's just adding, 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 building, and building, and build. But thank you for the names on, for you guys. I'm bringing up some of those names. Um, if you got any suggestions, do put them in. If anything else, put them in the comment section too, because I'll keep an eye on that. I can look up anybody you guys want me to take a look at. My goal is to try to get through at least, you know, 70%, 75% of all these prospects in this draft if I can do it this uh, this upcoming year. I always get a few more every single year. I always like to show you guys, like, you know, we got here's it. So this is last year. This is the first year I did it book, right? Not very thick, couple names in there, right? Then we got last year, okay? So we really got some names last year. So this year, I'm hoping to go even more, even harder, even even larger. So we're going to get into these. But if you got any names, please do uh, let me know in the section. Big Country, you have a good night. Danny W., Dolphins could be an X-Factor team. Russell has dominated 49ers, so their head coach will think of Russ in that uh, Saint stratosphere. Yes, maybe he does. Maybe he does put him in the same stratosphere in that realm. And I think that they're a possibility. They've got the draft capital to do it. Um, certainly they that that certainly right now we, we talked about Daniel, the owners maybe driving some of the decision making for Russ even beyond the coaches. Well, what owner out there needs a win, needs a victory with his fan base right now at the moment more than any other owner in the entire NFL, probably. Probably Stephen Ross, right? Probably Mr. Ross. You fired a coach that had been pretty successful for you. You were paying that same coach to lose you football games or offering to pay him to lose you football games. Would not Ross look at it as a big PR win to bring in Russell Wilson alone to quiet some of these calls that are even maybe being made right now to to see him sell the football team? Maybe. Maybe. Charles Riley with another $5 donation. Charles, man, I, I disagree with you on Griffey but I agree with you completely on your support of this channel. And I thank you for it, man. You're, I think one of our biggest, if not the biggest supporters on this channel, as far as monetarily speaking, man, I notice it. I appreciate it. You're awesome for doing so. Uh, Charles says, Brando, here's $5 in appreciation for your endure, enduring view into a future Mariner stream. It'll get wild if I'm allowed in. <laughs> no, no worries, man. And yeah, we're going to, if we have a baseball season this year, I will do a stream or two and see how it goes with the, with the local fan base here, see if we've got a little bit of a market here on YouTube for it. But uh, hey, man, it's going to be a fun stream. We go Mariner's talk. It'll be a little different. It'll be a little bit awkward, you know. No one will no one will quite know what to do with themselves at first. I won't know what to do with my hands, right? I'll be like Ricky Bobby. I don't know what to do with my I don't know what to do with my hands. I just I ran it real good. I ran it real fast. Hit the ball real hard, and I just Ricky lower your hands, Ricky. Lower your hands, Ricky. <laughs> Um, Charles says Bandle no sweat I was butthurt by a junior forcing the Cincy trade that's understandable it hurt when he left town that one really hurt that hurt more than any other guy leaving town more than A-Rod more than Randy more than Sean Camp more than Gary Payton that one stung stung the nostrils stung the eyes Brian Koski, Hawks Nest Brandon is our number two. Uh, Hawks Nest Brandon is on number 216,358, reading words and speaking truth. That's some serious effing stamina after six hours. It's like reading George, L. War, George Orwell 1984. 
<laughs> Thank you, Brian. It is a lot of words I get out in a telecast, man. I'm, I'm sure you're probably somewhere near the realm of it. I wouldn't be surprised if it's, it's up near uh, 100,000 at least words by the end of every stream. But thank you for noticing, man. I appreciate it. And you know me, I love doing this. This is, a, this is an easy hat for me in a lot of respects because of that. Because you love doing it. It's all they say, you know, find something you love and you'll never work another day in your life. All right, well, thank you guys. I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up on that note. The Rams are in the Super Bowl. That sucks. Niners are about to get two extra third round picks because they're going to lose an offensive coordinator, whatever. But that doesn't mean that we aren't going to be able to get back to this mountaintop. Coach Carroll, John Schneider, look at what the teams are doing around you right now. Look at this NFC West. You are not in the NFL. You are not in the National Football Conference. You are not in the American Football Conference. You're in the NFC West Football Conference. Operate as so. You got to go harder. You got to be better. You got to stack a roster 15% bigger and harder and longer than any other team in this NFL. Do that this offseason. You have the potential to put yourself into an elite standpoint. Go short of that mark, and you will find yourself back in seller dweller status, bottom rung, like you were this year. Hopefully, they've learned their mistakes. That's the mantra of this offseason. Learn your mistakes. Learn your mistakes. Sky's the limit. Keep making the mistakes you've made over and over again. We ain't getting any returns past what we've got recently. I am hopeful. I think they might have finally learned their lesson this year because the things really went off the rails this year. So this is the finally the one. Here, you got your example, Carol. Here, you got your example, Schneider. Enough of the two- and three-year plan. It's time for the one-year plan. One-year plan. And that plan is you go for it. You kick that can down the road. You squeeze as many contracts under the salary cap as possible and get us back to that damn mountaintop. Barely winning more games than losing is not a consistent winner. It's not an elite team. That's not our measure of success here in Seattle. Call us spoiled. Call us entitled. I call it a standard. So as we end this offseason of question marks with Russell Wilson, of if the team will learn their mistakes... All that may be the case, but you still remain and you still keep the faith, my fellow 12s, because those brighter days are coming. You better believe it. You're going to be riding here with me as we get to land on them. We're going to get to celebrate them together. So don't you lose the faith and don't you now ever forget. <laughs>